sir good morning good morning big am i audible yes sir yes, sir. yeah fine i am uh, speaking from ccri citrus institute of nagpur sir fortunately sir, i have sir. come here for some other work so sir. so nice sir thoda sa wo light chalto ka tikad tha kal chehre aur light ikadi kam hi padta hai is tarah sir morning sir sir myself padmini sai ha deepak ji de. kaise hai how are you sir fine sir sir so we are starting at uh, uh, 9:30 yes, we are 9:30 so i am in i am in time sir ठीक है इकड़ बदल के चले बाट नहीं ठीक है तो राहू दिया ना क्लियर है जरा sir uh, long back during my sir scientific assessment you were the chairman at that time sir oh, okay okay <laughs> thank you sir so, nice. so you are now in uh, uh, crri crri yes sir uh, now they call it as uh, national institute nrr yeah nrri national rice research institute sir she is now heading the institute now okay हाँ oh. Thank you. 
Good morning, Dr. Mai. Uh, good Mai. morning, Dr. Maiti. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, good morning Madam Padmini Swain. Good, good, morning, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning, Mahapatra ji. Good morning, sir. My sir. Aple, hame, you have called me after a very long time in rice. Actually, <laughs> I, I was a research assistant in Katak. Oh, uh, sir. yes, yes. Yeah, you I started came. my career as RA in uh, research assistant under Dr. Padmanabhan. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's a very long back. 
sir we yeah. learn we learn from your sir by uh, year book that you have okay. published thank you thank you very nicely you have written the uh, st uh, story of uh, sierra rai uh -huh. <laughs> how you have spent in the hostel how you, <laughs> you have gone thank what are the difficulties then you have shifted to punjab yeah yeah, yeah. thank you good morning dr beg Dr. Beg, you are uh, Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning, sir. Good morning. How are you, sir? How are you? Mighty, sir. I am fine. I am fine. I am fine. <laughs> and nice to see you again. Yes, sir. We are also uh, feeling very happy. <laughs> yes. Yes. I also attended yesterday. Oh, yes. Uh, that, oh, uh, yes. Well, I mean, the first one, uh, the panel discussion mm -hmm. and the inaugural session, both. I did not see properly. this. <laughs> ah, because you were busy. Also, you had a, a program of PM's program you had to attend. Next yes, week. sir. We ran to uh, auditorium. We arranged in auditorium. Yes, yes. I understand that. I understand. So we ran there again from there also. So all scientists, all physically were present, all scientists were there physically. Yeah, sir. We took attendance because they wanted to know the number. So yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. So they made so, it mandatory. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And uh, 120 farmers also we invited for their arrangement. Fine. Dr. Kumar and his team, they took care of that. And uh, so immediately again, we had to send the report. <laughs> mm. Is there any news for uh, RC meeting? No. No, sir, not yet. RC3 is over. So I think. Good so morning, Dr. Patak. Uh, good morning. Namaskar. Good morning. Sir, namaskar. Good morning, Patak. Namaskar. 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 Madam. Sir, uh, you are namaskar. in, uh, in Baramati. Yes, you are sir. in Baramati now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am in Baramati. Yes, speaking. Very good. Yes, sir, thank you very much for kindly accepting our invitation. Are you have told us and we will not attend. It's possible. What do you want? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was in uh, Orissa for some time, so they used to call Asantu, Agya. All oh, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> sir, so nice then, to hear. Then I learned Khantu and Jantu. That is very good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, sir, now you are, you are, you are located where? I am in Nagpur now. Nagpur. As usual, I am permanently settled in Nagpur. Okay, okay. Uh, but uh, I, this, uh, I am making presentation from Citrus Institute. Uh, that's what I can see. That's what I can see. Yeah, this is uh, uh, this Dr. Ghosh yeah. is the director here. Yes, yes. And yes. he is also a pathologist. So I thought that I will speak from him. Right, right, right. Sir, Dr. Ghosh was one year junior to me at IRI. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. So I think uh, it's almost time now. Should we? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Beg is organizing, ne? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, maybe, sir, uh, yeah. another two minutes or so. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe two, three minutes more. I think all our other speakers, all three are have already joined. Okay. Uh, sir, should we start the just one minute is there? Two minutes. Yes. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Olshan and Dr. Chandar and Dr. Vijay Kumar, are they on board? Uh, they may join a bit late because uh, I think their lecture is uh, a little late. Hmm. No. Three of them, they have not joined. Their time slot is, I think, uh, later than a year. Yeah, that's right. Research lecture. So they may join late. Thank you. 
So, sir, should we start? Yeah. I will. Uh... Uh, uh, very good morning. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And warm regards to one and all. I am Dr. Samranjan Das Mahapatra, working as principal scientist in entomology at ICR National Rice Research Institute, Kota. And convener of this session, session number five uh, of ARRW Diamond Jubilee National Symposium 2021. Welcoming all the participants to this theme that is Gen Next Technology in Pest Management. So uh, first, uh, I welcome our uh, pre uh, 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 former chairman, Agriculture Scientist Recruitment Board, Dr. Charudat Mai, who is the uh, co-chairs of this session and presently working as the president South Asia Biotechnology Center, Jodhpur, Rajasthan, and a renowned plant pathologist. On behalf of the organizer, I extend my hearty welcome to you, sir, to this session. Sir, I, I also welcome Dr. Uh, Deepankar Maiki, former director, National Rice Research Institute, Kata, as co-chair of this session. I also welcome the President, Association of Rice Research Worker, Dr. Uh, Himangshu Pathak, who is the director, presently director of National uh, Institute for Bi Abiotic Stress Management, Baramati. I also welcome our director, Madam Padmini Swai, to this session. I welcome uh, our co organizing secretary, ARW Diamond Jubilee Sy National Symposium, uh, Dr. MJ Beg, to this session. I welcome our rapporteurs, Dr. Nobin B. Patil, scientist entomology, and Prabhu Kartika and SR, scientist plant pathology of this institute, for uh, uh, as a rapporteur of this session. So, before going to this uh, uh, proceedings of this session, just I will introduce our uh, co chair, uh, Dr. Charudat Digambarao Mai, Mai who, who has worn this Sakar Khada in Buldana, Maharashtra in July 15, 1946. He has, he, he has done his PhD from Indian Agriculture Research Institute in 1972. Postdoctoral degree, uh, or he is the recipient of the Alexander uh, Humboldt Fellow from Germany in 1982. And he was the, he's uh, currently the chairman Agriculture Finance Corporation Mumbai, Director Maharashtra Knowledge Corporation Limited, Pune, President Indian Society for Cotton Improvement from 2008 onwards, then Founder President of South Asia Biotechnology Center, New Delhi. He has, uh, he was uh, in very key, position, key positions like Chairman Agriculture Scientist Recruitment Board from 2004 to 2011, Agriculture Commissioner Government of India in 2003 to 2004, Director of the Central Institute for Cotton Research, Nagpur, in 2000 to 2003. He is the recipient of BSc degree from Rajendra Agriculture University, Pusa, in 2009, OUAT, Bhubaneswar, in 2010, Assam Agriculture University, Jorhat, in 2010. He is also the Fellow of National Academy of Agricultural Science, New Delhi, Maharashtra Academy of Sciences. So there are uh, a number of achievements he is having. So if I uh, go on reading, it will take more and more times. So uh, without uh, um, going in detail, sir, I welcome you to this session to uh, co-chair. I also welcome our uh, former director, Dr. Uh, Deepankar Maiti, is co-chair to this session. He, he is a, 
he hails from the Mirnapur district of West Bengal, and he born in first uh, December two thousand fifty-nine. So uh, he is a renowned path uh, plant pathologist. He did his uh, masters and PhD from Vidhan Chandra Kisi Vishwa Vidyalaya, uh, West Bengal. And he, he is a very cool uh, um, personality. And he, he was uh, he re very recently retired from uh, this position of director from National Rice Research Institute, Kotak. Sir, I also welcome to this session and uh, request you to co-chair this session. So the session, particularly this session, will be uh, of uh, four lectures. The focus uh, of this uh, session will be mostly the forewarning techniques, models, decision support system, chemical ecology, nanotechnology, sensors, drones, bioresonal, and next generation waste management techniques. So there will be four lectures in this session. Each, session, each lecture will be 30 minutes. There will be uh, the key speakers, uh, Dr. Maisar is also the key speaker uh, of this uh, session. The first uh, lecture will be delivered by Dr. Uh, C.D. Mai. And there will be uh, only one or two pressing queries if, if it will be there from the audience. Then the participants, they are requested to chat uh, and put their uh, questions in the chat box and all are requested to uh, keep their speaker in the mute mode. So now I request honorable co-chairs to manage the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahapatra. I hope you are all able to listen to me. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I, I am, audible, am I audible to all? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very yeah. well. So first of all, let me thank Dr. Himanshu Patak for inviting me and again connecting me to RICE after almost 35, 40 years. I also thank my co-chair, Dr. Maiti, the director of the Institute, uh, Padmini Swain, uh, my, uh, this uh, SD Mahapatra, Naveen Patil, uh, Prabhu Karthikeyan, who are all associated now to conduct this particular program. Uh, let me first uh, wish you all good luck. Azadi ka Amrut Mahotsav chal raha hai. So I think this is a very right time that uh, we celebrate it in a different way. Mera ek abhi lecture ICR mein hua tha Azadi ka Amrut Mahotsav mein. I had delivered a lecture on what is called as talent search. Talent search kaise chahiye hume to really man the tree of uh, agriculture in this country. And this is uh, because ICAR is the most important body for that. So I hope uh, you might have all listened to it. Now I will be talking today on the topic which is uh, very interesting. But let me tell you that I am drawing more examples from my cotton experience because I have been, I think throughout now after uh, my joining as, uh, uh, at Parbani, as vice chancellor or before professor, I have been closely associated with uh, the dryland crop of rice, uh, sorry, the, uh, wheat, uh, cotton. And that's why I will be taking more experiences of cotton. So I will share my, uh, uh, this. Uh, Hope you are all able to see these, uh, uh, my presentation. Uh, basically, uh, this sir, is... Sir, please, please put it in the slideshow mode. Slideshow? Full mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the lower panel, there will be one. Bandh karinda. So you can reshare it and put it on the. Uh, yes, sir. Perfect now. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. 
Uh, so this talk will be on the uh, next generation. Uh, here I can. Next generation technologies in plant protection. I think uh, this topic is uh, very interesting in the sense. Are he pude halat nae no? Now, what are the basically emerging problems of uh, uh, this? Uh, is you will be seeing that uh, there are a lot of silent intruders which has entered India, like onion weed, rugose white fly, papaya mealybug, coffee berry uh, uh, berry borer, erythroid mites. Then so many things in cotton. Uh, this there is another bug which has also entered. So over this last decade, you will see 15 years, lots of uh, these uh, have actually entered. Uh, for example, you will see in pathology, we know that tropical race four of fusarium, which has really destroyed a lot of crop in Africa, has already entered India, Bihar, and we are all as a pathologist have been working, waiting for how do we really manage this particular race because we were already con considering this, uh, that this is a very difficult race to be managed. Now we have heat blast. We never imagined when I was in Katak. I never, I used to tell that there is no blast on wheat and there is no rust on um, rice. But uh, I think the trend has now changed. You will find that uh, wheat blast uh, has become very uh, serious problem. And uh, this has already entered Bangladesh, which is causing a lot of losses. So there is chances that this may also create problem in our country also. Now, in case of cotton, probably you all know that we are all worried about Already American uh, bollworms, potted bollworms, we managed earlier very well through BT cotton. But now there is a very severe attack, what is called as a pink bollworm. And this pink bollworm is a very serious uh, issue, which has different life stages, like you can see larva, P pupa, pupa, adult. Now this uh, is uh, creating huge problem in the entire uh, central, uh, cotton growing areas of the country. And now we have also another serious problem which has entered in 90, I think 2018 in Karnataka. This is a fall, that is a fall army worm, uh, uh, problem, which uh, also has a really taken. So you will see, my point of telling you is that we have lots of exotic paste and diseases and even weeds which have come into these things. And simultaneously, therefore, we had to see that our management practices are such that we are able to manage them. Now, what are the new technologies or innovations in the pest management, particularly when we talk about what we call it as next generation? Now, this, uh, there are some of the tools are already known. For example, micro propagation tools are very well understood. These are all uh, uh, extensively used in some of those vegetatively crops. Can we then really extend it to some other place? Use of biopesticide. Now there is a lot of talk of what we call it as an organic farming, farming with, uh, with the zero farming, where mostly we have to use not the chemical pesticide, but bio. Now there are lots of other chances where the biopesticide. I will not be dealing these biopesticide in details in this lecture, but I will be talking now more about the following. That is marker assisted breeding is another tool which we have in the handy and transgenic technologies now which are now we are now talking about genome editing and all that. So these are some of those new areas where I would like to quote you a few examples where we have succeeded them and where we are following them. And can they be see, sort of extended to some other top? For example, micro propagation is a very simple tool, basically. It is something like what we call it as meristem tip culture. Majority of the viruses which we try to free them from the ascetic, uh, from the asexually uh, reproductive plants are, I think we are using micro propagation. Now there is the advantage in production of disease free alike varieties, uniform size, age, high quality, when we use this micro propagation. Now this is commercially used in many crops like banana, this is used in sugarcane, particularly in sugarcane seed production. This has become a very valuable tool now to eliminate some of those traditionally viruses which are now being used for them. Now, I'll just quote you the example where I'm sitting from the same institute. There are now strategic, uh, strategies available for uh, integrated management of particularly citrus. 
Now, in case of Citrus, this institute has done some very wonderful job. Now they are now develop what would they call it as uh, the uh, uh, development of virus-free shoot tip grafting. They in short form they call it as STG. This work is done in this institute of ICAR, that is CCRI, and this technique is being used for commercial supply of platelets. I am very happy when the demand for this is every year is growing. They are supplying more than a lakh platelets of this in the entire orange belt, citrus belt of this region, and also now being extended to Madhya Pradesh, being extended to even Assam and so many areas. So this is a shoot tip grafting where you are eliminating large number of some of those viruses, mycoplasmas, which are now coming. Now this technique can be of use because you can't use something like an annual crop safe uh, technology right here. And if we want to use biotechnology here, it will take a lot of, for example, in Florida now, they are already using the transgenic or the use of genes for uh, control of greening viruses, greening and uh, mycoplasma. So these uh, are some techniques which can be used for the, uh, uh, a sexually reproductive plant. Now I will take you to marker resistant breeding. I think for rice uh, breeders and for rice uh, workers, I need not tell because the classical work was initially done in marker assisted selection or rise, uh, resistance breeding is basically in rice and that too in IRI. I think uh, Dr. A.K. Singh, uh, many work, much of work has been done now in uh, uh, the uh, institute at Hyderabad Rice Institute Directorate. Then uh, a lot of work has been done in Punjab. Then it has been done in CI, uh, at NRRI now. Also, is that so? You will find that bacterial leaf blight resistance was now commercially exploited, and this has come. Nematode resistance can also be useful. We are using marker assisted breeding for the serious problem of virus leaf curl, uh, cotton leaf curl virus uh, resistance in north, because this virus is only confined to north uh, cotton area like Rajasthan, uh, Punjab, and Haryana, and therefore we have to use. Then molecular characterization of core geroplasm associate uh, uh, mapping, all this can be done. Now, I will just you, this is already your own example. Uh, release the improved Pusa Baspati with two BLP resistant genes from IRI using mass. I think there is tremendous improvement over that. And now this Baspati, we are already exporting on such a large scale that this has become almost replaced the original Baspati which was very tall and which was highly susceptible to bacterial blight. We had several other problems with that. And uh, Samba Masuri is another where we have used three stacked BLB genes. So I think uh, these, these are some of those examples of uh, marker assisted breeding, which we are also trying to use the same technology. Uh, my colleague in uh, Cotton Institute uh, rightly used some of those things for uh, control of bacterial blight of cotton. And uh, for at least because, but that bacterial blight is not that severe. There is only some races of bacterial blight which are serious about it. And, but we are fairly uh, successful in cotton also. I think this is that gene pyramiding which has done in Basmati. And uh, this was the slide which I think I have taken it from IRI. Huge benefit which has accrued for because of uh, marker resistant breeding in this. Now, let us take the new technology that is what we call it as genetic engineering. The first innovation in crop biotechnology I considered is genetic engineering. After what we have fermentation and marker acid breeding and all that. Now, this provides an exclusive solution for some of the intrinsic problems like viral diseases, cryptic insects, like what is the helicoverpa, salinity, drought, climate change, quality improvement. And therefore, what we are important is this, uh, for example, I will quote you again the example of what we call it as uh, uh, rice, uh, cotton. Cotton, uh, actually, you all know that uh, there is almost the cotton yield was stagnant for nearly for a period of 20 years between 80 to 2000. And it was stagnant at, the, uh, at something like average was 300 kg lint per hectare. Uh, for so many years and farmers used to worry. There used to be lots of national committees 
to see control how, how we can do uh, how can we manage this uh, helicoverpa we failed in terms of locating resistance within the germplasm we also failed to really uh, transmit that uh, or uh, with the traditional breeding but this technology when it was made available in usa and which was brought in the country i think has changed probably you all know that we were almost spending 14000 metric tons of insecticides on bollworm management in cotton 50% of the total pesticides were sprayed on cotton and you know how much of the cotton area it used to be only 5% and the yield losses to be annually very high ordinarily it is 10000 crores annual loss is estimated and this is a simple pest which was not amenable but you can see 2002 we introduced this with the first government of india permitted the use of bt cotton and fortunately i was then the director of cicr where i was one of the members of gac where we conducted nearly 55 trials in the country before approval and that after the approval you can see how much is the growth of adoption of uh, this insecticide resistant cotton and uh, this the both ways you can see how is the area occupied today if you see you ask any cotton farmer he says he grows only bt cotton 95% of the area is under bt cotton and this is all credit goes to mr barwale padma vibhushan barwal padma vibhushan barwale who has actually insisted on the bringing this technology for cotton workers in the dry land situation where we increase fortunately it is in the last 10 years uh, almost 20 years you will find that our production has nearly doubled we are one of the countries now we are exporting cotton uh, nearly 20, uh, 50 to 80 lakh bales of cotton is imported every uh, year uh, exported every year we were in net importers before 2002 so this changed and also we have changed the quality of it ultimately like rice we have basmati and so many other qualities in cotton also we have to see what is the quality of lint and this has given a big boost on what we call it as the uh, middle age or middle group uh, extra long staple and uh, uh, medium long staple long staple cotton in the country so this change which has occurred is mainly because of the fact that we are able to introduce this crop now there is another fruit and shoot borer resistant transgenic in benjamin another very successful story which was done in india unfortunately in 2010 the government of india did not permit because it was a food crop and they say we have unless we are ensured that uh, there will be no kind of uh, side effects and all those state although those studies were made and the approval of this event was given in bangladesh in 2003 the same material the same uh, what we call it as a document uh, was uh, supplied to them and uh, under this provision this was done in fact our own institutes like nrc biotechnology i uh, we are uh, varanasi they already have even tnau us dharwad they did develop lots of material but unfortunately they are all in waiting now but bangladesh has already done uh, a good job for example seven years of cultivating of bt brinjal in bangladesh now 30000 farmers are now using this technology this is an exemplary model of continuing political support from former minister honorable matiya choudhury and current agriculture minister they are very insistent that they want it now they are also looking for bt cotton probably there is very less cotton there but it's one of the largest cotton industry exist in bangladesh seventh five year plan placed emphasis on crop improvement through biotechnology in bangladesh that's why you will see bangladesh economy is much fast growing now and biotech crops are in pipeline in various stages in bangladesh actually originally 3 bt varieties were commercialized and two for field wine now they are looking for late blight resistant potato and also they are looking for golden rice and also bt cotton so you will see that uh, the, the, these technologies are actually uh, uh, pop, become very popular i just like to give you some of the data which we have done from south asia biotechnology center that uh, how many 
a number of uh, uh, farmers are now adopting it and percentage adoption has which has increased so total area of bangladesh is 50000 but actually number of uh, these uh, insect resistant uh, brinjal farmers are 34000 now so there is a, a perceptible change which uh, possibly occur uh, i have another uh, one slide which i missed is regarding the herbicide resistant plants giving plants the ability to inactivate herbicide in cotton all over the world in maize in also in soybean actually ht bt is a common phenomenon ht means herbicide tolerant because we can use those genes where we can introduce them in plants they will not be affected by the herbicide but the weeds are killed the technology is not permitted in india although our own institute that is uh, cicr nagpur has done all the three years job it is still pending with the government and again now there is a renewed uh, interest in this technology uh, because nearly 50 to 20 percent illegal entry of this uh, technology has already occurred in uh, maharashtra gujarat and uh, uh, telangana so that means people are already bringing this uh, uh, htbt uh, technology and growing them plant but they are all illegal at present because they are not being permitted officially. And that's why some of these uh, varieties which are being brought, they, we, are no, we are not sure about their ability to perform in terms of yield. But still, the farmers are using them. And that is, I think, one very serious concern. That's why Government of India is now thinking whether we permit this technology in cotton, because it is still, they are considered cotton to be a non-food crop, although we use cotton seed oil as a regular, nearly uh, uh, for almost 14% edible oil is comes from cotton. But anyway, that is a different issue. Now, use of RNAi and CRISPR technology is another to control insect pest and viruses is another very important area which has now emerged, particularly for the new uh, technological crops. For example, resistance to plant viruses through CRISPR-Cas. Uh, there are several examples. Strategy of expressing CRISPR-Cas system in host nucleus to target and clean the virus genome during replication. Because you will see majority of the viruses control has been more difficult. And now, even some studies have shown that these bigomo viruses can be very well see, managed using CRISPR-edited plants. Studies also focusing on resistance of bigoma virus, beet severe curly top virus, bean yellow dwarf virus. And uh, these are, uh, I think I have already quoted some of those examples. So resistance to RNA viruses against cucumber mosaic virus and tobacco mosaic virus using RNA targeting RNAs in some of those around FCS plants. So knocking out host susceptibility genes, loss of host factor required the vital or viral life cycle support. So this CRISPR technology has really done a wonderful job, particularly in management of viruses. Probably you all know that what today we are using some of those vaccines for our COVID. They are also used, they have also used through transgenics. And now there are even uh, attempts being made for CRISPR-Cas9 to develop new kinds of vaccines. So overexpression of aspartic gene from tobacco in transgenic cotton. Uh, although, as I said, that more examples I will be giving in cotton. You see, this is drought tolerance is another very important phenomenon in cotton. We suffer either through excess of rains or drought. And this is the technology which has uh, uh, these genes which are uh, aspartic genes which are used uh, has been done in the Texas uh, University in USA. And one of the workers who has done this is an Indian, uh, Dr. Kirti Rathod. He has done this job. Now, this uh, he, he, you can see after 10 days, when there is a drought stress, how effective it is. Osmotic overpressure and drought tolerance uh, cotton can be seen very clearly differentiating. Now, even some of those uh, attempts have been made in cotton and also some commercialization is yet to occur, but resistance to fungal pathogens in transgenic cotton lines expressing 
NPR one genes. This is a, a NPR one gene from Aradipsis. You can see Rajectonia, Thylaviopsis, Alternaria, Fusarium, Verticillium, and some of the non defoliating pathotypes of TS2 and other things. Now, these technologies can be really of tremendous utility if there are, because although Verticillium is a serious problem in South, Fusarium is not a problem, but it is more problem in DC cotton. And in North, it is more of Rajakturi and other things. So we were looking into whether there is the possibilities of combining some of those genes like NPR1 with BT cotton and some attempts are being made. And I think in future technologies will be very useful. Now, this is another very useful because there are a lot of issues which are being raised by uh, these activists regarding the use of uh, uh, the normal uh, the herbicide uh, glyphosate. Now, we need to have also an alternative technology for glyphosate because they say glyphosate has a lot of other problems. So alternative technology for weed control has also been attempted in uh, the uh, uh, cotton. And this was all developed by the uh, uh, Luis Herrera and Dammer. They have developed what is called as a PTXD gene isolated from Pseudomonas trudelin. So as I, I was telling you, biocontrol agents like Pseudomonas, like uh, uh, Bacillus, like even Trichoderma, now, they were early, they, we are all considering them as very useful agents for biocontrol. But simultaneously, let us look at them. I think I would suggest our entomologist, pathologist, and along with breeder, that look into those genes which possibly can be. Like, for example, Pseudomonas sudari, they have encodes phosphide uh, dehydrogenase, uh, and this particular work uh, where we can substitute it by another, what we call it as the herbicide. So herbicide tolerant, roundup ready application is uh, this uh, 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 the glyphosate. But at the same time now, this one has, uh, which we have used, uh, what is called as a PHI treatment is another herbicide, which is very useful. And uh, probably they may have less concern of uh, uh, the environment than glyphosate. So such technologies. Now there are also desired. I think probably you all know that one of the most important items uh, that we have. Excuse me, just one minute. But this one of the important technologies that uh, uh, we have uh, in cotton developed in USA and also commercialized is what is called as the gossip pulp. Now, gossypol is a one big problem when we want to use edible oil in cotton. And therefore, we have chemical treatments and we have certain other physical treatments. So, Dr. Kirti Rathod has done a very good job on inducing. But gossypol is required for control. Every plant for it is required, except we don't need it in the seed. And that is how the technology is developed by him and which has been commercialized. Full complement of gossypol and related terpenoids for defense against insect remains in the leaf and other organs, but in seeds, it is less than what is required FDA guidelines. So I think such a technologies can be possible. Then there are salt resistant, what we call it as GM crops. They can also be uh, another very important area in future for uh, abiotic stress tolerance. And I think uh, since Dr. Patak is almost here, he knows what are the other areas of abiotic stress uh, which we can manage uh, using these CRISPR-Cas and uh, transgenic technology. So novel genes for disease resistance. We have universal resistance with R genes, expression of uh, pathway mediated by SAL and JAS phytoalaxin, expression of hydroallergic genes like chitogenesis, gluconesis, etc., and expression of non-plant lytic pesticides. I think. Uh, these technologies, now I think I need not show you this. This is way it has become very common. We had almost more than uh, eight to 10 webinars in the country on genome editing. Uh, Dr. Paroda has written a wonderful article also on genome editing after uh, the uh, doctors Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dodna won 
the 2020 Nobel Prize. So this uh, ladies have really revolutionized the thinking on these technology. Genome editing, how it works, we all know. This is the latest genetic engineering technique of CRISPR-Cas9. This is clustered revolutionary short palindromic repeats. CRISPR-Cas9 is a family of DNA sequences found in genome. It's a tool for cheaper, faster and precise technique of genome editing. Now here people have lots of questions that uh, in case of uh, uh, genetic engineering, we are adding genes from bacillus and from other crops, other material. Here it is not anything which we are adding. It is rather, I would call it as the, the molecular seasoning and precise mutation technology. And therefore, there should not be any problem. Unfortunately, still, the status of genome editing in the country is little. Uh, DPT has drafted two separate guidelines. My association, SABC, was also associated with formulation of guidelines for uh, genome editing. But these uh, uh, guidelines are still finally awaited, and we are all waiting is more than one and a half years now. Now, genome editing products like ICGB in the rice, quality traits, yield, PGNP, biofuels in microbes, IRI is also being on rice. Banana is being done by Nabi. I think you all know that there is a very classical work being done there by our uh, Deputy Director General, Dr. Sharma. And uh, Ikrisat, Pearl Millet, I think Delhi University, Mustard, so many issues. This is all about vitamin A, banana, and this is all what done by our old institute at uh, Nabi. So you can see there are hundreds of things which can be biotechnology can use, like less gluten, beta carotene enriched, fusarium wilt of cigatoka in banana, delayed ripening. Even now in Nigeria, they have BT cowpea. They have several other crops now being done uh, in Africa uh, being permitted. There is a lot of work is going on on um, sorghum, uh, striga and all those areas. So I think these technologies are now uh, very useful. But at the same time, if we want some what next in uh, particularly uh, in plant protection now, is uh, the future innovations which we would like to have is, uh, is for example, we need to have something like a decision support system is very important in uh, uh, particularly in uh, management of pest and disease. Now there is a web-based tool provide the farmer field specific crop management recommendations, including plant protection aspect. So ecological engineering for rice pest management in rice was can we see developed all these things. Now, this is an, uh, uh, already a program which is going on in even ICRISAC. Uh, International Crop Rice Institute has come up with uh, even automated disease detection, cutting edge technology available for farmers in the country. So this is another uh, very important area which we can. Now, a uh, lot of issues of crop, crop chemical spraying has come in plant protection. And therefore, now smart drones in precision agriculture can be very useful. Now, this has become common. Probably you all know last year, there was a heavy incidence of uh, locust, which was managed by even allowed by government of India to use drones for control of them. And uh, these drones are now very common. The, they are being manufactured by several people. Many universities have now the drone technology permitted by this. And they are now working on them. So global market, I expect, is very big. This is I have taken the source from maximum market research. And you will be surprised to see that how likely the global market is increasing for uh, the drones. And intelligent sensors, I think, another very important factor which possibly will be useful. So along with GM technologies, we have to see that uh, I would like to quote my own example where my association has done managing cotton ping bowl work. Now we know that every time it is not possible to use genetic engineering. Oh, community approach we have adopted and through community approach, we have educated farmers on a very large scale, last three, four years. So in Vidarbha, at least the farmers in Maharashtra, they are fully aware how to manage ping bowl work. It was a problem now in North, but we have to educate them now in future. 
For example, now we have tried this technology called mating disruption technology, which is uh, the which has been actually uh, developed by our Japanese technology brought here with never several people, but we have used the one which is by PI industry. And we have used this technology and 300 acres of flax, 60 acres each, five clusters we have adopted in near Nagpur. And we use these. Fortunately, the technology has been so successful that the farmers are now demanded. This is already permitted by CIBRC. And uh, we find that uh, really uh, the efficiency of uh, the, you, you can see the uh, using the trap formation, what is the difference between treated and not? Now, it is a very simple technology because we have to only tie the PB knots somewhere at uh, something like at um, 45 to 50 days of the plant growth. And this will remain effective for 100 days. So you can check up these. Uh, the, this is what we have done. This is my colleague, Mr. Begirat Choudhury, who is uh, right in our own field here. This has been done by our SABC and Agrovision Foundation on 300 acres of land. So these are some of those. It is, as I said, the technology, it, sh it should be a sort of a big consortium. Now, these are all PB knots, which we are educating the farmers how to do it for pink bulbar management. So my point is that I am coming, we have also have a website developed uh, for this uh, thing. So with few of these, although I think uh, my time is a little over one or two minutes, I, ex uh, I uh, expect uh, these people. I assure you that uh, this will be very useful technology. So there are a range of technologies which probably in the next generation you can look into. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. So uh, there was a there is a excellent presentation by Dr. Mai, who touched upon almost <laughs> all the aspects of the next gen technologies for pest management, and he he also narrated how the changing trends in diseases through invasion, and and touched upon. Uh, all the aspects, all the components of next gen technology, starting from MAB, uh, marker registered breeding, transgenic technology, RNAi technology, CRISPR Cas, and uh, also decision support system, which is also important, and drone based pesticide spraying, sensor based diagnostics, and mating disruptive technologies. So I think uh, there are maybe so many queries from the uh, audience, and they may put their queries in the chat box. And also at last, we will have a discussion session so we can uh, uh, have our discussions. So, sir, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bhai. Fortunately, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Bhagira Choudhury from Jodhpur has also joined. I welcome him for this. Uh, thank okay, you. okay, welcome, Dr. Choudhury. So, I think uh, without uh, much of introduction, now we should go to our next uh, speaker, Dr. Shannon Olson. So Dr. Olson is here. So, uh, so with the permission of chair, yes. Yes, uh, yes. I'll just uh, brief about uh, Dr. Uh, Shannon. Please go ahead. So uh, before introducing, I have an introduction about Shannon. Just I'll thank our honorable speaker, last speaker, uh, thank you very much, sir, for your thought-provoking uh, speech uh, on next generation plant uh, technologies, Indian perspective. Your presentation showed how you are involved, particularly even after one uh, more than one decade of your retirement. So we are very much grateful to you for sparing your time and efforts to share the thoughts and experiences in this regard. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, I'll just uh, brief about this uh, uh, next uh, lecture, that is the value of ecology, the chemical ecology for pest management. Uh, that will be de delivered by Professor Senan Olson. Uh, she is a uh, chemical ecologist who listens to the nature's chemical conversation across Indian's uh, diverse climate uh, ecosystem. She is a Fulbright scholar and a Ramanujan scholar. Uh, Senan has been a faculty member 
at the national center for biological sciences tata institute of fundamental research she is currently a member of the biodiversity collaborative that is founder member of ecobari then global director of eco network a social innovation partnership with the specific focus of increasing scientific awareness engagement and insight regarding the indians human and environment ecosystems senan's research has been reflected in the features by the cnn inverse cosmos tedx uh, american scientist dublin science gallery chemical and ecological news and the dst science express train uh, that is since uh, 2014 so i welcome uh, professor senan uh, for uh, delivering this uh, lecture thus value of chemical ecology for pest management Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It is a really a great honor to be here um, to listen to my fellow speakers as well and to be part of this important uh, exercise for all of you. I only wish I was there in person right now and not doing this remotely, but maybe sometime I can come and visit your your lovely place. I have been around there many times, but I have not visited your institutes. So I hope I can get to do that sometime. So um, I'm going to share my green um just a second hold on hopefully you'll be able to see just the slide in a second there we go can you confirm that you can see a slide one, only one slide with a bubble on it <laughs> yes yes no Yes ma'am. Okay, thank you very much for confirming. Okay, then I will start. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Shannon Olson. I'm a professor at NCBS in Bangalore. I've been working in chemical ecology for about a little over 20 years now. And uh, and today I thought I'd talk to you a little bit more about the concept of the ecology part of chemical ecology. So chemical ecology is a is we call it the universal language of nature right because everything on this planet that's alive every, from a bacteria or a fungus or to all the way up to an asian elephant will use chemicals to communicate and that includes you and i as well so it's very universal and it allows organisms to communicate with each other to communicate their states of being their physiological states their behavioral states it also allows them to live in their ecosystem to under understand their relationship with other organisms sometimes from even other kingdoms like between plants and animals for example and i think the classical way we think about chemical ecology in the agricultural space is in terms of pheromones right we we just heard from the the lovely talk we heard before by dr maye about the pink bollworm mating disruption pheromone and of course we know about the yellow stem borer pheromone in, in rice as well and there's many many other examples commercially available now of uh, the chemicals being used as alternative to pesticides as you see spraying here on the fields to either trap insects or to disrupt their ability to mate because they find each other using these chemicals and by by having large amounts of this chemical already present in the region it confuses the the males or in some cases the females and prevents them from being able to locate each other in the in during the space but Today's talk I actually want to try to take you a little bit beyond this concept. This is a very classical concept. It has been extremely successful in certain cases, but there are many 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 more examples of pests out there for which either we don't have very good pheromones or for which trapping doesn't work. And I'm going to talk to you about one of those today and what can we do using chemical ecology in that space. And so I want to start by just giving you a little bit of sense about how broad chemical ecology actually is. So chemical ecology is not just about, you know, insects attracting each other using pheromones and 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 this trapping techniques, but it also can can 
be about how plants communicate with each other. This is a tobacco plant. You may have used this in your own research. It's a very classic plant for, for studying. And Ian Baldwin from my former institute at Max Planck in Germany has found that the tobacco plant is actually able to listen to other plants from other species in its environment. So when those species are being attacked, like the sagebrush, this Artemisia, Artemisia is also a very common genus in India. When it's attacked by an herbivore, then it releases a number of volatiles into the air that are come from the, the breakage of the cell walls and the release of the internal contents of the plant. It releases those volatiles into the atmosphere and the tobacco plant is able to detect those chemicals. It's able to eavesdrop on those chemicals and in turn upregulate its own defense uh, capabilities so that if that same herbivore goes onto the tobacco plant, the tobacco plant is better prepared to fight against that herbivore. So this is an example of plants actually listening to each other. There's also some very interesting cases of cross kingdom interactions. You see here, this beautiful butterfly that looks like it's landing on a flower here, but it's not in fact, not a flower, it's actually a fungus called the Pachinia rust fungus. And this rust fungus actually changes the apical meristem of plants so that they not only turn yellow because that's the color of the spores of this fungus, but they also create sort of a floret structure. And that tricks uh, butterflies and other pollinators into thinking that it actually is a flower. And not only does it look like a flower, but this fungus also produces a number of floral volatiles. So it even smells like a flower to these pollinators. So these pollinators will come to this fungus thinking that they're going to get a tasty meal of nectar and pollen. Instead, they get all of the spores of the fungus on their bodies. And that's how this fungus actually reproduces. So there's lots of these cases of of interspecies and interkingdom in this case act activities that that uh, uh, take part in chemical communication. And this has led to over several years a really rethinking of chemical ecology, not just in terms of trapping insects or, 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 or disrupting their activity, but really thinking about them as this cross species, cross community interactions. And one of the best example I know was developed by an Indian named Zaire Khan um, in corn, and it's called push-pull technology. And and he has developed this technique primarily in East Africa, which is an intercropping technique where, uh, where two different types of species, one is of course corn and another is something called desmodium are intercropped between each other. And what happens is that the pest insects, these are, these are different types of moths, are very much attracted to the corn, but the desmodium is very repellent. So the desmodium actually pushes them out of the corn. But now just because you're actually repelling the insect, you have to give the insect some place to go. So around the border of the corn, they plant something called napier grass, which is actually an alternative host for these moths. So the moths go to this napier grass and lay their eggs in the grass. And then this grass is periodically cut down and used as fodder for the cows of the farmers. So in this way, you have this lovely technology that actually doesn't use any chemicals at all, either pheromones or pesticides, and simply uses the knowledge of the plant ecology and the insect ecology to have this nice closed system of pushing the, ins the pest insects out of the crop and pulling them into a border crop. And it's been adopted by over 150,000 farmers just in East Africa themselves. And this is the kind of work that our group has been really fascinated and interested in doing over a number of years. We study a lot of different systems. Uh, we study a lot of plant pollinator systems, and we also have studied some pest systems as well. And I'd like to give you an example of our journey for that. Not necessarily uh, the example uh, in order to really adopt it directly for something like rice, but really the conceptual understanding of how you can go about looking into this kind of work with chemical ecology. Maybe it can 
inspire you and your, and your scientists to actually pursue some of this for your pests as well. And so I'm going to take you to a very, very different cropping system, which is this, which is coffee, because I'm down in Bangalore. So we work with a lot of plantation crops, including this one. And coffee is a very interesting uh, cropping system because it's uh, in India, it's shade grown. So you have a number of different species. You hear, see here these primary and secondary shade trees, and you see the pepper that's being grown up against those trees as an alternative crop. And within this space, there's a very, very well-known pest called the coffee white stem borer which is a type of beetle. And it's been around for well over 150 years and it causes tons and tons of damage to coffee crops, up to 30% per year, which you can see considering the worth of the Indian coffee crop is quite a lot of damage. And there really isn't to this day any good way of combating this pest because it lays its eggs in the stem of the coffee tree. It lays its eggs underneath the bark and the larvae get into the bark of the tree itself and they, eventually dis disrupt the circulatory and nutrition system of the tree and kill it. And these are tree, these are coffee plants that are sometimes 20, 30 years old. So you can imagine as a farmer what tremendous loss this is to lose something that you've been cultivating for decades. So we're interested in thinking about maybe coming up with some sort of push-pull technology since we have this lovely complex habitat already. There's many different types of plants present, many different types of trees. Can we develop a technology based on our understanding of these plants and insects and other organisms in the region to have natural enemies be attracted, resistant varieties of crops, repellent plants, and have alternative hosts and trap crops in the region? So instead of having to constantly reapply chemicals, we actually do this in us in a, an existing infrastructure of the ecosystem that is much more long term uh, able to deal with the past and much more resilient to changes in climate and, and other other effects. So that's what my group did. We went down to to Cork to do this. I have stars on the three stars of this story, which is Hinel and Shiraksha and Santosh. They were the three main people that did this work that I'm going to talk about today. So this is again not because you know you necessarily will take the exact same techniques if you wanted to do rice, but really thinking about how do you go about thinking about this problem. And the first thing we did was we we moved into the coffee plantation. We actually set up a lab there to really understand the system from the inside out. So we built field cages uh, so we could actually study these the, the plants and the animals around them in closed conditions. And we presented uh, uh, these beetles with choice tests where they had the choice between different types of plants that had different parameters. And the very first thing we wanted to know is how do they use their chemical sensing? How do they use their sense of smell and taste to be able to identify these coffee plants? So we did a series of very simple experiments, such as covering these plants with plastic sheets um, to, to, to restrict the volatile release, or covering them with dark netting to restrict the, the, the visual cues, and comparing how these beetles actually were attracted to them. So very, very simple technology. You can see here just PVC pipes and netting um, didn't cost very much, took a lot of time, but it allowed us to get some very detailed understanding of the biology of this pest in the natural environment. I cannot emphasize this enough because it's really important to do this in the native environment. And we studied all sorts of conditions. We studied what happens if you remove the plant's leaves, what happens if the plant is infested with a coffee borer already, what happens if it has uh, a, a leaf rust, which is a, a very common a fungal infection that these plants often get, what happens if it's a, a different type of, of, of coffee plant, or Arabica and Robusta, the two main varieties of coffee plant grown in India, what happens if it's another plant altogether like teak or Nandi flame or silver oak, all of which are different types of trees that are commonly grown. And once we identified the, the different types of plants that were attractive or repellent to these plants, to these insects, we then engaged in a series of chemical techniques, both in field and in lab to extract the chemicals that were coming from the uh, relevant parts of the plant. In this case, the leaves were most attractive to these beetles. And we also took, took bark samples, as you see down in the, the bottom right-hand corner. 
And then we also looked at the physiology of these beetles. So we examined their detection of these cues, their antenna. So you see here, what we're doing here is something called elect electroantenography. So it's a technique where you can record the electrical activity from the antenna of an insect, in this case, the coffee white stem borer beetle, as it responds to various chemicals that are being emitted from the plant. So those chemicals you see there, pinene, limonene, osamine were all common volatiles being emitted from the leaves of coffee. And once we had identified the chemicals that were being detected by the plants, we then tested them, of course, in a trapping technique. And so this is what a typical cross vein trap looks like for a longhorn beetle like the coffee white stem borer. You can see in the bottom right hand corner, we caught some other types of beetles sometimes as well. And we found that through this process, we identified uh, a series of, of a cut wood and cut and leaf blends that were as, attra as attractive as the current pheromone trap for these beetles. Now, I wanna tell you that that's not saying much because these traps are not super effective. Um, unlike some of the other, other techniques like the pink bullworm mating disruption traps, which have been shown highly effective, this trapping technique is not really effective for these beetles. We're not exactly sure why, it's most likely because of the, the nature of the, the ecosystem, this complex habitat where they grow, um, where they live and make it difficult to, to be able to utilize a trapping system like this. And this is very common for many pests all across the, the, the country of India, but also across the world that trapping is, is not very efficient for them. So that's why we started looking into an alternative technique. And I go back to this comparison between Arabica and Robusta. I'm sure you have heard of these two varieties, even if you don't drink coffee so much where you are. Um, they are the two most common varieties of coffee. And interestingly enough, farmers have told us for decades that the beetle does not like the Robusta. It only infests the Arabica. They see a strong infestation of Arabica. These beetles seem to be selectively killing the plants, and they seem to be leaving the Robusta alone. However, when we gave them a choice between being attracted to a robusta or an arabica plant in our field essays, we found that actually they were much more attracted to the robusta plant. So then we thought, well, what is going on? How is it possible that this beetle is more attracted to this plant, but yet it doesn't infest this plant? Is it not laying eggs? So we watched it and, and we saw that through uh, egg laying essays that actually they lay, if you see on the the left hand side, the Arabica is in brown and the Robusta is in, in yellow and in silver, that they almost lay the same amount of eggs on the stem. So that's not the problem. But as you follow the beetle through its development stages, you can see that a significantly less number of beetles actually develop into adults in the Robusta, which suggests that there's actually some sort of chemical defense. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you a picture of what the larvae look like. <laughs> this is what the larvae look like on the left in Arabica stem and on the right what they look like in Robusta. And you can see that the Robusta is clearly doing something to these beetles. So of course, we followed the technique through. We, we get, got some several extracts of the bark and the wood of this, this tree. And then we used a series of uh, liquid chromatography analyses. And we identified a chemical that's shown here in the arrow that is drastically upregulated during the second instar stage of this beetle. So the plant is actually fighting back. And this is only happening in the Robusta plant. It's not happening in Arabica, which means that we can really look at developing something called ecology-based computational agriculture, where the strategic placement of these, these repellent and these attractive plants can actually be used as an internal trapping and cropping strategy within the field and a push-pull technology. So we're currently going through the motions of trying to figure out how to arrange this, this field properly, how to strategically place these plants, and, and how to do this in a most ecological manner. And so I hope that this little story I told you very quickly, because we don't have so much time, at least sparked in your minds this idea of thinking about chemical ecology, not as something that can replace pesticides directly as you spray it on a field, but actually changing the way we think about agriculture, going back a bit to our traditional techniques that our forefathers had uh, over a hundred years ago of intercropping, of pairing different plant species together to actually 
to repel off insects. That is the way forward. That is the way into the future to make our crops more climate smart, more resilient to, to drought, and also more, uh, more uh, uh, resilient to, to new pest attacks that may come in from invasive species. I will stop there. I'm sorry I tried to hurry up as fast as I could. So thank you very much for inviting me here today. And, um, and I hope you enjoy the talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Mai, would you? So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shannon. Uh, it was a nice presentation on the chemical com communication between the creatures, I and mean, particularly between plants and plants and uh, the enemies. And, and the natural pull and push systems of uh, attracting and pushing off the enemies. So it's very nice presentation and uh, also a thought provoking one so that it can be adopted in the, in the future smart agriculture and uh, also computations in the agricultures. So thank you very much. I think there are some questions in the chat box and we will take up discussions uh, after the all the presentations are over so dr mai yes. may i may we uh, invite our next speaker uh, dr shubhas chandra i and think I... Uh, I thank uh, the lady who has delivered a very good lecture i would now request the next speaker uh, is uh, subhash chandra is around there Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Subhash Chandra, please go ahead. I think Dr. Yeah. Mahapatra needs to introduce. Mahapatra, oh. can you introduce him briefly? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just uh, I'll brief, briefly introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Subhash Chandra, who is the uh, currently director of uh, ICR National Center for Integrated Pest Management, New Delhi. So he did his uh, MSc and PhD from Indian Agriculture Research Institute in 1987 MSc and PhD in 1991. And he is the recipient of C. Subramaniam Award for Outstanding Teachers uh, uh, for Crop and Horticultural Sciences, Sukumar Basu Memorial Award, Best Teacher Award from IRI, and his uh, research interest is the development of crop-based models and decision support system, pest uh, forewarning and monitoring, development of spectral signature through remote sensing, pest risk analysis through pest weather models and GIS, and climate change impact assessment. His significant achievements includes the crop variety, particularly very popular variety that is Pusa Basmati 1509. He was very much involved in this uh, development of this Pusa uh, Basmati rice variety 1509. And two wheat varieties that, that is HD 3086 and HD 3118. He is also the developer of the info crop, very much popular model, modeling based on the decision support system and he, he has guided uh, many MSc and PhD students, particularly he has published also uh, around 100, more than 150 research papers. And he is uh, right now in various committees in the research advisory, com uh, research uh, academic council, uh, uh, research advisory committee of many institutes, particularly the Indian Institute of Pulses Research, Directorate of Tissue Research, and Indian National uh, Natural Gums and uh, Resins, Ranchi. Then the National uh, then Scientific Advisory Committee member in the National Horticultural Research and um, Development NHRDF, New Delhi, and uh, Institute Management Committee in IHR, Bangalore. So uh, without uh, um, spending much time, I'll request our honorable speaker, uh, Dr. Subhash Chandra, for, to deliver the lecture that is simulation of climate change impact on the crop pest interactions and management of management adapt adaptation thereof. 
very very interest interesting topic uh, th thank you very much uh, dr s d mohapatra very good morning to everyone most respected dr c d mai chair chairperson of the session dr mehti and uh, all other uh, co speakers and all dr pathak and uh, all the uh, attendees who have joined this uh, seminar so first of all i wish to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and uh, as spoken i will be uh, speaking about simulation of climate impact on crop pest interactions sir uh, kindly switch on switch full mode sir slide screen mode okay screen yeah thank you sir so as we know that climate change is the most important global issues issue being uh, debated these days and uh, it has implications for uh, uh, biodiversity for agriculture and for livelihood of people broadly climate change has different dimensions like slow and definite change temperature that the so far we have witnessed about 0.8 5 degree uh, rise in temperature uh, during the previous uh, century and uh, by 2100 it, it is it likely to Uh, increase by 1.7 to 1.5 depend depending upon different regions and different uh, developmental activities but another uh, what is very important that is the climatic variability that is interannual changes which are very important from uh, agriculture point of view from pest point of view and also again extreme climatic chaotic events which are the most important and uh, there has been uh, increase in uh, frequency of these events and that is uh, most uh, uh, important cause of concern so and as far as these uh, pest species are concerned they are very very important because they cause huge losses and uh, now uh, at current uh, the value of these losses estimated for 1 190000 to 225000 crores and uh, over the years we have been witnessing the drastic changing the pest scenario of different crops they are invasive species they are entering the country and spreading throughout the country and <clears throat> and this yield loss if we can prevent these yield losses it is estimated that uh, it will be possible to save 60 million tons of food grains and 65 million tons of horticulture produce and that will be sufficient to feed uh, around uh, Uh, 300 million people so that is the importance of crop losses and then naturally we need to uh, prevent this have to prevent this or there is no other uh, avenues to increase crop products because it is not possible to bring more areas of agriculture at present scenario of development and our competitive activities over the years we have seen there are these extreme weather events they have caused severe crop losses frequency of pest outbreak outbreaks have increased and every year from one region to another we witness one pest or disease uh, 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 resulting into the outbreaks and uh, very uh, damage to the crops so these are the some of the this different bph uh, and other diseases leaf holder outbreak so <clears throat> overall this intensity of pest problems is on the increase climate change and pests uh, climate change will have both direct and indirect effects on the insects uh, and as temperature is the most important factor in climate change because it affects directly insect development and survival and simple rule is there the insects ecologically if you see they have different temperature regimes and their activities depend upon that there is a favorable range between which they Uh, rate of development directly proportional to temperature on lower side there is the period of inactivity lower threshold upper threshold also so when we talk of uh, uh, impacts on pests uh, there will be variable depending upon the region and they will be species specific we can't give any blanket statement that which pest will increase or which pest which regions increase because if after temperature increase also if ambient conditions remain favorable for the pest then there may be increase in its uh, population or its uh, damage intensity but if it exceeds the upper threshold 
then there may be adverse effects also. We have to see with this background. But what is generally believed that temperate latitudes to become favorable for the pest because their already conditions are not favorable. With temperature increase will result in favorable conditions. So in general, they will become favorable. But tropical latitudes like India, that we have to see which season, which crop, and uh, which region, whether it is southern parts or northern parts, and based on that, so it will be species specific and region specific. Generally, if you see the global map, generally see that uh, those regions like this uh, above this uh, 23 degree 26 minutes of, on northern hemisphere and also below southern sphere, those regions they will be uh, projected to become favorable, and some parts of India also they come in that. Climate change impacts on pests, direct impacts, they include changes in geographic distribution. There will be changes in the distribution, changes in migrating behavior, changes in overwintering success, means winter survival may be increased. Interspecific interaction, many species, similar species are there. So which species will be favored with higher temperature? So those will become more important. Changes in population growth rates, these uh, species with the uh, uh, short life cycles, they may realize uh, more number of generations, effect on biological control agents, and changes in pest, keep, uh, pest crop synchrony. So these are the direct impacts in, that will be direct of the temperature. Indirect effect on the pest will be through host plants, through elevated CO2. Means uh, CO2, that level 400 PP on food, that, that uh, is not harmful to insect directly, but through host plants, through food plants, it may affect and uh, there will be also effect of increased temperature on resistance, host plant resistance, because thermosensitive type of resistance may be broken down. <clears throat> we have seen that this rainfall variability, climatic variability is very, very important from agriculture point of view and pest point of view. And uh, we have seen that BPH has become a very serious pest after, after 2008, was the first outbreak. And after regularly we have been witnessing out in 2010, 13, 16, 17, 18, in this year also population was very high. So when after 2013 outbreak, we were interested to know what is the reason and we analyzed 15 years data. And what we could see that <clears throat> during June to September months, if there are more number of rainy days, more than 30 rainy days with rainy days, there is high probability of BPI outbreak. And then we validated this thumb rule and we could find out that out of five years, uh, <clears throat> out of five years, with more than 30 rainy days, there were BPH outbreak during four years. So therefore, this rain forecast may provide a clue about likely. So we need to analyze such kind of data to see what will the likely effect on this uh, change, climatic variability, temperature and rainfall on pests. As far as assessment of climate change impact on Pest species is concerned, it can be done through experiments as well as through simulation model. When we talk of experiments, it, it can be assessed through open top chambers, phase free air, carbon dioxide exchange, free air temperature enhancement, temperature gradient tunnels. And through simulation models, crop pest models, they are, they can, they are also being used to assess climate change impacts. However, previously, these biotic stresses, they in general been ignored in simulation models. So, but now we, we developed this info crop model, which is a detailed ecophysiological model, which takes into consideration the crop variety, crop, uh, what you call characteristics, agronomic inputs, this uh, soil and uh, weather conditions and pest types. And we have coupled this pest the effects to this uh, <coughs> model. So in direct impacts of climate change of I believe you see this can be done through open top chambers and free air carbon dioxide exchange and these facilities are available in IRA we have in doing this in the environmental science division this is and through open top chambers. So in this uh, open these uh, phases uh, it provides a natural setting for the pest incidence we are as in this soft number this is uh, act as a barrier so we have to inoculate what we have assessed. So we have seen that there is a nutritive effect on the plants of elevated CO2. There is increase in plant size with more foliage creating favorable microclimate. And there is also increase in CN ratio. CN ratio means uh, nitrogen proportion of nitrogen is decreasing. So insect, they need to feed more or suck more 
to to derive uh, amino acids required amount of amino acids so their uh, damage increases so this is like this we study impact of this through on bph and we could find out this was this is on healthy crop so as such we found that at an elevated co2 and uh, ambient co2 we could find that there is nutritive effect of elevated co2 on plants this like number of tillers reproductive tillers and then elevated co2 we found that there is higher loss despite nutritive effect there is higher loss due to bph compared to ambient co2 34% and 23% and this could be attributed to means higher population of bph due to improved microclimate also more honeydew excretion which is taken as a representative for sucking rate so both feeding rate and population both increased but however uh, this is an incomplete story interactive effect of uh, co2 and temperature because that is happening together co2 is increasing your temperature increases therefore we need to study interactive effect and that interactive effect of elevated co2 and uh, temperature can be studied to see fate this uh, free air temperature enhancement and co2 enhancement so that facility is also available besides uh, we have these ozone chambers and temperature gradient tunnels which can be used to assess climate change impact on pest and disease as well as on crops as far as simulation is concerned that yield loss assessment uh, we need that is very very important to for research prioritization as well as for pest management decision which pest is more important rate important mostly we follow this empirical approach which is use of regression models we regress yield on pest incidence find out these regression models and calculate uh, yield in pest relationship and economic threshold in injury levels however this approach does not take into consideration physiological basis of pest damage therefore these relations are location specific and time specific that is a major drawback it means we develop, need to develop these relations for each and every location however mechanistic ap approach through simulation models that considers physiological basis of pest damage damage mechanism which is a universal approach and these models may be easily adapted for local application they may be called as local global approach with local applications so this is the process like when we relate pest incidence to crop yield this is an empirical approach whereas when we go through uh, pest incidence through the biodiversity mechanism to crop yield it is a mechanistic approach so this one is an universal approach and uh, this uh, info crop model that takes into consideration this physiological approach therefore it accounts for crop management photosynthesis evapotranspiration all physiological ecological processes so basically damage mechanism this mechanistic approach is based on simulation approach is based on damage mechanism so all insects diseases weeds and nematodes they can be classified based on the damage mechanism into seven major groups like so this this classification is uh, irrespective of disciplinary boundaries so it tr transcends disciplinary boundaries so uh, insects and disease they may be uh, group together whereas two insects they they may be grouped differently so like we have germination reducers stand reducers which affect leaf area light stealers which interfere with the photosynthetically active radiation assimilation rate reducer which reduce radiation use efficiency assimilate sappers which increase maintenance cost of the like sucking insects tissue consumers leaf area stem basically and target reducers like nematodes which affect nutrient and water uptake and all soil pathogens so basically these all the steps in photosynthesis of the crops and different pests and they interfere with different plant physiological processes therefore it is called a universal approach and these are the coupling points for these uh, in the that uh, relational diagram so which light stealers germination reducers how they affect the photosynthesis activities or uh, uh, different uh, processes of photosynthesis and for calibration of these models we need to have this type of data like uh, all routine data what we in normal uh, entomological pathological experiments we take but uh, certain more data like leaf area index and uh, yield and total dry matter etc for calibration and validation of this model basic purpose of this is uh, uh, application of simulation is the application of uh, these models uh, modeling for to increase efficiency of field experiments and this is the procedure how we simulate the effects like uh, we have the model 
and we have different steps in this so when we run the model with weather condition under which crop is growing and without any biotic stress it gives us attainable yield and when we run the same model with different runs the model through damage with the pest levels or disease levels it gives actual yield and difference between these two attainable yield and actual yield gives us yield loss so this is basically because we get uh, we can generate different type of scenarios and we can explore them and finally so it helps to, uh, to have increase efficiency of field experimentation and we can have these uh, uh, developed decision support tools like uh, simulation of economic injury levels location specific because we can calibrate and validate these models for different situation and different weather conditions and uh, when we develop these uh, uh, economic uh, injury levels with uh, these empirical models they have the uh, constraint of being location specific and we need to develop those model feature development but these models simulation models can be easily adapted and calibrated for different situations so that we can have location specific likewise we can have iso loss curves under different which uh, say as the uh, relationship between pest incidence and the crop phenology and depending upon uh, combination of pest and disease uh, if these such type of iso loss curves given to extension workers or workers in the field and based on that uh, field situation they can assess whether this at particular crop stage this is a pest incidence and whether it warrants any intervention so that they can be used for pest monitoring and timing of pesticide application or any management interventions likewise uh, simulation of pest dynamics also that is another part we use we do simulation models uh, we relate uh, this pest incidence with different weather factors but again these they have the what you call uh, constant of being location specific so with thermal what we do with thermal constant based population simulation model degree days based population simulation models as we know the thermal constant has universal applicability and uh, only because being cold blooded organisms uh, so uh, uh, their development takes place only within a given range of temperature conditions and based on that we can develop find out this effective temperature or thermal constant uh, based on this uh, uh, daily minimum maximum and their developmental threshold and then summing of this effective temperature over the periods we can find out the thermal constant and then which which has a predictive value for completion of development of particular stage and we have done this for like uh, ag, the different stage names we have brown plant hopper and then when we do, grow these insects at different temperatures like constant temperatures in uh, incubators and growth chambers at different constant 18 21 24 in wide range of conditions and then we find out developmental rate and explore it it gives us uh, this regression equation and from this regression equations we can find out thermal constant as a reciprocal of regression coefficient and also threshold of development as this uh, ratio of uh, intercept and regression so for this we have developed these uh, different thermal constants and for this by this approach and further based on this which uh, these uh, biological ecological factors like thermal constant fecundity mortality we have developed these uh, mechanistic population models from different involving different stages egg names adults and then for hollow metabolites like egg larva pupa adult so this is a mechanistic model and in this we can see if the population is changing in one year which, which, which whether it uh, fecundity is affected or mortality is high or uh, uh, temperature is not favorable so that uh, based on that population dynamics or population size can be accounted for further we have coupled these models population modules with the crop growth model so when we run these models we run this model for the crop info crop with sowing and we run this model appearance of the pest in the field and with weather conditions so it gives it generates pest population and pest population depending upon pest damage mechanism it affects different plant physiological process and then that ultimately affects plant growth and yield so based basically we can assess impact of various factors whatsoever they are involved in this and also population on crop growth and yield and as, as well as on pest population and further these models can be used for assessing impact of climate change or temperature rise and co2 on so we have used these models uh, 
by 2020 and uh, two conditions like Delhi and Adu Durai, and we found there are differences, so the differences uh, uh, mean in the population because depending on the conditions there. So it has the uh, capability of addressing those uh, changes in uh, ecological conditions in a particular locations. Another part that is the very important is climate change mitigation adaptation. Basically, assessment is okay because that will affect and uh, what are the impacts, how they are assessed, but then how, what to do to sustain our productivity. So that is the major thing. So what should be the adaptation mitigation? Mitigation actually means uh, uh, reducing uh, source, uh, acting on sources of greenhouse gases and reducing emissions. And mitigation means adapting our technology, agriculture technology or pest management technology so that pest situation doesn't worsen and uh, our uh, yields are sustained or rather increased. So in this case, IPM plays very, very important role. I, IPM is very, very specific and you see it always go for uh, what you call precision application of uh, inputs, precision application of uh, IPM inputs. And it also helps like in case of rice, I have seen that we always recommend alternate wetting and drying, avoid excess use of nitrogen. So we give general recommendations. But besides reducing pest and disease incidence, it also helps to reduce methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions. So in that way, IPM is very, very uh, helpful in uh, 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 means mitigating and also uh, adaptation, of course, uh, we need to do what, what need to be done, but it helps to mitigate also. So adaptation to climate change means pest surveillance is very, very important, like reliable forewarning we need so we can have timely preparedness. Watch out for invasive species beside routines invasive because we are caught napping. When invasive comes, it is reported from one place, suddenly it appears, reports appear from all the parts. It means it has already spread. So therefore, ensure early detection through rigorous monitoring. So we need a networking so that quickly detected and contained. Host plant resistance means we need to identify thermostable sources of resistance. Some of the, these uh, sorghum varieties, which are still tolerant or resistance in India, they have become susceptible in Kenya under high temperature conditions to sorghum mix. We need to breeding for both pest and drought resistance, and we need to look for unique traits. Using non-chemical methods, of course, that is IPM always says this intercropping pheromone traps, and these uh, other sticky traps, etc. So much more and more use of bio, bio pesticide are very, very important. They need to play in ecological engineering. Of course, coming means growing of flowering plants to enhance and converse natural enemies, evolve strains of natural enemies for high temperature tolerance. These microbial agents are projected to play a very important role because minimum environmental impact and also their short life cycle and easy adaptation. So these fungi and PV, Bt, and introduction of additional species of biocontrol agents. This is the ecological engineering. We have tried in rice ecosystem, different flowering plants, and we could find that these uh, spiders, buried bugs, and of course their species were enhanced and this incidence of white and plant hoppers that was on decline. And in biology control, we also need to ensure availability of IPM inputs, entrepreneurship, and also this <coughs> development for rural, uh, rural youth and farm women. Chemical control is very, very important, but con chemical control situations, but however, this efficacy of this uh, uh, chemicals will also be affected by temperature. Increased metabolic rate or high temperature could result in faster by plants. CO2 will also affect the efficacy of chemicals to morphological and physical changes, increased thickness of cuticle wax, increased canopy size. And therefore, there may be need for modification in pesticide application rates required spray volumes, et cetera. And, but we could see, we could see that we could see that there was increase in crop circumference under elevated CO2, if you see this in the rice. And then we tried different spray volumes like 400 to 700 volume. And what we could find under controlled conditions that 400 to 500 liters were not sufficient under elevated CO2. And for similar mortality, higher spray volume was recorded. Farmers are going for still less spray volumes. So these are the uh, ponderable issues and we need to find out in terms of adaptations, what need to be done. So therefore, I wish to conclude that climate is a reality now and climate variability and extreme events could have profound effects on pest populations. We need reliable forewarning through population dynamic simulation and surveillance. We need to 
evolve mitigation adaptation strategies there is sensitization of stakeholders and ensure availability of ipm inputs for water so thank you very much for if any questions i will share so thank you very much uh, dr chandar uh, uh, that was a very good and excellent presentation on how you also de described how the what are the dimensions of climate change which is really reality and the crop loss estimates and their importance how it is going to affect and how this uh, climate change are going to affect globally also and uh, the pest crop synchrony for that and particularly you also concluded with uh, the mitigation strategies uh, how ipm is going to uh, support this uh, mitigation strategies so it is a very thought provoking uh, presentation i think there would be so many questions and uh, dr mai please uh... so in that case uh, sure. i think uh, we can have questions in the discussion session uh, can we can i request our next speaker dr ps vijay kumaran is he on board yes sir yeah okay so okay. dr mahapatra please introduce our next speaker thank you sir uh, first of all before uh, introducing our next speaker just i'll say thanks to our previous speaker professor subhash chandra actually he is working on uh, this uh, modeling and pest forecasting in which area i am also working so in the context of this uh, particular lecture i will say some uh, one or two sentence uh, in the era of this particularly the iot or sensors uh, the research for forewarning that means a lot particularly the established uh, uh, address to this nation by honorable prime minister that farmers group on natural farming this forewarning will certainly uh, reduce or significantly uh, reduce the pest, uh, pesticide applications and it will uh, promote the natural farming uh, we are very much thankful to you sir for uh, your efforts to share these uh, thoughts and experiences particularly the pest forewarning research in pest management in context to rice research thank you sir so our next speaker is uh, dr ps vijay kumar who is currently working as scientist in the institute of nano science and technology mohali that is set up by dst government of india he is uh, he did his uh, bsc in agriculture in 2001 from tamil nadu agriculture university msc also from the same university and phd in phd in 2006 uh, then uh, post doctoral fellow from national chengkang university taiwan in 2014 and subsequently in the uh, in the previously he has also uh, done the post doc fellow in, from national chemical laboratory pune in 2009 so i welcome uh, dr Pro uh, ps vijay kumar to deliver the lecture on the nanotechnology for precise and targeted pest management dr kumar please Uh, is my screen uh, visible ppt visible yes it is visible just just uh, keep, uh, put it in the sli slide em mode full screen mode okay is it in full screen sir yes 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 yeah uh, so this reads uh, nanotechnology for precise and targeted pest and fertilizer management right is it that it, it reads is 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 the slide reading that Yes. Nanotechnology for precise. Okay, yeah, thank you. 
Okay. Uh, good morning to everyone, the whole fraternity of uh, Association for Rice Research Workers uh, who are attending this uh, symposium as well as organizing this symposium by ARRW uh, in the context of Diamond Jubilee celebration of this association uh, under the name of this symposium that is Next Generation Technology for Enhancing Productivity, Profitability and uh, Resilience of Rice Farming. So before going to the talk, I wish to thank uh, uh, Dr. Mahapatra for being kind enough to introduce me to the forum. And I also extend my thanks to the co-chair of this session, uh, Professor Mai and uh, Professor Mai T. Uh, further, I extend my gratitude uh, to Professor Patak, uh, the director uh, who's organizing this uh, event. So, uh, here um, it's a pleasure for me to share my uh, research work that I'm doing in our lab. And uh, also it has been a great pleasure to listen to the recent advances that is happening in agriculture science, especially in ICAR in the context to make this uh, agriculture practice a profitable venture. Especially yesterday's uh, session, uh, the panel discussion session that was organized by the chair, DDG uh, Crop Science Sir, uh, where he emphasized and directed, motivated, encouraged all of us to work towards uh, zero carbon cultivation. It was an excellent discussion with knowledge pool where the agronomic soil science technique that is ready to face this challenge and have already said this is this need not be weighted up to 2070 and it is possible to reach by 2040. And it was also a proud event to note that there is about thousand varieties of rice from ICAR. And uh, of course, uh, last but not least, that uh, the whole process, they have emphasized to have women counterpart in this. Of course, uh, it is very important in all the part of uh, entrepreneurship, especially in agriculture, right from the research to the field activities. And finally, uh, there was a knowledge pool from biofertilizer and bio uh, uh, bioprotection, which all gave us a wider idea how to achieve this uh, zero carbon cultivation. In this context, we are also taking baby steps with the nanotechnology. We are making formulations which can make the pesticide there present day pesticide and fertilizer more efficient by targeted delivery systems that can help in the zero carbon cultivation. So in this context, I will briefly introduce the lab work that we are doing uh, with the four objectives that is production, protection, preservation and processing. And followed by that, uh, a detailed description in case of protection what are all the formulation that we have developed? That is one on the insecticide development, one on the fungicide development, and one on the pheromone development. And then comes a preservation technology that we have developed, which is also a kind of protection after the harvest. And then comes the nanofertilizers that we have developed for the targeted application with the silica-based system, a couple of systems. And then finally, I'll cut to Okay. So coming to the production and protection, as I'm going to detailedly uh, discuss this in the next coming slides, let us skip these two. And coming to the preservation and processing. So uh, once again, preservation also, I'll be explaining it in detail. So let us see the processing. In case of processing, of course, we know this mushroom have uh, vitamin D precursor. 
so which needs to be converted into vitamin D with the UV light. So uh, this is conventionally done with the UV light. So here we have replaced it with upconversion nano disc. It is a disc made of one centimeter quartz uh, platform coated with the upconversion nanoparticle. This particle have the ability to take the sun radiation and convert it into UV light locally. And this UV light that is locally converted can help in the conversion of ergosterol to vitamin D. So this is this disc can be used n number of times and this doesn't need any energy. You have to just insert into the mushroom and you have to keep the mushroom in the sunlight and automatically it takes the light and convert into UV and the yeah, vitamin fortification happens naturally in the mushroom in any remote area, any hilly area, it can take place. Okay, This is the development that we have done in processing as because India is also marching towards becoming a processing uh, food processing hub globally or kind of a global kitchen it wants to be by the Ministry of Food, which is a baby ministry from Ministry of Agriculture Sciences. Okay, and we are also focusing on developing sensors in all these four ventures that is production, protection, preservation and processing. Our sensors are kind of uh, ready to use in the field, kind of mobile uh, camera based or kind of uh, resistance based or kind of uh, chemo resistance based. Okay, now coming to the protection. So as uh, Professor, uh, the previous speakers have already elaborated what is the kind of loss that happens by the pest? So here, so the pesticide has become a uh, like important measure that should be taken in the cultivation. But whatever the pesticide that is being applied, more than 90% goes as loss. Okay, it goes as volatile, it is decomposed, it is chemically degraded, it is leached away, and it is washed away. Okay. More than 90% is lost in spite of using the industry successful emulsion formulation. Okay. So in this, the highest loss is happening by the rain. Okay. Over 35 to 40% is by rain. Okay. It simply wash away the emulsion. Okay. So here we thought, why don't we have a kind of 2D sheet like this? which will not be washed away with the water, unlike the emulsion, and can stay on the leaf, okay? And in this context, there is also another emphasis in agriculture that soil or soil carbon is getting reduced day by day. And there is a mission globally to increase the soil carbon. In soil carbon increasing mission, there is also recommendation for biochar. Biochar is nothing but pyrolyzed biomass, which is a graphite structure, which is sp2 carbon okay so this carbon is the cheapest material that one can think of for the agriculture application of course there are other allotropes like fluorine carbon nanotubes which are all very expensive unlike that the biochar can be simply prepared by pyrolyzing in anoxic condition in these kind of furnaces okay and what we at the end get is these kind of graphite Okay. So this graphite is bulk by having graphene sheets, okay, sp2 carbon sheets that is piled up and these sheets are about 0.3 nanometer in the range. Okay. Once it is oxidized with the harsh acidic condition in the presence of oxidizing agent like MnSO4, you get these carbon-carbon bond breaking and dangling outside. Once it dangles outside, it starts coming away. Okay, it separates out. The piled carbon graphite gets starts separated out, which is called graphene oxide, this exfoliated graphene oxide, which can be slightly reduced, okay? And once it is reduced, these bonds regain and it is highly energetic. Okay, whatever is there on the surface, it tries to trap it. Okay, say for example, you have one molecule of pesticide in one liter of water. Okay, you think about it. 
it is so less it is so less than ppp so less than ppp okay in that concentration this carbon having so much of energy to bind anything in that will trap the uh, pesticide in it okay so this we have used it since because it can efficiently trap the pesticide in it, it can go up to 200% loading of pesticide and it can strongly bind to the cuticle surface, once again having unoccupied surface of these uh, benzene kind of rings, okay, that can strongly bind to the leaf and can stay there forever uh, and not being washed away. So now comes the question, when this kind of material is used, will it be releasing the pesticide into the pest? Okay, the gut of the pest have high alkaline pH. Okay, as we all know in the cry protein, the cry protein release is happening because of high alkaline pH in the gut of the pest. Okay, so the same phenomenon we have used here, we have coated it with a polymer. Okay, and this polymer and the binding that is happening by the pi pi and the hydrogen binding, Manroll's binding, can be compromised with the high alkaline condition in the gut and the targeted release of the pesticide happens. So, until the pest takes the graphene composite pesticide, the pesticide stays with the graphene oxide in the leaf and when it is taken, because of the high alkaline condition in the pest, it starts releasing. Okay, this is how the targeted release have been designed here. So this, this is about material characterization, which I don't want to spend time here. And followed by pesticide loading here. This is what we have found the almost like 400%, approximately 400% loading of pesticide we were able to document with the GCMS study. And this is highly stable in the aqueous condition. As you can see, if you keep, even if it is kept for three months, it keeps the same dispersion, okay, which is important for the pesticide industry today. Okay, and this has been tested with the uh, cabbage white butterfly uh, larva. And we were able to see that there is an efficient death in the uh, pest in spite of giving washing to the leaf. Okay, In spite of giving a washing, simulated rain has been given to the control emulsion and the composite that we have prepared. We were able to see that 30% increase in the binding efficiency of on the leaf. Okay. Remember that although there is a high binding, still there is about uh, almost like 50 or uh, 45 percent loss of the uh, composite by washing, okay, which we have attended in the next work, which I'll be highlighting, okay. So here we have shown how the targeted release is happening in the presence of high alkaline condition with the photothermal effect, which, is, which can also contribute in case of diural pest because they actively feed on the pest, uh, leaf in the uh, daylight. That light can be converted into heat and that can trigger the release of the pesticide. Okay, And this is by the uh, polarity change the release happens. Okay, And finally, we are saying the composite is having the pesticide, okay, and it is staying there, okay, on the leaf. What it happens after the life of plant, okay? So here we have incorporated some cheap semiconductor nanoparticle, copper selenide, okay, which is able to reduce the half-life of the pesticide. Say, for example, if the pesticide is having a half-life of six months, the pesticide's half-life can be reduced to two, three months by changing the concentration of copper selenide. And thus, you can see that there is no more residual effect residual effect can be reduced. At the same time, there will be good uh, control in the pest in the uh, period of crop. Okay, coming to next work. This is about uh, fungicide application. Here, as I mentioned, 50% of the composite is being washed away. I think I have already like uh, crossed the time, but like I'll take another five minutes and wind up. Okay, so here the composite we said already the 50% of the composite is being washed away. Okay, what is the benefit when we are having this graphene oxide for the application of fungicide? Okay, of course, because of the copper selenide is being used, there is a complementary effect that we have shown. Up 
apart from that, here we have changed the polymer, that is ketosin that we have used, that can open up for the fungal acidic pH. Whereas when it falls down, the, down to the soil from the leaf, the ketosin have the ability to shrink down in the soil phosphate uh, ions. Okay, So when it shrinks down, it keeps the fungicide with the graphene oxide in the topsoil for the microbial degradation. Otherwise, the fungicide that will quickly leach down, be, being hydrophilic, it will quickly leach down to the soil water where it have an extended 10 times of life extension. Okay. So this residual effect can be controlled by having these kind of uh, formulation that can take the, keep the uh, pesticide in the topsoil for the microbial degradation. So this is how the triple smart eco-friendly anthracnose control has been shown. That is first it bind on the leaf and it smartly release the fungicide when the fungus attacks on it. And then when it falls down also, it again shrinks and closes, holds the pesticide from being leached to the groundwater. Okay, that is the three function that we have shown in this work. This is about the characterization and the composite loading characterization. And this is what we have shown with the phosphate, I mean, the soil, what happens uh, by holding the pesticide because of the phosphate ions. This, uh, with the increase in phosphate ions, we were able to show that there is really a, a reduced release of the fungicide. Okay, that's the anthracnose leaf spot, uh, leaf spot have been controlled in the leaf. This has been done in collaboration with NRRI Bomeshwar. Okay, now coming to the next uh, next generation eco-friendly way of controlling the pest that has been already talked about by a professor, uh, I mean, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Olson, uh, two talks before. The ecological engineering to manage the pest in an eco-friendly way. Here, the major challenge is, uh, that is, of course, she has already, uh, uh, Dr. have already explained that the pheromones play an important role that confuses the male and female and the uh, control can be happened. Okay, this pheromone, <clears throat> this is the pheromone that has been developed for the uh, tomato pinworm tuta absoluta by uh, <clears throat> NBAIR. Uh, Bonishwa, the ICR Institute. Uh, here we collaborated with uh, Dr. K7 and his team. So uh, the problem with this is once again, it mines inside the leaf, whatever the pesticide that you apply also do not reach so quickly to them. And so uh, otherwise you have to go to systemic pesticide, which is not good for uh, uh, <clears throat> edible part. So these are all the limitations that are there. So here uh, the pheromone is the good one to go for. So the conventional method is to go for a commercial septa or cellulose paper or some dispensers. These have very less uh, short life lifespan and in case of a commercial septa, the stability is also a problem. Okay, So we have used this graphene oxide. As I showed, it is a 0.3 nanometer sheet that can pile together. And this is an extremely low dense material that is having one gram of material have a surface area of 2,600 meters square, okay? So one gram of material, which will be like this, okay? will have a surface area of 2,500 meters square with so much of uh, layers on it that can form a maze like structure like this, okay? So we have mixed the pheromone and the graphene oxide together to make this uh, maze-like structure. So this maze, basically what it does is it increases the diffusion pathway to million times, okay? When it is increased such a million times, we were able to increase the pheromone life significantly. Okay, this uh, has been checked with antenogram. Uh, we were able to see that it is able to release in the same ratio. Those two acetates should be released in one to nine ratio that it is able to be supported by this platform as like the commercial septa, as you can see here. And further, the field evaluation was happening in which the GIVO uh, tuta absoluta pheromone was a performing well that was able to catch around the 900, I mean 900 to 1000 moths when the commercial uh, 
platform was able to collect only 600 to 700 mods. Okay, this is the field picture that has been shared. And uh, these are all other characterization mechanisms which we have explored with the AFM and uh, SEM. Uh, basically, it forms a stake like this. Uh, you can see here the stake that is being formed by the graphene oxide, which increases the diffusion pathway. And uh, I, I, I think I have like taken much time, maybe in some other time, I will explain about the preservation and uh, targeted uh, fertilizer application that we have developed. So, with this, uh, I wish to conclude my presentation that is this uh, through this graphene oxide we were able to develop targeted pesticide application through the same graphene oxide we were able to develop a triple smart fungicide delivery system and a smart pheromone application system okay the preservative of course we have prepared with the same graphene oxide where we have loaded excess amount of graphene oxide and this graphene oxide have been cast into a carbon paper and this paper when it is wrapped with the fruit we were able to see there is an extension in the life of uh, fruits and in case of targeted fertilizer as you can see the composite one side it is closed and the other side it is open. The one side that is being opened is because of the protonation of the root and the other side being closed is because of the carbonate bicarbonate ions in the soil. That is how we protect the fertilizer in phytoavailable form. At the same time, it is being made available for the plants. And uh, this one, to take it in the large scale, here we have used fibers, jute fiber, where we have coated with silica, and this can be used as a recyclable fertilizer matrix, reusable fertilizer matrix. Simply, if you have jute uh, soaked with uh, uh, fertilizer, and then if you apply it, it will degrade quickly. Here we have given a nano coating of silica, and so it, ha it have the ability to increase the life of jute and also it gives the spongy uh, retention capacity, okay? Whatever the time you compress it, since because the silica is giving a skeletal structure, it is again able to retain the structure to in, once again uh, absorb the fertilizer. And uh, most of our work, we have uh, compiled it in this progress in material science, which is one of the very uh, strong review. Uh, so all these uh, nano agriculture uh, work that is being done by us and as well as globally have been compiled by us recently in this uh, interesting review one can refer to and I do outreach whenever there is time possible. And this is my research group. I have uh, 10 students working with me and one postdoc. So we explore all the possibilities of increasing agriculture economy through production, protection, preservation, and processing. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Vijay Kumar, for an excellent presentation on the, the, the effective ways of how to attain the zero carbon agriculture through nanoparticles. And also you explained about uh, the how 2D carbon nano particles gives higher efficacy in pesticide and also less residues. Also, the, you also described nicely about the triple smart nano carriers and also the nano mesh layer through which the pheromones can be highly effectively utilized. So thank you very much. I think uh, Dr. Mai uh, has not yet joined. So uh, I, can, I declare, the, I mean, we can have a, a discussion session apart from the questions which are posted on the chat box. So anyone can uh, read out the chat box if there are questions. I found a few, one was from Dr. Kutu, which has been already uh, answered by Professor Shannon. And if there are any questions, uh, we can take one or two uh, important questions. So, Dr. Bijay Kumar, good, mo yes. good yes, morning, please. sir. Basan Gowda here. Yeah, please. Sir, I have actually two questions to Dr. Shannon. Shannon, are you here? Uh, I think... Uh... I'm here, I'm here. Yes, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful presentations on chemical ecology. Uh, I would like to know, uh, 
the progress uh, of chemical ecology the pace in pace and the achievements which has made in the lepidopteran group is much much higher compared to some of lepidopteran coleoptera of course are much much better compared to the hemipteran group yeah so do you do you think uh, is it because of the practical difficulty of, of working in case of smaller sucking pest that is why chemical ecology is not that progressed compared to lepidopteran coleoptera Uh, I think it's multiple factors. Um, one is just a, a basic chemical uh, uh, reason. So lepidopteran pheromones tend to be uh, very simple uh, derivatives of long chain fatty acids. So there, you you kind of have a, an idea of what you're looking for. Whereas in other insect groups, they can be all sorts of things they they can be you know even derivatives of amino acids they can even be things coming from bacterial symbionts in the gut of the insect so they can be extremely diverse chemically that causes one problem another problem is just a general bias that we have in entomology uh, lepidoptera and diptera are are just very broadly studied across you know for for me ecological and entomological standpoint whereas other groups like uh hymenop uh, uh heteroptera as you were referring to like sucking pests as well as um coleoptera which are our most diverse taxa are relatively understudied. Um, that's one of the reasons that, that our group makes a point to study uh, groups like I mentioned, I talked about a beetle in my talk today, is for that reason. Um, I think it's just a bias that we've had in, in science rather than um, a true problem with studying them. But from an agricultural standpoint, these pests, beetles, sucking insects, and are, are in many cases the most damaging pests and require the most study. So this goes back to a long standing standing problem we have honestly between between agriculture ecology and getting these sort of interdisciplinary fields together and it's a dream of mine as a scientist in india that uh, and somebody who has worked in agriculture her whole career that we start to unite these fields more more closely actually and work together a little bit better so thank you very much for that question thank you i have an, another small question uh, how do you see the crosstalk between the chemical molecules when you use a pheromone in the field like uh, i think in the case of coffee borer so you have some red palm you will get trapped that's because we're not we were not using pheromones so pheromones are species specific chemicals so so a lot of the examples um you know one of my friends subahar and our last speaker talked about the tuta absoluta pheromone that is specific to that species so there shouldn't be too much crosstalk that's actually a, an evolutionary adaptation of these insects sometimes you can get crosstalk with invasive species potentially but that's very rare so that's a very rare exception what we were studying were plant volatiles now plant volatiles are much more common right so so many organisms can utilize those and that was kind of the point i was trying to make with that with that example is that in these cases some of these trapping uh, uh, options may not really be possible for you so in organisms that don't really strongly use pheromones for for uh, for attracting each other or for which you know plant volatiles seem to be much more attractive then you have to worry about crosstalk and that's why some of these other techniques as i mentioned like use, using a strategic cropping and things like that can be much more effective so no, even it, it's common in even some of the pheromones and so like in case of diamond back moth the pheromone crucifer pest so when we use it in the field we get some spodoptera getting trapped uh, i think it's even common in the lepidopteran pheromones also yeah that's rather okay so okay now you're getting it so so the, you're talking about the uh plutus uh plutus the 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 diamondback moth and some of the spodoptera you mean the like the fam right so things like right. that okay that's that has more to do with the fact that the pheromone mixtures being used are not precisely what the insects are using themselves the Species insect pheromones are species specific, but oftentimes for commercial, it can be difficult to produce or nearly impossible to produce the some of these chemicals, and they can be highly unstable. So a lot of these commercial pheromone lures don't use necessarily the full repertoire that the insect uses. So you have to separate the biological and the technological use of these chemicals at this point. So technologically, they are often um, not quite true replicates, and then you can get some cross species species. attraction for sure. So you're okay. correct. Yeah, thank you.
thank you very much i'm sorry dr baiti i was little away because i had another meeting uh, are there any questions for this session <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Maithi. Sir, there was there was. Sir, you are muted, sir. Dr. Maithi, sir. Yeah. Please unmute. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so, Dr. Mai, there were a couple of questions which have been answered by Dr. Shannon, and if there are any more, please go ahead. I'm Dr. sorry, Mata I was away. Was... Yeah. Okay. I had another yes, lecture uh, of DST. That's why. Yes, I... you. I uh, saw your. Uh, uh yeah dr mahapatra yes uh, i have one query from uh, professor senan uh, actually if you are uh, professor senan uh, are you able to uh, hear okay so uh, if you are given the choice of light and the uh, pheromone then what will be the preference of particularly the lepidopterans which are uh, Uh, both attracted both towards uh, light as well as the pheromones what will be the preference oh what a good question a very difficult question to answer i mean the attraction of insects especially night night flying insects like moths to to light is well known but you know ironically while it's been known since ancient times right ancient indian scripts talk about this phenomenon right it's been known for millennia we actually don't know why they do it it's a, it's actually a fascinating question i have a couple of uh, friends that i know um in india and also broad trying to figure this out why insects go to light we don't know that is a hard question to answer because it's a very strong attraction they have to light but it's actually not a very distant one so if you think about in terms of the the distance the pheromone traps will be much more long distance attractive for these for these creatures the light is a much more close range thing um but i I hesitate as a scientist to give you a choice because I don't know. That's a very strong attraction. That's I mean, that's why we use light traps, for example, to trap insects, right? Because it is very effective. Um, and of course, that is an increasingly uh, increasing problem we have uh, in India and across the world with light pollution at night that causes a lot of disruption of these other techniques. So I think it was a really good question you asked, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sanan. Uh, any other questions from the floor? If I would like not... to know, Dr. Dipankar, you have already heard all the lectures. Sir, yeah. I have one question for Dr. Vijay Kumar. Shall I ask, sir? Please go ahead. Vijay Kumar, okay. Uh, sir, actually, you told about the ketosan and uh, graphene oxide. Actually, which one is better? Actually, we can composite is better or separate one is better, sir? Either separately is better or synergistic action is better for nanoparticle formulation. Is the question to whom? Doctor Vijay Kumar. Doctor Vijay Kumar. Institute of Nanotechnology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sir, Is it you, audible are, now? Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah. I, I hear you. I hear you. So, see, uh, ketosan as such will form once again kind of emulsion. Okay. So, graphene oxide as such will also not be a complete dispersion. Okay, if you have graphene oxide alone, uh, it may not be suspending for a long time. Okay, so for an application, definitely it should be a very good suspension. Okay, so uh, always graphene oxide whenever it is used for any drug delivery system or pesticide application, it should be wrapped with ketosan. I mean, uh, it should be wrapped with some polymer, and the choice of polymer can like differ from your application. In our case, for example, first when we used for the pest, we used to polystyrene. Okay, because we wanted to. uh open up swell up in alkaline ph whereas if we use ketosan there in alkaline ph it will only shrink okay whereas in case of a uh, uh, what is that uh, fungicide application we have used ketosan because it can open up in acidic condition okay the choice of polymer should be in such a way that you get smart application thank you sir thank you very much So let us uh, 
conclude the session i think uh, dipankar ji yes please any any if there are no more questions and if there are still i think they can put it in the chat box and they can yeah, be replied yeah. later also yes so we would like to thank the organizer for uh, organize a very uh, excellent session on the next generations uh, plant protection technologies which are will be very useful uh, under indian conditions now because we have to see that as i have told you in the beginning there are lots of uh, new pest diseases and weeds which are now spreading all over the world it's not that it is only in india but they are now freely because of lot of travel and all those issues are there so under these situations we have to really be very alert for example i was the other day i was looking for the uh, the spread of uh, fall armyworm and i was shocked that within a span of 6 months it has gone from kashmir uh, kanyakumari to nagaland and from gujarat to you will find it is uh, everywhere in west bengal so wherever maize is grown it has spread so with that intensity there are and that too now with climate change so we have to be very careful about it and i am uh, sure that this uh, session which is organized is very apt session what are the next generation new technologies that we have and uh, how they can be more useful it may be a session for rice but i think it is overall very useful for almost all uh, crops of uh, agriculturally important so with these few words i would like to really thank the organizer and uh, particularly uh, i would like to now hand over it to dr maiti and to then to mahapatra to say a few words so that before we conclude this session thank you very much so thank you very much dr mai uh honorable uh, president dr mai and co chairman of the day session on next gen next technologies in pest management of this um, symposium president arrw dr himanshu patak director nri dr padmini swain secretary arrw dr md beg convener dr s d mahapatra of this session reporters dr n b patil and dr prabhukatikan the eminent speakers including dr smai dr shanan dr subhas chandra and dr vijay kumar esteemed delegates ladies and gentlemen first of all i congratulate the organizers of the symposium for selecting an important topic so timely and i place on record my thanks to the organizers for providing me the opportunity to attend this session for next generation agriculture systems the big data aided models and computational knowledge products are required so agricultural system models have become important tools to provide predictive and assessment capability to a growing array of decision makers in the private and public sectors both despite uh, ongoing research and model important improvements many of the agricultural models today are direct descendants of research investments initially made 30 to 40 years ago that is it is not new but we have to make it more efficient and many of the major advances in data information and communication technology of the past decade have not been fully exploited so we need to exploit it to its full capacity and the purpose of this symposium is to lay the foundation for the next generation of agricultural system data <coughs> models and knowledge products one of the distinguishing features of the next gen study and study methodology is to move from the conventional supply driven approach to the demand driven approach and a second distinguishing feature of the next gen study is to recognize the need for user friendly knowledge products that is tools that facilitate the use of model outputs so today we had four eminent speakers which uh, who uh, spoke on all the basically all the aspects of the next gen technology including next gen pesticide including nanomolecules using nanomolecules pesticide free pest management that is integration of modulation microbiomes and durable resistance 
non os resistance exploitation of next generation sequencing technology for test resistance particularly broad spectrum resistance employing eco engineering techniques to modify crop landscape aiming at providing bio controlling agent supportive environments high throughput pesticide resistance rnai mediated pest management technology use of digital platforms sensor based technology and communication tools for real time diagnosis advisory and management and uav and other aerial solution based pesticide application so with this i think this session will give us a platform in which we have to have a lot of thoughts on it and go ahead with disruptive researches so that in future we can have an ecologically balanced method of managing pests under the climate change so thank you very much to the organizers once again and uh, i hand over to dr mahapatra thank you very much thank you sir uh, now we have reached the last part of the uh, session that is proposing the vote of thanks so uh, i think dr charudat mai former chairman agriculture scientist recruitment board and lot of uh, many more uh, um, uh, positions he has occupied so <laughs> there are a lot of uh, yeah key positions uh, uh, narrating it will not be the timing uh, from the bottom of my heart for taking the uh, time from your busy schedule to conduct the session that is gen next technologies in the pest management and be the speaker of this session so uh, your presence and wise words help magnify our cause in the best possible way we are delighted for gracing our symposium invigorating all your spirits and enriching the knowledge for our participants i on behalf of organizer thank dr dipankar maiti former director national rice research institute for nicely conducting the session we look forward to our next interaction soon sir i thank dr himanshu patha director of national abiotic stress management and particularly the president of association of rice research workers who was instrumental in organizing or um, meticulously organizing this symposium and dr mj beg organizers organizing secretary of this symposium for giving me opportunity to be the convener of this session we are very much grateful for sparing time and effort by our eminent speakers dr subhash chandra professor shenan olson dr ps vijay kumar in taking time to share your thoughts and research experiences in this session that is gen next technologies in the pest management i also thank our madam dr p swai padmini swai director of our institute for attending this session and extending the all the logistic supports to the to for conduct of this rrw symposium i also thank our rapporteurs dr navin kumar dr uh, prabhu kartikeyan for reporting the proceedings of this session last but not least i thank one and all for attending the session and making the session lively thank you all thank you very much now this session is closed Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It was really enjoyable to listen to all the talks. Thank you. So, technical you. announcement. Uh, at 12.30, we have a opportunity to listen to our uh, Director General and Secretary Dear ICR lecture as a planned lecture. A separate link has been sent to all the participants through mail. So, all are requested to join at 12.30 to listen to our Director General and Dear ICR. Thank you. Thank you all speakers, dignitaries and participants who have participated in this symposium. Thank you. So the planetary lecture will be on the same link. So all the participants are requested to join the session at 12.30 to listen to our Director General ICA, Secretary Dyer. Dr. Guru, is it the same link? Dr. Guru? Yes, ma'am, it is the same, same link. Same, same link. Same link. Okay, okay. The same link. Okay, okay.
ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ ಓಕೆ ಮಾತಾಡಿದ್ರು ಹಲೋ ಸರ್ ಗುಡ್ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ನೂನ್ ಸರ್ Yes, who is speaking, please? Madam, this is from the DOI office from US Rights Show. Okay, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Yeah, in this, you please be in this link. At 12.30, we are organizing this uh, plenary lecture, which will Thank be delivered you. by our Honorable DG. So, please be there. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Madam, could you speak?
Hello. Hello. Namaskar. Um, uh, hello. Sir, namaskar. Ah, namaskar, namaskar. Sir, namaskar, sir. Namaskar. <laughs> sir, thank you, sir. Jaha, jami jami ti change ho, pache apna am sangra achanti, sir, ito bahut bada kotha. Thank you very much, sir. Uh-huh.
Oscar. 
डॉक्टर दास नमस्कार डॉक्टर दास नमस्कार सर नमस्ते सर हाँ थोड़ा सुंदर है नमस्कार नमस्कार मैडम आई थिंक सर नमस्कार सर नमस्कार डॉक्टर सुंदर हम नमस्कार योर डॉक्टर सेशन इज ओवर मैडम सर दैट दैट क्रॉप दैट पेस्ट मैनेजमेंट सेशन ओवर यस सर यस सर इट इज ओके आई थिंक आवर सोशल साइंस सेशन इज स्टिल गोइंग ऑन उटर दिस लेक्चर so they can stop it yes. they can have a break for say about an hour or so and if still there are some people so after this particular lecture they can again resume it
सर नमस्कार 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 अद बाबू क्या हाल है ठीक है सर नमस्ते अरे मिस्टर साहब नमस्कार नमस्कार कैसे हैं बस ठीक है सर बढ़िया आप कैसे हैं ठीक है ठीक है सर बढ़िया चल रहा है अच्छा चल रहा है हाय विजयलक्ष्मी हाय यू जॉइन वेरी हैप्पी थैंक यू एल्सा हेलो बेग बाबू सुबू जी हाँ सर सुबू जी सुबू फाइन फाइन सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर गुड आफ्टरनून सर या सर पाठक सर सर पाठक सर या सर सारा जॉइंट यस यस ओके लेट अस स्टार्ट सुधा प्लीज यस सर a very good afternoon to one and all a warm welcome to uh, to you for the plenary session of Association of Rice Research Workers Diamond Jubilee National Symposium on Gen Next Technologies for Enhancing Productivity, Profitability and Resilience of Rice Farming. The session was scheduled to be held yesterday but due to the Prime Minister's address to the farmers and ICR scientists on natural farming the session was rescheduled for today. The inconvenience caused is regretted. The plenary session 
will be chaired by Dr. S.R. Das, Honorary Professor, Department of Plant Trading and Genetics, Odisha University of Agriculture and Technology, Bhuvaneshwar, and convened by Dr. Himanshu Pathak, Director, ICR National Institute for Biotic, Abiotic Stress Management, Baramati. The guest speaker for our today's plenary session is Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, Secretary, Dear, and Director General, ICAR. The session was now. I would request Dr. Pathak to convene the session. Sir, please. Thank you, Sutapa. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Secretary Dear and DG ICR, Professor Eshar Das, uh, Chairman of the session, Director NRI Katak, uh, Director IIRR, all the other directors of ICR Institutes, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellors, my scientist colleagues, students, uh, research staff, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure to have our Secretary Dear and DG ICR for this very important talk on a very special occasion. And the occasion is, as you know, that Association of Rice Research Workers, this association is celebrating Diamond Jubilee, and we thought that let us organize one national symposium on a topic which is very, very pertinent today. And the whole topic is generation next gen next technologies for enhancing productivity, profitability, and resilience of rice farming. Uh, Honorable uh, Secretary Dare and uh, DG Aishar, as Sutapap mentioned, that uh, yesterday, because of a very important engagement, uh, we shifted the presentation today. But, sir, before, uh, before I request you to make the presentation, uh, I would like to brief you about what we have been doing since yesterday in this particular national symposium. So we had our inauguration, which was, uh, we, uh, the chief guest was uh, Dr. Sapan Datta, our DDG, former DDG, and the guest of honor was Dr. A.K. Parida, who is director of Institute of Life Sciences, Bhubaneswar. So then we had a panel discussion, which was chaired by Dr. T.R. Sarmaji, DDG Crops, and in that, there were five panelists, Dr. A.K. Singh, Director IARI, Dr. Ranjita Pushkar from ERI India, Dr. Prashun Mukherjee from Bhava Atomic Research Center, Mumbai, Dr. Vishak Burman, who is CEO in General Aeronautics, Private Limited, Bangalore, and also I was one of the panelists. So then we had four technical sessions, each one on crop improvement, crop production, pest management, and social sciences. And in every session, there were very distinguished speakers. In our Generation Next Technologies for Rice Breeding, the speakers included Professor Kevin Z from uh, Agriculture University of China, Dr. Ajay Kohli from IRI, Professor K. Wang, who is professor in China National Rice Research Institute, and Professor Sergey Sabala, who is head in the University of Tasmania in Australia. So in our precision rice production uh, session, the speakers included uh, Dr. Pramod Agrawal from SICAPS or Bisha, Dr. S.D. Gorantiwar, Professor of MPKV Rahuri, Dr. Sudhansu Singh from Iri South Asia Regional Center, Varanasi, and Dr. Dharmendra Saraswat, who is Associate Professor in Purdue University in USA. And then, sir, yesterday evening, we had two very important lectures delivered by Professor Holger Pukta from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany, and then Dr. Rajiv Kumar Varsne from ICRISAT. And so today morning, we had sessions on Gen Next Technologies in Pest Management, where the speakers included Dr. C.D. Mai, our former chairman, ASRB, Dr. Sanon Alson, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Bengaluru, Dr. Subhash Chandra, who is director of NCIPM, New Delhi, and Dr. Vijay Kumar, who is Institute of Nanoscience and Technology from Punjab. And we had a very lively session on rice for livelihood security, equity, and profitability. And the speakers included Dr. Debbie Prasad Dogra from Indian Institute of Technology, Bhubaneswar, Dr. Ashen Mira from IFAD, Dr. Basant Gandhi from IIM Ahmedabad, and Dr. Modu Bharma from WRI, World Resources Institute, Mumbai, India. And of course, along with that, we had lightning talks in all these four themes where a large number of participants, particularly young researchers, delivered their presentation on that. 
And now, sir, we are having this plenary session. So let me tell you uh, any activity of ICAR, and if it is on rice, they are too connected to NRRI and ARRW. It remains incomplete. It remains incomplete without your participation. And that was the reason that I was insisting you that you should be here to deliver this plenary lecture. And I'm indeed very happy. Not only me, I think each and every one, and now the number is 245 and the number is increasing. Each one of us are very, very happy that you could find time to join us to participate in this particular event. So thank you very much. Thank you very much on behalf of each and everyone who is participating in this particular event. Sir, uh, you'll be very happy to know that the chairman of this particular session is none other than Professor Satyaranjan Das. Professor Das doesn't need any introduction, but those who might not be knowing him in details, let me tell you, he's the honorary professor in Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics, OUAT Bhubaneswar. Probably he's the one who is a dedicated and devoted rice breeder. And he's working on this particular area since 1976, 76. And in his long career as a rice breeder, he has given this country, particularly the states of Odisha, West Bengal, Chhattisgarh, Tamil Nadu, some very important rice varieties, which included Khandagiri, Udaigiri, Mandakini, Kunark, Surendra, Pratiksha very important one, Mrinalini, Upahar. And some of his varieties are also found suitable in abroad, particularly in countries like Cambodia, countries like Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, Bangladesh, and also even China. So that is his contributions in the field of rice breeding. Just remind him that he got his PhD degree from IARI, and at that point of time, of course, there are many luminaries who are working at IRI and he came into contact with all of those. He also had stint of working at IRI, International Rice Research Institute, Philippines, and a few other, other international organizations. One of his major contributions, besides developing and releasing some of these very important varieties, are also to collect, evaluate, and maintain nearly 100 indigenous aromatic rice of Odisha. And he also released two salt grain aromatic rice varieties, Nua Kalajira and Nua Acharmati. Dr. Das is recipient of several awards. I'm not going to read all of those, but the important ones are Rai Bahadur, Dr. Ramdhan Singh Memorial Trust Award, and Dr. Senathira Rice Research Award, very prestigious one from Iri, Philippines. He's known to all of us as for his simplicity, dedication, hard work and whenever, whenever I have met him and I had good opportunity to meet him, discuss with him quite a number of times in NRI Kachak, spontaneously you will find a guru in him. Spontaneously you will find a guru in him. So simple, so knowledgeable, so down to earth. Professor Das, it is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to invite you and to introduce you you to this Larnet audience. And as we are discussing, the presentation is going to be not by none other than one of your students, Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, who is now the head of ICR family. With this, I request Dr. Esar Das to make a few initial comments and then request the speaker of the day, Dr. Mahapatra, to present the plenary lecture. Dr. Das, over to you, please. Dr. Das, you, have, you have to unmute yourself, please. Das, sir, unmute currently. Uh, hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it is fine. Please. Yeah. So this is very unique uh, opportunity that in one platform, I will be with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tirlochan Mahapatra. And it's a customary to introduce him, but uh, everybody in the field of agriculture 
and they know he doesn't know doesn't require any introduction but uh, i will tell that in one platform a teacher and a student they are interacting with each other in this world and uh, the guru and shishya they fear each other because they sometimes think that shishya knows better than uh, the guru and uh, 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 shishya also thinks that guru is uh, uh, have more wisdom than uh, me but uh, sometimes the guru will be the uh, uh, most uh, excited man he doesn't tell the shishya everything but he shows him the path and i can tell here uh, professor tillochan mahapatra that he has got really the guru krupa and as a result of which from a born from a uh, village in katak district and went as a, became the secretary of department of agriculture research and education and director general indian council of um, agricultural research dr tillochan mahapatra was uh, born on 28 april 62 he got his graduations from our institute to uat and his uh, post graduation as well as a phd from indian agricultural research institute uh, in 1987 and 92 respectively he worked uh, also director of the indian agricultural research institute a premier institute for teaching and research and as well as the director of uh, nrri katak his area of specialization was molecular genetics and genomic dr mahapatra has over 160 research papers in different national and international journals and his accomplishments include development of the first high yielding basmati variety resistant to bacterial leaf blight through molecular marker assisted selection then physical mapping genome sequencing of rice and tomato and he initiated mega projects in frontier areas including genomics phenomics bioprospecting of genes allele mining induced mutagenesis for functional genomics he created a large pool of trained human resource in the area of molecular breeding and over the 27 years he worked as a researcher and a teacher in the national institute of uh, biotechnology and students are uh, were his life and they have, they were very uh, the students with uh, uh, they are in different uh, positions in the, in the country and uh, he they are uh, proud always proud that they have got a great guru he has a distinctions of receiving several honors and awards one is insa young scientist award professor lss kumar memorial award nas tata award irib pipal award dbt bioscience award nasi reliance industries platinum jubilee award and so on so forth and many many awards he also received recognition award from the national academy of agricultural sciences and the lifetime achievement award of the indian genetic congress dr mahapatra is, is, is essentially the esteemed fellow of the indian science academy new delhi national academy of sciences india and national academy of agricultural sciences new delhi he has been Uh, conferred uh, the honorary degrees from amity university noida from his alma mater that is uat from ys parmar university of horticulture and forestry sikha uh, and uh, anusandhan university bhubaneswar and mahatma gandhi chitrakoot gramodya viswavidyalaya chitrakoot satna and a man of wisdom and i i i can i i can tell here i did do not should not take more time of introducing him but i remembered one thing in several occasions when i talked with him he he used to tell 
that we have come to this world by the whatever happening that is due to God's, uh, God's grace. And uh, therefore, and he once told me that God has sent us to this world with a purpose. And therefore, there is no frustration in life. And that is reflected in his life. There is no ego, a simple man, a charming face, and uh, uh, very nice personality. And I think uh, the knowledge, the wisdom he has, and uh, today's uh, plenary lectures will be very, very interesting. And after the, um, uh, this lecture is over, I would like to tell some few points, but we must pass to hear to him, uh, listen to him, and uh, uh, learn so many things from uh, um, several uh, years of his wisdom. Thank you very much. So now I request uh, Dr. Mahapatra to kindly deliver his speech, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Patak. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure always uh, to be among the, the group of uh, most learned uh, scientists. And today we have uh, uh, the rice scientists, uh, more than 300 uh, linked to this uh, program. Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to be part of this program, and I feel privileged uh, to deliver this uh, address. Uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, as per schedule, it could not uh, be done. But again, uh, uh, it was with a purpose that we heard uh, Honorable Prime Minister yesterday. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, with uh, directives that what we should be doing. Uh, um, so, so we are here today uh, for that purpose, uh, you know, we could not have yesterday. Uh, more importantly, we have, uh, you know, uh, the chair, uh, Professor Esar Das. Uh, Professor Esar Das, uh, again, another uh, uh, humble mortal, a humble human being with a tremendous contributions uh, in uh, rice science uh, and also uh, uh, breeding, that is specifically uh, a person uh, with uh, many ideas, very systematic thinking, and uh, very uh, involved engagement in rice uh, uh, development. So particularly rice breeding, uh, you know, uh, to uh, bring in uh, all uh, that which is required uh, to have rice crops that, uh, you know, in fact, uh, speak for themselves rice varieties which speak from for themselves and that's what that's how his own varieties uh, you know uh, like Pratiksha and uh, others uh, which are doing tremendously well uh, in uh, Orissa as well as in other states. And more importantly as a, a you know human being he has been so compassionate so considerate and uh, so humble so that you naturally bow down before him uh, to pay your respect, and that is what uh, 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 been uh, that is what has been with me, and uh, you know not only that he is a teacher, he is a great friend, and uh, always so friendly. You would not have that distance between a teacher and student, and always uh, you would learn from a personal uh, you know compassionate attitudes and uh, behavior. Uh, and over the uh, you know behavior of a, a, a strict uh, teacher, uh, classroom teacher. So uh, and I have visited his small room uh, in the field uh, where he used to sit there, and then only talks and things about uh, rice and rice alone, uh, day in and day out. And uh, in fact, at night also he sleeps sometimes in that small room, and a room uh, that uh, surrounded by only rice crop. Uh, and uh, uh, there uh, you can take uh, two crops and sometimes three crops of rice. So throughout, rice, throughout the year, it's only rice and rice and rice. And uh, he used to work there, sleep there, and then 
talk about rights there. So, so that is the kind of person, uh, you know, if we talk of rice breeding, uh, you know, or leave aside the names of Professor Swaminathan and Dr. Siddiq and so on and so forth, uh, you, know, or, you know, Dr. Das, SR Das' name is uh, among those top leaders uh, in the rice breeding. And today, I am fortunate, sir, so you are uh, chairing this session. And, uh, uh, but unfortunately, I don't have uh, much time to actually delve deeper into the whole, uh, a lot of uh, aspects of uh, rice uh, breeding or genetics, uh, or even other aspects. Uh, this particular uh, symposium, uh, which is uh, uh, designed uh, to, uh, as a part of uh, ARRW Jubilee uh, activities. Uh, so uh, that is something which is praiseworthy. And I congratulate uh, Dr. Pathak, uh, the president of uh, the uh, society, the association, uh, to have uh, thought about it uh, in the Diamond Jubilee uh, uh, year and uh, part of that activity. Uh, the Diamond Jubilee uh, year 2021 is going to be over. And before that gets over, so now we have this uh, symposium. Uh, and uh, choosing the topic, uh, the Gen Next Technologies for Enhancing Productivity, Profitability, and Resilience of Rice Farming is quite uh, apt. And, uh, 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 and that is uh, uh, something which uh, uh, is praiseworthy, and I appreciate this uh, the thought uh, of having this particular topic. Uh, so uh, uh, I believe that will be that would have been, as as Dr. Pathak said, quite uh, productive uh, sessions, uh, quite uh, a number of uh, eminent speakers and panelists have been engaged already to deliver on various aspects of it. It's going to be one o'clock. I have another. Can't really go on doing all this, uh, you know. Uh, the the background, uh, and I will be uh, very brief, of course, in my deliberation. Uh, so, so what I was telling is that it's quite apt a topic, and that has been chosen. And uh, a number of aspects related to this have been already discussed. So, uh, but then uh, I know for all of you who are working in rice. Uh, are uh, you know uh, you are familiar with rice crop rice in this country uh, is uh, uh, you know important as a staple food the most important as a staple food and uh, uh, the production has increased going beyond 320 million tons that is uh, remarkable and uh, uh, praiseworthy effort by everybody uh, all concerned uh, and we take pride in this uh, achievement of ours that we have been able to produce so, so much, uh, 40 to 44 million hectares. It uh, just oscillates uh, between that uh, to two numbers. The area uh, remains uh, uh, around that. So 42, 43 million hectares has been the kind of area, uh, you know, uh, over the years uh, around that. So given that area and given that uh, we have been able to achieve more than 120 million uh, tons, 120 million tons of uh, production. Uh, that says that we are really doing uh, good and improving over years. Uh, five, six years ago, uh, we were uh, struggling, and particularly Eastern India, bringing Green Revolution to Eastern India program, which was actually monitored by Central Rice Research Institute, the then in the Central Rice Research Institute. Uh, 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 that particular program, which was thanks to uh, our past uh, president of India, Honorable uh, Pranam Mukherjee, the late uh, Sri Pranam Mukherjee ji, uh, who thought about this uh, BGREI program. And then in fact, uh, as a finance minister, he uh, insisted and then brought about this program and which was implemented and brought very, very significant changes uh, in our uh, uh, rice cultivation uh, across states in the Eastern Indian states. And uh, uh, the assessment said that uh, uh, in three, four years time, the Eastern Indian rice production increased and added, uh, you know, six to eight million tons of additional rice, uh, you know, coming from these, uh, you know, states and uh, uh, after implementation of this program. 
uh, in 2014 or so. So, uh, so that is the kind of uh, you know focused attention if given uh, to any uh, uh, you know a commodity or crop. Uh, certainly, that brings in very significant changes. Uh, these uh, can be further analyzed and where we are today. And I believe, uh, Dr. Uh, Madam Padmini, uh, uh, you know, if we can employ our own people and study this, uh, where we are today, how much is being contributed by Eastern India, and what could be the pathway uh, for tomorrow uh, if only rice cultivation takes place in southern and eastern India, where water is plenty, uh, can it sustain? Uh, you know, the needs, uh, you know, adequately meet the needs and sustain us, uh, and what extent for how many years, and or, uh, you know, we stop everywhere else, the rice cultivation, the non-basmati rice cultivation, and then sustain it. Can we have a futuristic study uh, from NRRI and then place that appropriately uh, before the policymakers to take note of? So, uh, so uh, based on the lessons learned from BGREI program. So uh, before I move on to proper topic, I thought probably this would be quite useful uh, to uh, really uh, highlight that uh, we have come a long way and I'm sure there is plenty of opportunity for us to uh, in the process. Uh, Rice, uh, as I said, it's not just uh, production, but the production has to happen, uh, you know, sustainably. So sustainable intensification of rice, leaving very little environmental footprint. And, uh, of my, you know, that would be my emphasis today, uh, you know, uh, when I, uh, I intend to talk to you on this. I believe uh, that would have been discussed on this. Uh, you know, uh, in different, uh, you know, sessions by experts and panelists. And uh, how do we actually uh, go on enhancing rice production productivity and uh, 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 without uh, sacrificing the environment and reducing rather the environmental footprints. Uh, uh, and this is uh, a big challenge. Uh, how do we reduce the environmental footprint? Uh, we know that uh, out of these, uh, you know, in, uh, 44 million hectares, uh, you know, in this country, uh, we have uh, about 8 million hectares of uh, rice soil, uh, which are deficient uh, in uh, nutrients like zinc, uh, I told. So if that is the correct assessment, that zinc deficiency is uh, so widespread and 8 million hectares uh, having uh, zinc deficiency. Uh, and uh, uh, similarly, uh, you know, salt affected soils, uh, maybe uh, six, uh, more than six million hectares or so. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, acid soils, uh, uh, I'm told about uh, uh, 15 million hectares, uh, you know, uh, either iron and uh, aluminum toxicity uh, and uh, uh, depletion of uh, other nutrients, uh, major ones like uh, phosphorus. Uh, so, so, uh, so that is the kind of or phosphorus fixation more taking place in that kind of soils and making it unavailable. So, so have uh, acid soil, uh, uh, saline soils. We have uh, uh, you know uh, even uh, zinc deficient soils uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, uh, and the kind of water which is being used, we all know that uh, how uh, water is being utilized uh, you know, uh, by rice. Uh, though we take pride in producing so uh, uh, much amount and exporting and earning more than 60,000 crore rupees, uh, you know, some question that how much of water we are exporting in the process by way of exporting these uh, 16, 17 million tons of rice. So, so, so this is a big question. And certainly the requirement of rice, uh, you know, in years to come, when we become the number one uh, uh, populous uh, country, the most populous country in the world by 2050, 1.65 million uh, people, uh, billion people on earth. Uh, you know, uh, in, uh, India, in India, that is the kind of uh, population that more than 9 billion in the world and 1.65 billion in, in uh, India and uh, surpassing much going much beyond rather China. 
And uh, uh, and what is that? We say that we need to really increase uh, expression. And uh, uh, more than 60%, uh, you know, increase and uh, so on and so forth. Quite a bit of other estimates are there, 70%, 60%, uh, you know, all that increase uh, in rice production uh, going beyond what we have. So when we say that there is uh, so much of a need uh, of uh, uh, rice uh, in the future, uh, and uh, uh, also at the same time, the environmental concerns, as I said, a few points I highlighted, it's already there. And uh, in addition to meeting our needs, uh, where uh, we should be moving from here and what we should be really doing. Uh, I believe that you would have discussed many of those points which I am trying to say. So that's the reason why I will focus only on few points uh, and then uh, see, uh, you know, even if you have deliberated, uh, you should be able to derive uh, action points based on those deliberations and so that we work further. I have on various occasions highlighted various issues and uh, uh, I do not know how many of those are actually deliberated further and then action points are actually prepared. So that is the unfortunate part, not many action points actually really seriously uh, taken into account uh, and then implemented. Uh, that's the reason why you know our uh, progress is uh, so slow, uh, and uh, you know uh, uh, we don't really innovate uh, much. So uh, become a kind of uh, 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 also doing a kind of uh, uh, you know um, situation we end up. So uh, so uh, let me start with uh, you know uh, some aspects relevant uh, from today's uh, context. Okay, so uh, if we talk of uh, nitrogen use, I say uh, the footprints uh, to be reduced uh, while uh, enhancing our productivity. So uh, if we talk of uh, uh, you know uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and their use efficiencies, and as they are, uh, you know how they are and where we are actually. I will not go into the specific data and uh, uh, you know where we are actually today. Uh, but uh, you know you can uh, you know better that uh, uh, you know how the response to fertilizer has gone down and uh, how static it is and if you see that uh, fertilizer response which was 100 kg uh, per uh, 100 kg uh, uh, you know which was in 1972 uh, uh, and now it has uh, come down to uh, maybe around 25, 30 kg or so. Uh, so uh, what is that response per kg of uh, yield, of course, uh, as we described? Uh, so how do we actually you know, uh, 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 take into account this decline in fertilizer response? Uh, so, uh, um, uh, and as compared to that, where China or US stands. So you have done this analysis and I'm sure you know about it, that uh, how USA has maintained this for decades, uh, you know, at least for two decades it has maintained, more than two decades it has maintained, that response at a particular level, maybe around uh, 60 kg or so, and uh, uh, fertilizer response. So if that is so, 60 kg per kg, so that level it is maintaining. Uh, but the China has gone down below India. What is the lesson to learn from there? And uh, how much of fertilizer we use vis-a-vis -vis that of uh, uh, use in China? And why it is, uh, it has gone down for the time and why we are at the uh, intermediate level uh, about say at, uh, about 30 to five uh, kg per kg and why China has gone down further uh, below. Uh, and why USA uh, still maintains uh, at a higher level. So a lesson has to be learned from this. Uh, so there are a few lessons that I would, uh, you know, action points I would suggest from here. In addition to studying why we are so, you keep adding more and more fertilizer and also evolving newer and newer varieties and then which would uh, keep responding to this. But that response is not as we were seeing uh, in Green Revolution era. Uh, you know, uh, so obviously that kind of mechanism, genetic mechanism is not there uh, to really do the uh, you know, magic uh, for us. So having accepted this, 
So there are two ways that we innovate in the technology front, understanding the gene expression pathways and understanding not only genetic, but epigenetic issues there. And uh, we have a little understanding of epigenetic issues there. So I would say that we let us understand the epigenetic component of uh, that response and how uh, uh, genetics and epigenetics go hand in hand in our all uh, you know, management uh, that we do and including fertilizer, water and so on and so forth. And then understand you know, uh, those components very precisely. Unless we do focus research, we will not be able to really understand this. So while we are studying the responses we need to in our genotypes and breeding and evolving those, uh, you know, we have some experiment, field experiment at NRRI and, uh, you know, maybe DRR, I haven't seen those. So, <clears throat> and global level. So uh, how we are conducting our experiment and uh, what is the response today and what are the genetics and epigenetics of those and how do we actually manipulate those further and then go deeper and then have more, uh, you know, response uh, there. But the management issues are more significant and, uh, you know, addressing those uh, issues are, are serious. And, uh, you know, the way we apply water, the way we are applying this. And in the context of nano urea and uh, the kind of experiments we have done in rice, and uh, I am told that two seasons, two Karib seasons we have studied, and, in the, uh, and uh, uh, basal dose 50% goes there, out of rest 50% which are applied in the subsequent stages at the uh, growth stages. So 25% uh, we can uh, save uh, out of the total which is applied if we go for nano. So or nano spray, uh, urea spray. So if we are actually doing that, what is the innovation uh, that we can bring in further uh, so that uh, you know, the efficiency goes up uh, in uh, say basal, uh, basal dose or you don't require any basal applications at all. And can we really do our way with that? Uh, so, so we need to really innovate there so that we reduce further uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, critical fertilizer footprint uh, very, very significantly. Uh, and that is where uh, the concern lies. And Honorable Prime Minister, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in his Independence Day address, did talk about this, reducing fertilizer consumption, your chemical use, by 15, 20%, and can we do this in rice? We talk of biofertilizers, we talk of uh, various other uh, things uh, in case of our crops. And we have many uh, uh, actually uh, microbial consortia. We have produ produced a document on uh, those uh, biofertilizers. Uh, uh, what extent we have tested those in rice? What extent we are confident to recommend this? And what extent they can be uh, promoted and uh, you know, commercialized to cover large areas. And what is our efforts in that direction? In fact, a recent study uh, you know, on uh, root microbial communities uh, in natural farming environment uh, has uh, demonstrated uh, that uh, that paper is uh, with me, which is published in Frontiers in Sustainable Food Systems uh, you know, in 2021. And that clearly suggests that there are uh, growth promoting bacteria which are promoted in situations where chemical fertilizers are not used. And in fact, uh, natural farming uh, situation uh, promoting, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, those uh, you know, growth promoting bacterial populations and the, uh, the rhizosphere of rice harboring uh, those uh, plant, plant growth promoting uh, bacteria uh, more. And also not only nitrogen, even uh, uh, phosphorus and potash, uh, and uh, uh, the insoluble forms. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, in, the, in those situations also, uh, the growth uh, being promoted. Uh, so, so those studies, the recent ones, so they suggest that there's more to really understand, do more science, and then identify those uh, consortia and where the soil resources, which are already there, uh, you know, uh, in reserve, we have a lot of uh, nutrients, and you know that uh, how we use our phosphorus, phosphorus and potassium fertilizers, how much we import, and uh, how natural farming, uh, if it is uh, profitable, uh, can be actually mainstream. But then we don't have uh, you know, sufficient research, and we have not been able to really do that research adequately. 
So, so I would suggest that uh, you know when we talk of fertilizer use efficiency and enhancing fertilizer use efficiency, uh, and uh, you know a lot more to be really done. Uh, uh, we have to delve deeper, do more science. Uh, you know, we talk of uh, endophytes. When I was there, uh, Madam uh, Dr. Dua was uh, you know uh, studying those the seed endophytes, particularly the biotic stress tolerance, the biotic stress tolerance. Uh, coming from there, you know, by way of uh, the uh, seed inoculation or even seed uh, carrying those microbial communities and promoting that kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the populations by way of inoculation. So whole lot of uh, areas are there. I believe that they are not really exploited to the extent they should have been. And I'm sure when we talk of uh, sustainable intensification uh, uh, with regard to rice, uh, to enhance productivity further, uh, you know, and by also simultaneously reducing the environmental footprint, uh, you know, uh, I'm talking of uh, uh, nutrient, chemical nutrients that we are using at this point in time. So I believe there is plenty of scope for us to innovate. And uh, innovation would be key uh, to succeed. Uh, I'm sure uh, you would be actually focusing on the whole community of scientists who are associated today. They would take note of this and then see. By telling that this doesn't, doesn't mean that there is no scope there. It's only our thinking process which is actually limiting uh, the progress. Uh, and if we actually delve deeper and think deeper, we should be able to actually find out something new and which would actually go beyond breaking the ceiling. Uh, which is actually limiting uh, our progress. So similarly, the uh, waterfront and uh, what is that we are actually doing in waterfront? Uh, you know, a whole lot of things are there with regard to nutrient use efficiency, but I have I have highlighted uh, a number of points. I will be taking note of that. And, uh, you know, one one sentences which I have used and you should be able to really do that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I say with regard to waterfront and, uh, you know, uh, the kind of water use which is happening uh, in case of rice. Uh, we talk about water use efficiency. We talk about, uh, you know, um, uh, rice, uh, which is grown under aerobic conditions, uh, alternate weighting, drying, and then so on and so forth. Uh, and we have been talking about the system of rice intensification and using less of water and uh, uh, so on and so forth. I'll not really go into those details. Uh, where is the next step in this regard? Uh, you know, what is that we are doing? We didn't move uh, very significantly forward with regard to SRI or uh, uh, alternate uh, weighting and drying, or for that matter, uh, you know, uh, other uh, techniques and methods which were actually done uh, decades ago. Uh, though still we continue emphasizing on those, they have not been actually put to use to that extent. Uh, we talk about direct seeded rice and direct seeded rice, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, we are promoting uh, at this point in time. But I believe that there is a whole lot of questions uh, and signs uh, to be done uh, there uh, to adequately address uh, this particular area that how do we actually reduce a water footprint with regard to rice? Uh, uh, and, uh, um, and that's a challenge. Uh, water use efficiency, we have been talking about it. We have uh, several uh, QTLs identified uh, and uh, some of them related to uh, drought tolerance traits, uh, you know, or whether it is deep root system, root mass, and then uh, you know, uh, uh, and other uh, aspects of drought tolerance, they are integrated with other genes, submergence tolerance, so on and so forth, and CRDAN 801, 802, and they have been developed, uh, you know, through uh, employing marker-assisted breeding. So you have also a uh, drought tolerant variety from DRR, uh, some of those coming from IRI also, they have been uh, developed and released. So, uh, so that is there, that is there, that is where we are today. Uh, how do we innovate uh, further and then go beyond this? And the rice is grown, uh, you know, using the same number of irrigations as we do in case of wheat. Uh, can we really do that? And rice in two cents grown as wheat and then without compromising uh, the yield. 
And there again, what would be the role of microbial mass and what would be the role of uh, the epigenome uh, would be also quite relevant. We have not really studied that component. Uh, and, uh, uh, and all management tools, and we talk of precision agriculture in case of rice, whether it is direct seeded rice or irrigated rice, uh, you know, uh, of course, direct seeded rice is irrigated rice, irrigated rice, which is uh, conventionally grown, and uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, rice, which is grown in Eastern India, which is uh, shallow lowland rice, where anyway, water stagnates because in, in Karib season, particularly because of heavy downpour. So, so in all scenarios, how do we really study these, uh, you know, micro as an important component and an epigenome as an important component to do science, deeper science to understand what is really happening. The direct cedar rice system, as uh, we, uh, we, we have been emphasizing, we need to understand a whole lot of uh, you know, issues there. And I'm sure global as it is, uh, you know, uh, progressing and uh, the way we are uh, doing science, uh, we need to really uh, you know, delve deeper. Uh, um, uh, I will cite one example that how we can actually bring a change uh, there uh, in that system. Uh, uh, if we say that our uh, uh, you know, uh, genes or QTLs, which are together, uh, bringing changes, then can we, can we bring those 10 genes and identify the alleles which are there in the germplasm very much scattered and then do allele uh, you know, uh, pyramiding, uh, pyramiding of useful alleles uh, in uh, one place uh, to build a super rise for direct seeded situation. Our breeding for direct seeded situation uh, must be accelerated, further strengthened, and where the pyramiding of all the alleles, uh, you know, of the contributing alleles from various loci, maybe 10, maybe five, maybe 20. First of all, we need to really identify those and then uh, them together. Uh, you know, uh, Iri started doing something with regard to uh, you know, those haplotypes, which I call them alleles, the haplotype-based breeding and haplotype-based breeding. We have not really used our germplasm till today. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to really build this. So water and uh, fertilizer, if we can address these two, that will be a big thing. And uh, so also uh, our, uh, you know, um, uh, um, greenhouse gas emission redu reduction from rice, and that's another area. If I can, I can go on doing this. But then two, three points more I would mention before I sign off. Uh, one is that uh, per se, uh, breaking the yield ceiling and then going beyond what is uh, there. Under uh, these conditions of limited water and also um, reduced uh, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium uh, use. How do we actually break yield ceiling? Uh, how do we actually enhance the photosynthetic, photosynthesis? Uh, carbon dioxide concentration is increasing. And how do we really manipulate the visco? There are recent studies, and you might have discussed this point already. And how do we really manage the visco uh, and uh, you know, then make it far more efficient? Uh, we don't have a limitation of carbon dioxide, but then we need to really uh, have tolerance of heat. So big temperature rise compensates for all that uh, you know, uh, efficiency in terms of carbon dioxide harvesting uh, because of higher concentration of carbon dioxide. But at the same time, we have to reduce the uh, negative impact of temperature that is rising. So this is a critical aspect of our future rice manipulation and breeding. So enhancing photosynthetic efficiency by way of managing Rubisco and then at the same time, uh, you know, uh, reducing the impact of heat. So heat tolerance built in, uh, you know, uh, and then efficiency of Rubisco in enhanced and the photorespiration getting reduced. So Dr. Beg and all your physiology co colleagues and those who are associated today here or global level, this is where we need to really focus. And this is not easy. We have to innovate there. And, uh, and there are some studies now that how Rubisco is getting manipulated to give us a higher photosynthesis. These, uh, the the uh, chlorophyll uh, you know, content and the kind of uh, structure 
that we are dealing with, the capacity of that getting increased to have more of photosynthate, more of uh, protein, particularly Rubisco being synthesized, and uh, the limit of photosynthesis enhanced and the partitioning at the same time taking place, so enhancing our yield. And uh, how do we actually bring in new technology like gene editing? And gene editing, and uh, you know, uh, must not be dealt at just one gene, two gene here and there. I believe very strongly, uh, you know, if we have to really, you know, to want to create newer alleles, uh, high, uh, you know, uh, efficient uh, alleles, and the process uh, pyramid, four or five of them uh, in from different genes and create super rice, tomorrow's rice. This is the time uh, to discuss, deliberate, and think about it. What are those four genes? If we put together, it will be super rice. The TB1, Tiocite branched gene, which is manipulated uh, through gene edit, genome editing or gene editing. And by way of, um, uh, you know, of removing few uh, sequences, nucleotides here, and that has brought in a big change in terms of the uh, panicle number and the panicle number increasing very significantly three times. But then in those panicles, there is uh, there are uh, you know sterile uh, panicles, uh, the spikelets, the sterile panicles, uh, pa uh, spikelets. How do we really address them? Is it that the partitioning is not happening? Is it that the photosynthesis is not enough to really support those uh, spikelets, which are three times more than what is there in normal rice? So Tiosinte branch has done its job by way of increasing the panicle number, by increasing the number of grains uh, three times, or uh, panicle number three times, and grain yield uh, may be increased by 50, 60%. But because of those sterile panicles, uh, you know, or the yield uh, you know, is a little low, uh, but more than the uh, control. So how do we really address that? What is impacting there? What other gene can be added to make a big change. And similarly, the uh, 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 plant architecture gene that uh, your uh, institute is working on at Katak, and then how plant architecture gene can influence, uh, you know, to a great extent, the panicle structure. It has not really uh, done, uh, shown that kind of very significant impact when it is working, uh, you are working with the Swarna. So, uh, so or M2-1010. So I believe that this requires elaborate analysis, targeting of number of genes uh, concerning plant architecture, concerning nutrient uh, you know, use, concerning uh, the water use, uh, and uh, all that. And if you put all the things together, I believe that tomorrow's super rise uh, would be there within our reach. And I'm sure, you know, uh, sky is the limit. Only limit is our thinking process. We have not really put that kind of thinking into it manipulating one gene, two genes at a time, and in an isolated manner, we are looking at it, and if we can put two, three genes together. And I have seen at IRI, if you manipulate DST gene, DST gene, and uh, that gives the drought and salt tolerance to a certain extent. But you also see how cytokinin oxidase, uh, you know, gene, uh, you know, uh, GW2 gene getting modified by way of its expression and how the leap width increases and uh, the flag leaf width increasing in the process and answering uh, to other plant architecture uh, in the process. So one gene getting modified, having ramifications to the plant growth and architecture and enhancing uh, the plant productivity in the process along with the drought tolerance. Single gene, which is a master regulator. And if we can really target some of these master regulators in the process, we can have all traits together and some of them might also influence our nutrient uptake. And I believe that we haven't really uh, you know, studied that. So, uh, so if we can actually do that, that would be a great service in years to come. And uh, similarly, you know, uh, I was talking about the uh, microbial flora and uh, microbial flora and manipulations of those uh, certainly requires uh, you know, certain efforts. You know, when we started, understanding rice rice system and the carbon you know positive situation there you know we thought what are these microbial uh, you know system doing the metagenomic analysis work that we started 
And uh, then subsequent to that, which we discover is there is a quite a bit of positivity with regard to the micro uh, populations which are building up uh, there and contributing to these uh, net carbon gains and so on and so forth. But there's much more to that and uh, much more which need to be really done there and build a technology. It's not just science, build technology so that the farmer friendly technologies are provided uh, for rice rice situation for summer's rice situation, an aerobic rice situation, uh, you know, where the productivity can be increased, the nutrient use efficiency is increased uh, many folds. And, uh, you know, uh, but then when I talk about all these, the precision agriculture systems, I tossed up and, but we have not really done much there. Uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we say that we have phenomics facility at IRI and we have created that. But what is important is the field phenomics and uh, the drone-based phenomics and, uh, you know, uh, uh, scope, uh, 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 taking that to the field level, to the farmer's field level and uh, the NRRI and our, some of the universities and uh, in the coming years, uh, you know, making it practical, uh, you know, uh, in the farmer's field level and, uh, you know, uh, contributing to uh, the uh, 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 fertilizer application uh, at appropriate level, timely. Can we give site-specific nutrient management situation recommendations happening uh, through uh, our uh, drone-based uh, monitoring? Uh, not going uh, not to analyze plant by plant, but one village or 1,000 hectare in one day, or at least uh, 100 hectare or acre one day, and uh, analyzed, and then uh, you know one particular area, a, a particular patch and uh, nitrogen or uh, nit uh, nutrient use uh, analyzed and fertilizer recommended and applied. And, uh, you know, every week once uh, the drones are flown and then, you know, that is happening. Can we not really go for that kind of precision system of irrigation management and the nutrient management, fertilizer management in rice? The way rice consumes water and fertilizer or the pests and uh, you know diseases which are building up and which are contributing to uh, you know a pesticide uh, uh, application uh, you know uh, in, in crops and how you can compare yourself how much of pesticide application is taking place in case of rice as compared to cotton now so 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 this precision agriculture building up in agri in in rice system uh, is very very important uh, you know, in today's context. And I believe, uh, you know, colleagues who are actually looking at it, uh, uh, working on this would go full swing and then contribute very significantly in a lesser time uh, than uh, what we do. Earlier, I emphasized on rice evolution and uh, rice evolution is happening on the ground. And uh, there cannot be a better place than Northeast India and Eastern India to study rice evolution. And uh, India can give new signs and actually advance the frontiers of rice science if we study rice. There's some study on the wild rice, but that's not really enough. And uh, I'm, I strongly believe that there is plenty of opportunity for us to unravel rice revolution as it is happening in natural swamp ecosystem. And the way newer uh, varieties are coming up there, the way they are thrown, those variants are coming out. I believe it would be worthwhile uh, studying those, uh, you know, uh, 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 and uh, uh, taking, uh, you know, lessons from there uh, for, uh, uh, you know, future uh, rice uh, development. Uh, uh, friends, uh, uh, the sky is the limit. I can keep talking about, uh, but uh, you know, uh, we are uh, you know uh, a nation uh, having the biggest network of rice. How do we take advantage of this big network? Uh, you know, what kind of work uh, distribution we should have uh, so that I believe Dr. Sundaram would be here, and what kind of network? Uh, you know, uh, that we should build for tomorrow and how we can build our human resource who, to, who should be, uh, you know, uh, enthused uh, to take rice uh, research to the next height. And I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, 
those who are involved in this should be working and then uh, innovating uh, to, to build the tomorrow's uh, rice uh, fraternity and human resource working in rice uh, and then see that very holistically we do this. Whether it is the area of uh, uh, natural resource management in rice and which is very, very important as I highlighted only a few points, whether it is uh, you know, uh, genetics or genomics uh, area, whether it is physiology, biochemistry area, whether it is uh, you know, climate resilience and so on and so forth, uh, you know, all this uh, would require uh, you know, quite a bit of engagement and capacity building. Uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Patak, uh, this uh, symposium would be quite uh, enriching. It has already uh, completed uh, the deliberation. I believe that uh, valedictory is over. And uh, I'm sure uh, from these, uh, the lessons learned would be uh, quite useful in building for tomorrow's uh, activity and programs based on the recommendations. And I will be extremely happy to see those very specific action points for us that do we, do we have to have speed breeding in rice? If we want to have speed breeding, how do we integrate genomic selection? Should we really have genomic selection in rice? where the genetic uh, selection, the phenotype-based selection and the precision phenotyping selection-based selection uh, can uh, actually do a, a great job. And what extent genomic selection can contribute to uh, the rapid genetic gains in rice? This must have been deliberated. I didn't really touch upon this point. And should we really integrate speed breeding and genomic selection and then have a nice program to have haplotype, uh, uh, contributing haplotypes, all uh, put together, congregated together, and built to tomorrow's super rise. Can you really do this and have a single program having all these things together? And or we need to really build a program around precision you know, uh, agriculture or precision rice development and uh, in that context, managing nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, or micronutrient applications uh, through uh, nano and other means. Uh, and then at the same time, sensor-based applications and drone-based, image-based applications and all that site-specific applications happening. And we have uh, you know, saved uh, uh, all that uh, and reduced the environmental footprints very significantly. Or we have a program on very systematic and then program on uh, the epigenome, uh, rice epigenome, and then understanding what is happening, a crop grown uh, continuously on aerobic situation, and then there is a heavy downpour, and then crop goes to a uh, you know, water logging situation, what happens and how much it impacts to, uh, the epigenome, and then the process, how it performs its performance in terms of yield and productivity. And if, if that happens for two years, what happens to epigenome? And we are doing some studies at IRI, and hopefully that would show some uh, thrive, uh, light on, throw some light on this. But a lot more needs to be really done if we have a systematic analysis and program built around this. And so also, I didn't touch upon biotic stress tolerance. And similarly, you know, the way pathogens are evolving, uh, the insects are evolving, the pathogen side stories are very, very limited. I have told several times that our pathologists and entomologists have to really tell us those kind of insights on pathogen side. The blast is evolving, how it is evolving, the fluid genome of a blast, how it is really evolving, and what is that lesson that teaches us that uh, we have to be careful or we go for non-specific -res resistance so that the evolution that happens in pathogen is irrelevant from the viewpoint of non-specific -res uh, you know, resistance that we build in case of plants. Or we go for epigenome modifications by way of spray of signal molecules that prepares our genomes uh, which are impervious, which are immune to uh, such pathogens which are invading. Uh, you know, what kind of response we build in plants by way of doing that. And that kind of super molecules needs to be discovered. So it's a whole lot of things to do. Uh, if I go on elaborating on each one of those, it will take time. But, uh, you know, certainly there is plenty of opportunity for us. You know, Pokhnia path was worked out. Where the Sith blight pathogen stays, 
and why every year it doesn't cause uh, devastation. And uh, you know, uh, similarly, the uh, rice to grow. And I have seen in one plot which was devoted to rice to grow, you find some plants showing yellowing, others not the, the most susceptible variety, and every year showing difference. How it has evolved in these years? The grasses turn to virus or uh, rice to grow virus. Where they are, and uh, you know, in the context of changing climate, how devastating role they might be playing in years to come. Is, the, is there is any possibility of that happening? You know, is there is somebody who is actually focusing on this and studying this evolution of the rice to grow virus? It's a complex virus, but are we really studying? I believe there is plenty of opportunity to, for us to delve deeper. Basic science, the strategic science, unless we do, will not be able to really succeed in the front of uh, application science. And uh, I'm sure global community will be taking note and, uh, you know, of all this which is happening in the context of COVID-19 and, uh, you know, working, uh, you know, much in this direction. Dr. Patak, I have another meeting at two o'clock, so I would prefer to stop here. So I have taken already 40 minutes and, uh, you know, uh, sky is the limit. You can keep talking and you are most learned people. And... Uh, must have deliberated. I haven't heard any deliberation, so I'm sure you, with your kind of uh, people that you spoke about, so they must have done a better job than what I am talking. As a generalist, now I talked about some of the points, so perhaps uh, uh, inside and then tell us what is to be really done, and let's build uh, on that. Once I talked about the post harvest processing value addition in case of rice. And uh, what is the action plan we have built around that? I keep talking about various things and I have talked about three, four important points today. So let's uh, build some programs on that. So thank you very much. Thanks to all of you and a profuse thanks to honorable chairman for giving me this time. So, uh, so also always a pleasure to be there with you, a person involved, a rice scientist, a dedicated rice scientist who has uh, actually sacrificed everything of his life for rice. And that is something which is remarkable. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, chairing this session. Thanks, Dr. Patak, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Wish you all the very best. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful. We did discuss some of this, but not up to this scale. Let me admit. Let me admit that it, is, it was not up to this scale. And when you started uh, talking, uh, we really, I was really thinking that what, I mean, so many things are to be done. So many things, miles to go, it was William Frost said sometimes, miles to go before we sleep, but we have promises to keep. We have promises to keep. Sir, our benedictory function is not over. After your presentation, after having lunch, we shall have that one. And certainly the points which you have mentioned, starting from water, nutrient, greenhouse gas, including crop improvement, uh, and all, all kinds of disease, pests, everything, we are going to take a stock of it. And then, as you rightly said, there are very knowledgeable persons. I can see some of our directors, including Dr. A.K. Singh, he's also here. The first day was also, he was here. So with all of their help, we are going to develop a good recommendation and action plan. And for that one, I request each and every one who have participated today, Dr. Sundaram and everybody, you please give your suggestions. You have already listened to our uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Mahapatra. You now know what are the issues. Of course, you also know otherwise. So please give your suggestions so that we will be able to develop a very good excellent plan. So thank you very much. And now I request our chairman, Professor Das, uh, to have his final words. Over to Professor Das, please. Uh, sir, you have to unmute yourself, please. Das, sir, please unmute. Unmute, sir. Sir, unmute. And when working at ED, there was uh, one observation I have that a paper was published by Soving Peng and uh, Khus that uh, they actually studied the yield potential. They took IR8, which was in the gene bank, and the IR8, which was continuously grown and the light material which has emerged from their ongoing breeding program. 
and to study the yield potential all all plant protection measure and all normal uh, conditions were provided and surprisingly they found that ir8 which was which yielded in 69 about more than 10 tons it was the lowest yielding variety under their experiment followed by then uh, ir8 which is continuously grown in their uh, demo plots then the highest yielder was the light lines which was there in their uh, breeding program so their conclusion that probably there is the interactions of the environment ir8 at the time of release their environment was different and now when it is grown after so many years the environment it cannot express its genetic yield potential and therefore they suggested the ongoing breeding program should be on and to develop varieties and another um, interesting thing that was the longevity and the stability of a variety uh, that depend the variety which was uh, homozygous at the time of its release say for example uh, one example is ir8 when ir8 was released there was a limited heterogeneity and that's why it very quickly it spread whole of asian countries south asia south east asia everywhere and uh, another example is given about the university of sydney and the northwest wheat research breeding program the cultivar gamenia which also have some limited selection pressure and it was a very popular varieties throughout the whole of australia and the same theory also hold good for the popularity of many land races compared to their pure line selections one was saruchina mali other one mojagukulu and kartikeya samma in orissa in uh, andhra pradesh and uh, tamil nadu and the farmers they preferred uh, the, these land races rather than their pure line counterparts like bcp1 t141 or asd7 and until this century is the farmers used land cultivars which were even more or less uniform for their agronomic traits often they were heterogeneous for disease and uh, uh, disease reaction alleles Kaufman isolated from a wood variety Kherson agronomically it was uniform but he could able to isolate some 14 races of uh, um, uh, uh, um, blast pathogen stem rust pathogens from this land race so from the foregoing instances it is obvious that there is some heterogeneity of a variety is maintained probably low frequency of outcrossing among the you know types of the populations confers a certain uh, um, um, sort of plasticity or sort of genetic resilience to adapt to its varied agroclimatic conditions that must be the land races the heterogeneity component should be uh, considered and another thing uh, the breeders are facing now uh, in the era of genomic and uh, genomic selections genome editing and so many things Uh, they are breeders actually they do not need markers for every trait even the uh, perfect markers are available but the full advantage of mass can be realized when markers are doing something um, uh, more uh, cannot be using conventional methods as marker assisted backcrossing so there are two things one is the knowledge gap and another one is the applications gap many breeders may not understand the topic of uh, molecular genetics and uh, simultaneously many uh, uh, geneticists also often do not understand the breeding process to identify the most strategic stage to apply markers and they also prevents their integration between breeding and molecular genetics including sharing of germ plasm such as macming populations or sharing of information or trait data and the application gap breeders are usually focused on developing new varieties where the molecular genetics are focused more on genes qtl discovery and ultimately so uh, here the human resource um, development is more important 
and uh, where there must be integrations between uh, the plant breeders, the rice breeders, and the molecular genetics in order to leverage the wealth of available genomic resources the rice for molecular breeding there must be planned and well executed qtl mapping experiments breeder friendly analytical tools cheaper genotyping systems etc and integration between breeders and plant physiologists and molecular genetics will be critical to develop new varieties using markers and finally uh, there are indeed many, many difficult challenges ahead in the 21st century. And it is important to realize that uh, some minor yield increase, about 1% of a widely grown variety, will have a tremendous impact. And even in the advent of new promising technologies such as DNA markers, the time to spread conventional breeding and selection approaches will still account for a significant improvement of increasing rice yield. A sound theoretical knowledge, coupled with considerable hard work, long hours in the field are the secrets of breeding success, and this is likely to be the case for many years to come. The success and sustenance of rice breeding tells that there is no easy way to improve rice production. It demands patience, dedication, continuity, and our total physical and uh, mental commitments to field work. So this much today. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I learned so many things from uh, uh, Dr. Mahapatra as well as uh, the, I'm grateful to Dr. Pathak. He has given me opportunity to whatever little I know that I interacted with. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Das. Uh, it was wonderful to listen the words of wisdom from you. And of course, probably out of all the attendees here, you have the longest experience of working with rice, as Dr. Mahapatra is also suggesting. Thank you very much for kindly chairing this session. Now I request uh, Madam uh, Padmanishwai, Director NRI Katak, for a formal vote of thanks. Madam, over to you, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It is my proud privilege to offer a vote of thanks. Let me first thank uh, Association of Rice Research Workers and more specifically, Dr. Himan Supata, President ARRW and presently Director ICR Niyaj Baramati, and also the convener of this plenary lecture session for organizing such a wonderful lecture delivered by our Honorable Secretary Dayar and DG ICR. I on behalf of ARRW, NRRI, and on my own behalf, profusely thank you, sir, Dr. Patak, sir, for your effort to organize and coordinate this plenary lecture. I thank Dr. Esar Das, sir, former president of ARRW, and presently honorary professor, Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics, OUAT Bhubaneswar, for very nicely introducing our honorable speaker, Dr. T. Mahapatra, sir, and chairing the session, I, on behalf of ARRW, NRRI, and on my own behalf, profusely thank you, sir, for accepting the invitation in a very short while and giving nice remark, your concluding remark. Honorable Secretary Dayar and DGIC are Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, sir. We are extremely thankful to have your excellent, educative, inspiring, and thought-provoking lecture on sustainable uh, uh, intensification of rice with respect to environmental footprints. Sir, this, is, uh, this has given many challenges to our rice scientists to work. And uh, we are really fortunate, sir, uh, though it was scheduled yesterday because of Honorable Prime Minister's program, you immediately rescheduled it, the lecture for today. In spite of your busy schedule, you could make time which shows your concern for rice research as well as rice research workers. I wholeheartedly, on behalf of the Association of Rice Research Workers, National Rice Research Institute, and on my own behalf, thank you very much, sir, for accepting the invitation and delivering such a inoculate, uh, eloquent lecture uh, on this ARRW Diamond Jubilee National Symposium Plenary Lecture. 
Uh, I could see many dignitaries and directors, including our previous director, Dr. D. Maiti, director IIRR, Dr. D. Dr. R. M. Sundaram, many other directors from all over uh, ICR institutes, many other dignitaries and uh, participants from other countries overseas, sir. I could see in on the board, I sincerely thank you all on behalf of ARRW, on behalf of NRRI. Last but not least, I thank all vast distinguished participants. I think it was, it was more than 300 who were connected virtually to this ARRW Diamond Jubilee National Symposium Plenary Lecture, particularly delivered by our Honorable DG, and uh, for your patience, hearing, and attending this lecture. I thank you all once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, all of you. So we conclude this particular meeting. We shall reassemble at 2.30 for the valedictory function and also our award give, giving ceremony of ARRW. Friends, uh, for all of you, let me inform that for the last two, three years, we have also initiated, instituted ARRW fellowship and also a few awards. And many of you have participated in that. Many of you have applied and also nominated your younger staff. I would seek your kind cooperation and blessing to strengthen all of our efforts. The whole objective is to strengthen the activities of rice research and also to promote the interest of rice workers. And that's what the whole association of ARRW is. Thank you very much wholeheartedly for joining this particular session. And I certainly look forward of joining you once again at 2.30 in our next event. Thank you very much. And with this, we conclude this particular meeting. So the same Thank link you. will continue. Same link same. will continue. Okay, same link will continue. That's good. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank All the best. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. So, uh, so with this, we come to the end of this plenary session, and now we will be we, we will break for the lunch, and we shall be back at two thirty p.m. when ARRW fellows will make their brief presentations, and that will be followed by the ARRW general body meeting. Namaskar. The same links. The same link. Uh, with the same link, we will join again at 2.30 p.m. Thank you.
I think, madam, we can start now. एक प्रॉब्लम है है क्योंकि ये ये जो इसमें हमारा जनरल लिंक है हम ये वैधानिक प्रॉब्लम इसमें है कि कि ये जो दो जो हर नॉट मेंबर सब मेंबर्स ऑफ़ दी सोसाइटी दे कैन नॉट अटेंड दिस मीटिंग नहीं लेकिन डॉक्टर साहब अभी आपका प्रेजेंटेशन हो रहा है ना हाँ प्रेजेंटेशन के बाद जब हम लोगों को क्योंकि हमारा प्रेजेंटेशन फाइनेंशियल स्टेटमेंट प्रेजेंटेशन होगा वो होगा जो जनरल बॉडी मीटिंग है अगर वो प्रेजेंटेशन अलाउ करते हैं तो क्योंकि वो थर्टी मेंबर होने से जाके कोरम पूरा होता है तो थर्टी मेंबर इसी में थर्टी मेंबर तो पता नहीं चलेगा तो सौ मेंबर है ऐसा करते हैं डॉक्टर साहब पहले प्रेजेंटेशन हो जाना देते हैं हाँ उसके बाद डॉक्टर साहब उनको कहते हैं कि वो उसी में सेपरेट दे नहीं तो फिर यहाँ हम लोग अपना एडिटोरियल रिपोर्ट पढ़ेंगे अपना अंदर रिपोर्ट पढ़ेंगे ये तो सब चलिए हम इसको तो तब तक एक कर लेते हैं पहले प्रेजेंटेशन तो कर, तब तक शुरू कर देते हैं क्योंकि दिस ऑफ जनरल इंपोर्टेंस नो ये कोई रुकता ही नहीं है दस पंद्रह मिनट में इनको कहा है रुका करो आज भी बैल बजाता रहा ये थे ही नहीं भाग जाते दो दो क्या यार सुनील सुनील म्यूट करना पड़ेगा बाकी सबको भाई हु इज ऑपरेटिंग सुनील और गुरु सर 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 वी म्यूट ऑलरेडी डिड इट सर वी डिड इट सर ओके ओके तो थोड़ा ध्यान रखना ठीक है यस सर यस सर यस सर ओके ऐसा करते हैं डॉक्टर नायक यस सर द जनरल मोर कॉमन थिंग्स दिस लाइक आवर दिस प्रेजेंटेशन फॉलोड बाय इफ यू वांट द वैलिडिटी आल्सो कैन बी डन विद दिस उसके बाद जो हमारा आर आर डब्ल्यू का जो ऑफिशियल मैटर है एजीएम वाला जो है नहीं नहीं सर 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 व्हाट वी डू इट दिस लिंक कर लेंगे ना दिस लिंक विल बी देयर दिस लिंक विल कंटिन्यू वी विल डू अनदर सेपरेट लिंक फॉर एजीएम ओनली सर वी विल क्रिएट ऑन सेपरेट लिंक फॉर एजीएम सर नहीं नहीं बेग साहब उसको थोड़ा ऐसा करते हैं ये प्रेजेंटेशन के बाद हम वैलिडेटरी इसी लिंक के साथ कर देते हैं बिकॉज़ पीपल आर ऑलरेडी हियर दे वैलिडेटरी करेंगे तो सर गेस्ट हमारे नहीं हम डन कर पाएंगे उनसे अगर बात कर लीजिए इफ यू कैन जॉइन क्योंकि उनको इसमें भी जॉइन करना था ना नहीं डॉक्टर साहब वो वो अब एक तो डायरेक्ट एग्रीकल्चर है डॉक्टर अग्रवाल साहब तो उनको फिर वो टाइम भी ऑलरेडी उनको भेज चुके भेज दिया जा चुका है लेकिन लेकिन सर ये अगर हम लोग प्रेजेंटेशन कर करके उसका ये लिंक को हम लोग बंद कर देते हैं फिर वो लिंक उस टाइम पांच बजे आप इसी लिंक में हम लोग ज्वाइन कर लेंगे चलिए कोई बात नहीं ओके गो एट सर आई है I I I I to go and oversee some arrangements. So I know, I know, I know. <laughs> sit there. I'll, b- b- as soon as I'm free, I'll be there for the general body meeting. Sure, sure. But, sure, sure. Uh, and I need to p- 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 devote time here, sir. But, 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 but you are, but you are with us for some time, no? Yeah, I'll be there, sir. I'll be there for some time. Okay, okay. Three o'clock sharp. I have to go because uh, uh, there are hall arrangements. I have to go. I sir. know, I know, I know. I, I think that's okay. No problem. Okay, Guru. So please, please proceed. Yes, sir. Um. A very good afternoon to everyone. A warm welcome to all uh, for the ARRW presentation with the distinguished uh, ARRW fellows. As you know, ARRW now felicitating the eminent research workers for providing fellows. Uh, here today we are going to have twelve presentation by the ARRW fellows. Uh, five from the year 2020 and another five from the year 2021. And additionally, we have two student uh, MSc best outstanding MSc thesis award. And best outstanding PhD thesis award. So total, we are going to have twelve presentation today. And uh, for the information of the audience as well as the speaker, uh, <laughs> the time allotted for uh, each presentation will be six minutes. Uh, before going to the presentation, I request um, uh, Dr. Himan Shupathak, uh, President ARW and Director Niyasam, to chair the session, and also request uh, Madam Batmini Swain to co-chair the session. Sir, over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Guru. Please, please continue, uh, Madam. Yes, Madam, <laughs> you also please uh, take note of time. Guru, you also please note take note of time. Sir, we are not. So we are going to give maybe I think how many six minutes or seven six minutes, minutes for six each minutes. Six minutes. So after five minutes, 
or maybe after 6 minutes you can give some kind of indication okay sir uh, requesting the speaker to conclude okay okay sir so okay, right. yeah yes, today we have the first presentation by dr uh, krishnaid chattopadhyaya principal scientist uh, icr nrri sir uh, kindly upload your slides and start your presentation screen sharing deserve so you please yeah please allow allow them to share their screen please allow it it's allowed sir <coughs> sir now you can share your screen okay okay thank you as take better to open and then is it visible now yes sir yes. it is visible you can quote okay thank you uh, so first of all sir uh, i'm thankful uh, to uh, the president and then office all office bearers of arrrw for and also the selectors for selecting me as a fellow of uh, 2020 uh, this is a prestigious uh, society because it is established in uh, 61 1961 and since then uh, it is working very nicely so i am proud of, to be a, selected as a fellow here so i am now uh, shortly very uh, briefly i i'm going to present here so here uh, oh, is if you see the overall uh, achievements uh, as a plant breeder i have developed some crop varieties apart from rice uh, this in pulses wild seed pineapple and the uh, breeder seed index is 2017 is around 300 quintal if you see the research paper published apart from rice I publish in pulses, mage, oil seed, and horticulture crops, and mean NAS rating is around 7.6, and age index is 12. So, comes to rice research. I am working basically in the two aspects. One is stress tolerance, and another is grain quality. So, uh, in stress tolerance, these two components, mainly the genetic and molecular basis, and improvement for unfavorable lowlands, especially coastal areas. and in grain quality especially emphasis is given on biofortification so comes to the first one this avoid stress tolerance is special emphasis to salinity here methodology have developed some protocol for screening the tolerance at reproductive stage and also the phenotyping protocol for combining stresses and been validated and published avoid stress tolerance jamplasm eight jamplasms have registered along with co-workers and uh, recently registered ac4 and 5 which is tolerant to salinity at seedling and reproductive stage and rashmanjo salinity and stagnant pudding tolerance so comes to the paper publication i am here only highlighting those are i am uh, the first author or the communicating author so here first the pokali accession ac4 and 5 which is already registered and so we found the regulated and selected selective movement of sodium to flag leaf and develop panicle and this causes the reduced spike lesterity and panicle degeneration in this particular accession comes to the second one the detection of qtl for reproductive stage salinity tolerance using this population which is also this ac4185 has been used as a donor so nine multi environment qtl multi environmental qtl uh, reproductive stage salinity tolerance has been detected comes to the second one the salinity tolerance selling stage here actually we emphasize on chlorophyll fluorescence and other photosynthetic efficiency and traits so identified 28 qtls out of 28 13 are related to ab by fn and 15 qtls 
are related to other photosynthetic traits and two QTL for sodium potassium ratio. So QTL for stagnant cladding and other accessions we already registered in Rashpanjo. We have uh, developed the real population and the QTL for water logging tolerance has been identified and published and QTL for combined stress, that is a stagnant flooding with saline water has been detected and is under process of publication. So stress tolerant at rice variety. So have developed the CR done 412. Uh, this is recently released, SR26B used as a donor, SR26B is tolerant to salinity as well as the stagnant flooding. So this variety is also tolerant to salinity and moderately tolerant to stagnant flooding. Apart from that, Tripura Jaladan one, uh, this is actually uh, released for Tripura and is also tolerant for stagnant flooding. Another two variety, the CR 406 and 405, these are one is uh, for wet season, another is for dry season, has been released for coastal area. Comes to another part, the biofortification. So here we protocol, we developed and calibration and uh, of near infrared spectroscopy, especially for protein content has been developed and has been published in food chemistry. Another uh, jump plus on this, ARC10075 has been registered for protein content. So these accessions been used for developing mapping population. We identified the three consistent QTL. One of the QTL, the grain protein content 1.1 in the telomeric region was associated with high glutaline content in the protein uh, integration line. So we also identified donors for RNG content from Odisha jumpers. We evaluate jumpers from 14 districts of Odisha and identified 10 accessions. 10 uh, land races, which are showing the high or moderate level of iron zinc content. So breeding for nutrient rice, here bulk pedigree breeding method, we publish in Journal of Agriculture Science and also in the back cross breeding, we identified 20% integration line with grain protein content. And out of this, uh, CRZM 310 and 311 has been released and, and published in current science. So here, CRDM 310 and 311, these are one of the, CRDM 310 is the first high protein rice variety and 311 is nutrient rich rice variety, uh, Odisha has been released. Comes to another one, the CRDM 315 has been notified for Gujarat and Maharashtra. This is mid, medium maturity duration and also contain 20 high PPM gene in Polish rice. CRDM 411, there is notified for Risha, this high protein, uh, high sh protein shorten line uh, and containing 10.01% protein. So why 45 variety CR 310 has been released by Honorable Union Minister of Agriculture and Farmer West Welfare and CR 310 is marked as a landmark variety in the government of India. Why 45 variety CR 315 has been dedicated by the nation to, by the Honorable Prime Minister, 16 October, and uh, this is also published in ICR Significant Achievement 2019-21. Upscaling, so uh, this uh, three CR 310 has been uh, raised. Uh, time over, kindly oh, wait. Forget so time. So if you have for registration. Yeah. Do time. Okay, sir. Uh, so rice publication, Apart uh, from paper, a published research bulletin, technical bulletin, book, book chapter, and others. So a team leader awarded Nanaji Deshmukh ICR Award, Outstanding Interdisciplinary Team Research, and also awarded Fellow of Indian Society of Genetics Plan Building. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and thank request you. all others to maintain time, please, because <laughs> yeah. we are running short of time. Thank you, Krishnendu. Thank you, Krishnendu. It is very excellent work, uh, very nice work, and congratulations. Uh, friends, uh, those who have got any question, you can please put your question in the chat box. And I would request the speakers, in this case, Krishnendu, to please respond to them if there is any. So let us go to the next one. So the second speaker today, we are having Dr. Ubendra Kumar. So Dr. Ubendra Kumar, share your slides and go for your presentation. Is my slide visible? Yes, it's visible. Yes, Please yes, go. Yes. Good afternoon, one and all. I am really thankful to each and every member of AIW Society, especially Patak sir, Naik sir, Deep sir, Sundaram sir, Lanka sir, and other councillors members. And I also thankful uh, to get opportunity as a AIW uh, uh, fellow 
to present my findings, uh, particularly contribution in rice science in front of you. Uh, these slides actually show the overall, overall brief overview of my contribution in rice science, especially microbial mediated crop and soil health management and the rice based cropping system. So we have developed rice specific microbial formation, Azula and its microbiome and products and paddy stock decompositions. And also the microbial footprint in rice based system under influence of long term fertilizer experiment, long term pesticide experiment, and of course, climate change scenario. We also did some meta analysis, uh, analysis to see the trend analysis of INM and disseminating nitrate reduction to ammonia and terrestrial ecosystem. We have started working on noble emerging work on rice like DNRA and biological nitrification inhibition. We have developed two liquid formulations, particularly for rice crop, and we have evaluated and demonstration at 30 locations. And these could actually increase up to 10.31% over farmer practice and also uh, provide a monetary benefit of around 9,000 per hectare, besides saving 20 to 25% of food fertilizer. And this one is published in micro based technology developed by ICR. And also, uh, this formulation actually working under moisture stress or not, we did uh, a simple formulation of ascorbic acid, and that could serve as an effective formulation to elevate uh, under moisture stress, a BCB enhanced plant growth promoting rice. Right? And similarly, with cyanobacteria, we did biofertilizer. And we know microbial consortia is always better than the single inoculant. So we have developed uh, biofertilizer and biopesticide, especially for the sickim conditions. We also work working on decomposition, and here also we did the microbial consortia, and uh, we have also uh, deposited technology data repository in this. Vermi uh, already Governor Gujarat has emphasized that earthworm is an important component to enhance the organic carbon. So we are also working on vermi compost, and here the organic substrate is supplied to multiple residues generated in apples. That's why you have Mr. Vermi compost. And Ajola germ plant, we all know we are maintaining 102 uh, strains of germ plant for conservation, characterization, and utilization. So we did a lot of work. We also identified three biomarkers, Ajola sporocarp. And uh, we did the awareness and demonstration of each biofertilizer. And we have given the report of uh, 20 beneficiary and 20, 30 uh, non beneficiary farmer to the central agency. And uh, for mass production, we are constructing liquid biofertilizer unit. And uh, for Ajola mass production also we are constructing, similar with BGA and Arbuscular Microvider. We, uh, um, this technology are actually ready for the commercialization. These are some products like livestock like feed through Ajola and the low cost Ajola uh, pallet making machine we also developed and media also we developed from Ajola. Ajola microbiome, we already know, cyanobacteria is there, but uh, we first approved the aluminum IC that syndrome is for this Seeing more of a end than another nostoc. And we started working uh, the whole metagenome of Ajola. Uh, and we are going to divide the cyanobacteria of it. So we have uh, whole metagenome is showing that altogether 430 microbial genera we are found in Ajola. And long term fertility experiment, you know the importance of that one. We did the functional and structural diversity of microbial quality and long term. And we found that continuous application of nitrogen alone actually decrease the functional diversity and structural diversity of microbial community and may likely to extinct in future because the uh, FYM and NPK is better than uh, if apply nitrogen alone. Similarly, some other active, uh, other study also we did. Pesticide, if you apply pesticide continuously, what would be happen? So one study we did, population of uh, asymptomatic nitro aerobic nitrogen fixer, nitrified, denitrified, and all are going to reduce if continuous application of chloroparifers there during seven seasons of experimentation. Petrilachlor, uh, as Harvey said, if you use that recommended dose, it can be used as safely as controlling grassy weed in rice field. But in uh, negative effect of humidity load application were observed against soil microbe and soil enzymes. Similarly, with this pyrobac sodium, you get the negative effect. Climate change is the major issue you all know, and we also work on that one. We what we have seen the abundance of NIF H was significantly increased under combined effect of elevated, elevated carbon dioxide and higher dose of nitrogen. Similar case we observe in Ajola also. And even the arbuscular mycorrhiza community is also going to be altered if long-term exposure of eight years is there. And if nitrifier and denitrifier are linked with the N2O emission, and effect is more pronounced under elevated carbon compared to ambient CO2 condition. We did the meta-analysis study, and this is actually showing trend 
and the nutrient integrated nutrient management with rice wheat cropping system. We have done delayed soil crushing and carbon pools in grassland compared to native forestland of Indian scenario. Particularly in Indian scenario, we did the meta analysis and recently published we article that meta analysis approach to measure the effect of integrated nutrient management on crop performance, microbial activity, and carbon stock Indian soil. This is a DNRA uh, dissimilarity. Uh, Nitrogen reduction to ammonia, a short circuit of biological nitrogen circuit is there, which is actually conserved nitrogen in terrestrial soil. So, the meta analysis we did in this aspect, and we studied that the DNRA is mainly regulated by CN ratio, nitrate, and nitrate ratio, and sulfur. And NRFA gene is the molecular access to DNRA in environmental surface. Therefore, DNRA may be treated as a tool to reduce groundwater nitrate pollution, enhance soil health, and improve, improve environment. Some research option is there. We are working on this direction. Like endophytic digitroph, DNA bacteria, BNI. A kind of end of sir. Oh, Dr. Rupendra. Yeah. Enhanced nitrogen. This is the last slide. And BNI, biological nitrogen inhibition, also if you reduce, uh, not allow to reduce uh, this, uh, convert ammonia to nitrate, then we will solve the problem of entry emission in BCPs, enhance the nitrogen use efficiency. And based on BNI only, we got the uh, research for value purpose and Lalvadu Sastri are a part of that. And nitrogen management dies also given one, one kind of association with the Nanaji Desmond Award. And I am not a lone worker. Many, many have supported, like Director Renar Rai Katak, Head Crop Production Division, my staffs, they have all cooperated, supported. That's why we achieved this, this kinds of accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Pinder. Congratulations. Very good work. Uh, keep it up. Thank you. So, sir. thank you very much. Let us go to the next one. So, the next presenter will be Dr. Badmini Swain, Director ICR NRRA. Madam, please share your slides. Okay. So it is not coming. I'm trying to share. Now you can share, ma'am. Yeah. Is it showing? No, madam, it's not showing. Uh, now it is it's showing. Coming? Yes, mm -hmm. it is coming, but it's not opened yet. But it has gone down. Okay. Okay, Sir, thank share, you. Sir. I, I, I just wait, wait, just wait for, for a second. Oh, yes, yes. No, madam, I think you have to answer and then share again. Answer and share. Yeah. <laughs> New share, regime share. Which one I should do? Madam, now you share. I, now you share. I unshare. You now share again, madam. Okay. Is it visible now? No, madam. madam no. Just, no. No. No, madam. Just Santosh is coming to help you. Just. Okay. It is yes. visible to me. I do. <laughs> Sorry. Not it. <coughs> Santosh, please. Do you have any? Now it's coming, right? But it is not moving enough. Okay. 
Sir, it is visible now. Hello. Not yet, madam. I think it's loading. So it is loading. It is loading. I think. Yes, uh, Sunil. Sir. आप इसको करते रहिए मैडम तब तक हां सर हां सर और सेकंड पर्सन को कर लेते हैं नो आई थिंक नाउ इट इज ओके कैन यू सी इट वी वी कैन वी कैन सी द स्लाइड आई एम आल्सो एबल टू जस्ट ट्राई मूविंग द स्लाइड्स ट्राई यस इट्स नाउ इट इज ओके मैडम नाउ इट इज ओके प्लीज गो अहेड ओके हां डोर लो रे हां नाउ इट इज कमिंग सर थैंक यू वेरी मच सर आई लेट मी प्रोफेसली थैंक द एग्जीक्यूटिव कमिटी टू सिलेक्ट मी एज अ फेलो ऑफ दिस प्रेस्टीजियस Association, Association of Rice Research Workers. So, as I was told to say something about my achievement, how I got it. So, this is the uh, I am mostly working on drought, and uh, I have developed a robust field screening technology for screening large number of germplasm. More than twelve thousand rice germplasm I have screened, and I have uh, identified to two fifty donor lines uh, over repeated screening. as uh, vegetative stage drought tolerance i have also screened some of the horizon ever accessions and i got two horizon ever accession as vegetative stage drought tolerance and i have identified and registered uh, five uh, unique germplasm lines for different traits of drought uh, out of which these three mahulota brahmana can sal can they are vegetative stage drought tolerance so one breeding line cr 143-2-2 It is having for both the vegetative reproductive stage one uh, accession AC four two nine nine seven. It is having high water use efficiency coupled with slow transpiration rate and low stomatal density. And two horizon ever accessions. So these seven lines I have done uh, registered in NBPGR. Uh, so some of the physiological traits like maintaining high turgidity during severe stress. More than uh, R W C, more than seventy percent with higher photosynthetic rate and fast recovery efficiency. They were identified as key trait for drought tolerance. C R one forty three along with uh, three accessions, so they identified to have highest water use efficiency with low stomatal density with lower canopy temperature maintenance during the stress period uh, compared to the susceptible check I R twenty I R sixty four. And uh, BBD one zero nine color carry C I C number and that C R one forty three. They were identified as promising genotype with grain yield of one point nine to two point one five ton under reportive stress drought stress. These are these these are all work over the years I have done. And the variety Gopinath uh, C R than two zero six is developed for aerobic condition using Brahman Naki, which one I told I have registered as a parent. A better adaptable. I also worked on AWD. A better or adaptable water saving technique was understood by alternate cycling, uh, cyclic wetting and drying. And I could see that about 33 percent of irrigation water is saved at the cost of 14 percent yield loss in dry season and 3.2 percent yield loss in wet season. The I am also working in super rice uh, project or uh, NPT line NPT project. And the highest direct foliage leaf orientation coupled with highest photosynthetic rate. Maximum photosynthetic quantum yield efficiency of photosystem two, uh, high biomass, high harvest index, high panicle number, higher grain filling percentage, all are contributing for higher yield potential of more than eight ton per hectare in these lines. Those lines I am working with the breeders, and uh, these I could find the physiological traits. And uh, these are uh, some of the varieties where I was associated with, as co-developer along with my breeder friends, and I uh, because of their uh, generosity as well as uh, because of my contribution maybe they have uh, added me as collaborator or co developer in these uh, 10 lines developed by them so this is uh, uh, my credit and publications i have more than 80 publication in reputed journals and out of which these are the 10 publications um, best 10 publication i sub submitted for my this candidature and uh, these are some of the publications i published in oraja during over the years 13 publications uh, these are two books uh, authored edited by me during those periods and uh, these are some of the awards i got they are not very uh, high quality awards i may say but i was fellow indian society plant physiology and i got uh, that uh, best uh, 
scientist award in the principal science category in our institute and some other uh, social organization i got some awards and i latest i got that venus international women award for lifetime achievement in agriculture science at uh, that one and one iessn award 2020 best researcher in rice physiology by international society for scientific network these two awards are latest and uh, i served to the association as a counselor in the executive council member as associate editor and organizing different uh, um, um, seminar symposium during over the years uh, as organizing committee member or uh, chairpersons in some committee, something like that. And uh, this is my citation. I have published more than 80 papers, uh, more than 24 chap book chapters. And uh, this is the citation and H index I have. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Congratulations, a well deserved, uh, deserving uh, fellowship. And thank, thank you, you very much for your contribution previously and of course with your current position. Thank, thank you, you for all the help and cooperation you are providing to ARW. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Srinivas Prasad, but uh, due to his prior commitment, he uh, announced us today he'll not be available. So okay. now we'll move on to the next presenter, Dr. Sure. Anand Jambulkar. Uh, scientist Social Division, ICR, NRRA. Dr. Jambulkar, please share your slides and start your presentation. Sir, my slides are visible, sir? Yes. Yes, sir, your slides visible. Uh, keep it in full so screen mode. Okay, okay, yeah. Mm. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, honorable chairman of this uh, uh, session. Keep your Dr. slides on full screen mode. Yeah, it is in full screen mode. No, it's not, it's not, not visible not, there. No, sir. Slide show mode. Slide, slide show. Slide show. Yeah, here it is in slide show mode only. Okay. Okay. Once again, I will stop share and again I will share. Okay. Yeah, okay. I will continue. Okay. Okay. Some. Now is it visible? It's not it's visible not in slideshow like mode, sir. Yeah, it is in slideshow in uh, my system. Uh, you can okay, continue, sir. sir. I think you, you can continue, some sir. issues with you your can system. Continue. You can continue. Is it moving? Slides are moving? No. Not slides are you have not to click the next one. In this yes, sir. I am clicking this one. Sir, in my system, slides are moving. Ma manually you have to do. Manually you have to do. There is some problem. Actually, I was facing also. Question. Dr. Jamukal, where are you sitting? I will send otherwise. Ah, yeah, manually you do like this. Sir. sir, now it is moving slides? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Not okay. Slide, no. mm -hmm. yes. okay. okay, so good afternoon, everyone. So, Honorable uh, Chairman of this uh, session, Dr. H. Patak, sir, President ARRW and Director Niazam, uh, Dr. P. Srin, madam. Co-chairperson of this session and director NRRI and all the distinguished delegates of this session. So first of all, I would like to thank all my NRRW fam uh, NRRI family and ARRW family for their for selecting me this award and for their support and the uh, and the encouragement. So I am here to uh, present my uh, ARRW fellow award. So my presentation uh, it is divided into this, uh, this uh, different headings. That is research extension teaching awards and the other activities. So first one is uh, regarding this, uh, this research. So I have developed some databases. So first database uh, base it is a WPH screening database. Here we can retrieve the genotypes based on whether they are uh, resistance or tolerant to some uh, WPH disease. The second database, it is uh, Oriza Nevada database. Here we can retrieve the genotypes based down more than 10 uh, qualitative or quantitative traits. The third database, it is, it is a Bronzeford screening database. Here also we can uh, retrieve the information about the genotypes based down their resistance or uh, tolerant to the disease. And the fourth one is database of M. graminicular nematodes. Also, I have developed some uh, methodology. So first one is I have developed an ME stability index uh, for, stabli for identifying the stable genotypes. This stability index, it is uh, based on the principal component score. The second uh, 
methodology it is rank based stability index here i have used the concept of ranking for the identification of the stable genotypes the third one is uh, i develop an one algorithm for multiple pattern matching using the list count of pattern uh, the fourth one is srx stability index 1 and srx stability index 2 these two also uh, they are used for identifying the stable genotypes and here uh, i have used the concept of combining the two things that is environment and genotype and environment interaction also uh, i developed the mini score for rice germplasm for submergence tolerance here for development this uh, for development of this mini core about more than 4000 genotypic information has been used also i developed another mini score for native rice germplasm uh, for this uh, mini score about more than 10000 rice germplasm information has been used for the development of this um, mini core also i developed some math mathematical models for determining the arbuscular mycorrhiza inoculum requirement for moderately aim responsive variety first one and the second model it is for the aim non responsive varieties so uh, these are my publications so uh, sir here i have categorized my publications based on the 2021 nas score so uh, my three publications they are more than 10 nas score six publications they are uh, eight to 10 nas rating 14 publications they are six to eight nas rating and 17 publications are below six nas rating other than the research publication and the other publications are i published uh, six uh, book chapters 10 training manuals three edited books eight technology or research bulletins 25 chapters in training manual and five popular articles Uh, so this is my uh, google scholar citation so uh, my total citation still now are 645 my h index is 13 and it index is 16 uh, so other than this i also uh, included in uh, organizing the training programs so uh, about 17 training programs has been organized for the farmers three hrd training programs has been organized for the institute these training programs are for the research scholars and uh, scientists of the institute uh, organize one training program for the students and uh, five training programs for the officials of the state de uh, agriculture department and other saus also involved in other extension activities like uh, i was re i represented about uh, the institute in exhi about uh, 10 exhibitions also associated with uh, frontline demonstration of nine districts and also uh, associated with uh, 11 organization of Uh, organizing uh, regional agriculture fair meeting conference symposium etc okay example uh, cut thank you okay i also i guided uh, 10 uh, students in the discipline of agricultural agricultural statistics and bioinformatics also uh, i was external examiner for three subjects and uh, question paper setter for 10 other than this i am also included uh, these are my awards so i got one best poster award uh, one fellow of academic society two best scientist or best worker award Uh, also a uh, member of editor board of four journals and reviewer of four journals also i got uh, 11 in house institutional award other than awards i also uh, associated with other institute activities like i am nodal officer of krishi nodal officer of ses i was nodal of co nodal officer of rfd that is result framework document also associated associated with uh, pims icr project data entry and uh, also i was a uh, member of more than 50 different committees of the institute Thank you, all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Jambulkar. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Jambulkar. It is uh, congratulations again. Very good work. Uh, let us go to the next one. Uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Krishna Murthy Sir, senior scientist uh, from Central Science Laboratory Research Institute. Sir, uh, Krishna Murthy Sir, please kindly share your slides and uh, go to your presentation. thank you sir <clears throat> is it my slides yes, sir your slides are visible can be good thank you sir uh, respected uh, the chairman of the session uh, dr patak sir madam padmini swain madam so uh, i am very happy to be a part of uh, the arrw as a fellow of this uh, society 
So I am going to present my research achievement. Uh, basically, we are working on the development of salt tolerant rice varieties. As we all know that uh, the thousand million hectares of land is affected by salt in globally, whereas in India, six point seven three million hectares of land is uh, salt affected. Six two point nine six million hectares is at uh, saline stress and three point seven seven million hectares and sodic stress. It's an estimate that uh, the forty percent of uh, rice is occupied in uh, salt affected soils, and twenty two percent of yield loss is due to salt stress. It is an estimate that uh, the five point six million tons of food grain lost due to salinity, which cost of one one thousand six hundred uh, one thousand sixty six million US dollar, economic loss due to salinity stress. Whereas in case of sodic city, eleven point one eight million tons of food grain loss. Due to sodic city and two million two thousand million US dollar uh, due to uh, economic loss due to sodic stress. So rice is uh, uh, the sensitive to two stages. One is at uh, seedling stage and another is at uh, reproductive stage. So at seedling stage, the salt cutel has been identified and uh, in progress in high yielding varieties. We need to explore the other novel cutel and uh, robust cutel for integration and enhance the salinity tolerance at seedling stage. Whereas in case of reproductive stage, there are very less number of cutels has been identified, and the very less number of uh, integration of those cutels. So we need to identify the robust and uh, uh, novel cutels for the reproductive stage salinity tolerance. For that, we need to we need to explore the available resources. In one of the project, deep deep the project, we evaluated nine thousand nine thousand rice germplasm. Uh, for 30 qualitative and quantitative trials, we could identify the 1,500 mini core collection. We evaluated those lines and identified the some tolerant lines. So we are using those lines for our breeding program. Similarly, we evaluated 7,500 lines in a uh, uh, year of uh, 10 years. We evaluated for seedling stage. We could able to identify the 241 lines for uh, seedling stage salinity tolerance. We, we are also using some lines for uh, breeding program. The critical part is the reproductive stage salinity tolerance. The, we have identified and uh, developed different donors uh, based the biparental mapping population and association panel. We have evaluated these uh, the mapping population in different salinity stress and sodicity stress. We could able to identify the different uh, the QTLs. In one of the project, we explored the uh, 500 land races from different states, and we could identify the two lines. These TRL 270 and 270 could give a good response to all the stresses in all the stages. So we are exploring these uh, the two lines, land stresses for physiological and molecular mechanism, what are the uh, tolerance mechanism behind it. So we, we all know that uh, rice production system is main constraint for uh, labor and uh, the water. To save this uh, labor and uh, water, so we are uh, identifying the DSR suitable uh, rice varieties. See, so one of the studies, uh, the CSR 88, we have evaluated these four lines along with check in uh, 12 different uh, farmers field in Haryana. So we could be able to identify the line CSR 88. Under uh, uh, puddling condition, it has given us 7.2 ton per hectare. Whereas in case of DSR, it has given the uh, 6.2 ton per hectare. So we also identify the market rate association using magic population. So we identify the SKC1 already reported to uh, gene. Very interestingly, we have identified the aluminum activated malate gene transporter in chromosome 6 for sodicity tolerance at seedling stage. So we can use this uh, gene for further uh, the enhancement of the uh, sodicity tolerance at seedling stage. We also identify the market rates association using GWAS spanner for reproductive stage salinity tolerance and also using the uh, biparental mapping population as well. One of the QTL, SSI 6.2, uh, uh, with a phenotypic variation of 32 phenotypic variation. So we are using uh, these QTL for fine mapping, fine mapping. Once you identify the QTL, we have to introduce the lines in high-yielding varieties, introduce the QTL in high-yielding varieties. The Santal QTL has been identified and uh, introduced these uh, in Two background, COSA 44 and uh, SAGE 52. We identify developed the 10 mils in uh, the COSA 44 background and SAGE 8 in uh, SAGE 52 background. 
So also similarly, we have uh, identified the QTL for spike fertility, QTL for reproductive stage, and we interact in uh, the three background, PUSA 44, PR 104, and SAGE 52 with the stringent phenotyping. Once you identify the lines, we have to uh, evaluate those lines in the salt affected condition. We have evaluated the 18 uh, different locations, salt stress location. We could able to identify the, the good number of lines for adapted and uh, stable performance for the grinding. So we finally we have uh, released uh, six salt alternate varieties for uh, sodicity and salinity uh, affected soils in India. So CSR 46, CSR 56 is uh, recommended for Uttar Pradesh and Haryana. CSR 60 for uh, sodic soils of Uttar Pradesh and Pondicherry. CSR 49, CSR 52, and CSR 76 is recently released variety for sodic soils of Uttar Pradesh. And also we identified the different uh, genetic stock five genetic stock for salinity and sodicity tolerance. We can use these tolerance, uh, genetic stock for uh, NSD uh, salinity tolerance and sodicity tolerance in different background. By these varieties, we could have uh, achieved the 6. million hectares of salt affected land annually it covers uh, the salt affected site. Uh, estimated value produced these 4,732 million US dollar for the national exchequer. Uh, by these using these uh, salt alternative by the different land recommendation corporation benefiting 4.3 lakhs of farmer. So introduce the, these salt varieties, we can save the 6.6 .6 million tons of gypsum, which uh, can save up, uh, 2.5 lakhs of US dollar. These are some uh, awards we have, uh, I have got the Japan International Award and uh, na, uh, uh, Shastri Award from ICR, NAS Fellow. These are some uh, publications. So I express my sincere thanks to our uh, beloved uh, Honorable uh, DG, ICR, NRM Division, uh, DDG Chaudhary sir, and Dr. PC Sharma sir, and my team and funding agencies. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Krishnamurti. Excellent work. and. Congratulations also, sir. Kata sir has come, sir. Oh, please, 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 madam. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, congratulations again uh, to receive this year uh, of Rupelo Award. I Thank think you, Dr. Man. Guru can yes, sir. Yes, proceed. So, okay. the next presenter we are having here, Dr. Anjani Kumar, scientist uh, ICR NRRI. Dr. Anjani Kumar, sir, please share your slides and uh, go for your presentation. Nice, sir. Will you go? Visible, keep it on uh, full screen mode. Select so mode. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Now you can go through. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon to all. And uh, I am thankful to the selection committee for selecting me this uh, for this coveted award. Uh, myself, Anjani Kumar. And uh, today I will be presenting for the ARRW fellow presentation. And my research achievements are maximization of water productivity under water deficit stress, elucidation of effect of climate change on rice, greenhouse gas emission and its mitigation strategy, carbon and nitrogen dynamics, products uh, and related publications. First of all, I will be dealing with the augmenting water productivity under water deficit stress. Here, uh, after using a tensiometer, we could found, uh, we could found that uh, we could found that the highest water productivity was a minus 30 kilopascal for drought susceptible variety and a minus 40 kilopascal for drought tolerant variety. And again, we worked out the nutrient management strategy for maximization of water productivity under water deficit stress. And uh, along with a recommended dose of nitrogen and potassium, 50% higher dose of P2O5 and uh, iron at the rate of 30 kg per hectare and iron, iron sulfate and silica at the rate of 200 kg per hectare as a silica, uh, SiO2 can uh, augment the drain in under water deficit stress, and it can also save uh, irrigation water by up to 43%. And uh, then we also did the real-time application of mean coated urea for enhancing nitrogen urea efficiency under aerobic system, and we found that uh, nitrogen management strategy involving application of uh, mean coated urea on the basis of CLCC uh, reading reduced the yield gap between ADSR and PPR from 33% uh, up to 26%. And then elucidating the effect of climate change, uh, we found that uh, the effect of elevated CO2 on grain yield and the water productivity was more pronounced under water deficit as compared to the well-watered conditions. 
and we also found that the nitrogen use efficiency was higher under elevated CO2 as compared to the ambient CO2 condition. And then uh, coming to the greenhouse gas emission and its mitigation strategies, uh, we found uh, in uh, our uh, inform experiment that uh, irrigation at minus 30 kilopascal reduced the methane emission, but seasonal cumulative uh, um, emission of uh, carbon dioxide and, and nitrous oxide was increased. There, therefore, the GWP was at par, and uh, there was a trade-off between greenhouse gas emission and grain yield. At 30 kilopascal, no significant reduction in uh, you know, uh, global warming potential was there, but at minus 40 kilopascal, there was a uh, significant reduction in global warming potential as well as the grain yield. And we also did the machine learning approach for estimation of uh, nitrous oxide emission under elevated CO2 condition. And we found that the path modeling approach uh, indicated a direct effect of nitrifier and denitrifier population uh, on nitrous oxide emission. And uh, the predictive models for nitrous oxide emission developed by us clarified the effect of varying levels of CO2 was more pronounced at a vegetative stage of rise than the reproductive stage. <clears throat> and uh, then we found that the three row briquette applicator plus top dressing uh, applicator had the highest uh, agronomic use efficiency of nitrogen compared to the PUV due to the high yield advantage in placement. And uh, uh, then uh, greenhouse gas emission versus the integrated nutrient management, we observed uh, 11 to 24 percent and uh, 13 to 27 percent reduction in nitrous oxide and uh, ammonia uh, emission in uh, INM treatments as compared to the urea alone. And uh, we also did the DNDC model uh, for uh, methane gas and the nitrous oxide gas, and we found a good agreement between the observed and simulated data using the DNDC model. And uh, coming to the carbon and nitrogen dynamics, uh, we observed a higher rate of carbon mineralization under aerobic condition, and the rate was also higher under nutrient uh, stress conditions. And uh, uh, we concluded that the long-term application of FYM resulted in carbon accumulation in bulk soil and aggregates, but the accumulation pattern was dependent on the aggregate size. And the net change in the rate of uh, SOC was highest uh, at a lower gangetic plane and lowest at transgangetic plane for all the treatments. And we developed the critical nitrogen curve, uh, which can be used for a uh, nitrogen nutrition index for determining the nitrogen deficiency or sufficiency during the growth period of uh, different varieties. And we also estimated the nitrogen use efficiency um, uh, for different um, rice growing states of India. And uh, we found that the uh, agronomic use efficiency, <clears throat> average agronomic use efficiency in Himachal Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Punjab, and Haryana were higher than the national average. And we also did the um, carbon, uh, carbon footprint of rice in India, rice and wheat in India. Uh, the total uh, carbon footprint of rice and wheat in India were calculated to be 2.44 and 1.27 tons CO2 equivalent per hectare. And uh, coming to the water footprint, uh, the to total water footprint for production of rice in India was 7.5 into 10 to the power 3 cubic meter per hectare. And among all the Indian states, the highest blue water footprint for rice was highest in Rajasthan, followed by Punjab. And uh, then coming to deploying remote sensing to and uh, geostatistical tools, uh, then, uh, then we uh, did the principal component analysis and fudgy C mean clustering algorithm were performed to identify the optimum clusters using fudgy performance index and normalized classification in entropy. And uh, uh, we use the site space of nitrogen management in rice uh, using the rice remote sensing and geostatistical tools. And uh, this technology can be used for recommendation of nitrogen fertilizer in rice using the uh, real time remote sensing uh, imaginary. And uh, the spatial variation in the evapotranspiration in Mahanadi Delta was also worked out. And it was found that the daily evaporation for the Mahanadi Delta region was 0.8 to 7 millimeter per day. And then uh, eco friendly management of rice is stopped. Uh, we, we developed the uh, fungal com consortium for uh, eco friendly management of uh, um, paddy stock. And uh, we, also, uh, we also developed a cross livestock agroforestry based integrated for farming system and uh, resource conservation technology for rice science uh, system. And coming to the product and technology, um, the, we, have, I have developed, we have developed some sensor based innovations. Our uh, first is eco friendly irrigation alert system. And it has the potential to save around 30% of irrigation water. And it gives a real-time alert to the farmer for, uh, for the event of re-irrigation. And then the NRRI aerobic moisture sensor, it is a highly portable and easy to handle. 
and uh, it can it, it provides uh, kind of time soil moisture escape. And uh, also we have developed the customized color coded tensiometer and the uh, tensiometer based irrigation alert system. Uh, in tensiometer, we have attached some non contact sensor so that the farmer can be alerted in a, in a real time sense uh, for the re irrigation events. And uh, we have also de developed a customized leaf color chart, and, uh, which is highly popular all over India. And a mobile app, we have developed two mobile apps, the Rice Expert app and the, the Expert up. mobile app and the Urea Bricket and Applicator. So we have developed a unique product of Urea Bricket and some Urea Bricket applicators we have also developed and the microbial consortium like NRA microbial consortium for eco-friendly decomposition of paddy straw and biofertilizer consortium also. And we have developed two rice varieties, 309 and 102. And also the bulletins and the crop planning bulletin for different agroclimatic zones of India. And this interactive database on long term. And coming to the publication, I have total 136. <laughs> and the total citation is 2114. I think is 45, and I think this is 26. And awards and recognition, I got the uh, Nanaji Deshmukh ICR Award, um, ISS LVP Best Doctoral Thesis Award, ISS LVP Best Doctoral Research Award, RULA Awards, Small Recognition Awards, IPNI Scholar Award, and the Best Worker Award in Scientist Category, and BHU Medal. And the recognition, I have been selected as editor in chief for the journal Oraja. I am associate editor for PLOS One and uh, um, RRW Fellow. And uh, I am thankful for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Ekin Nayak, uh, head professor of division, and uh, all my research team members. Thanks to all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Anjani Kumar. Uh, you have done a uh, lot of work in uh, crop uh, management and crop production technologies. Again, congratulations to you for uh, mm -hmm. getting this award. Thank, thank you me. very much. I think, Dr. Guru, we can proceed further. Yes, ma'am. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Rubesh Desmukh. He is from uh, National Agri-Food Biotechnology Institute. Dr. Rubis Desmukh, kindly share your slides and uh, go through your presentation. Kind, kind, kindly stick to time. Huh? We have to again start another function. Uh, I hope my slides are visible. Yes, sir. Your slides are visible. Uh, thank you, uh, ARRW, for uh, selecting me for this fellow. Uh, my group is working on understanding aquaporin transport system in plant. And basically, uh, I'm working on three aspects. One is uh, metrolyte uptake, uh, second growth, and trace tolerance in rice. Uh, so I'm working as a Ramalinga Swami Fellow, uh, that is fellowship from Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. And I, ha I have activated this fellowship at Nabi Mohali. Uh, Icoporins are membrane proteins. They, they form pore in, uh, at the center from this pore. Aquaporin allows transport of water and many other small solutes like uh, metalloids, urea, carbon dioxide, H2O2. And uh, these all small solutes are very important for uh, plant growth. Uh, uh, to better understand the evolution of aquaporin, I have characterized the aquaporin uh, gene family in more than 25 different plant species. And uh, this study was published in Plant Journal. And in this study, we have identified several different interesting facts uh, about aquaporin. Like uh, here, you can see aquaporins uh, are further classified into five different subfamilies. And one of the subfamily that is Zip, which is completely absent from the monopod and some of the dicots. Apart from this, there are several other uh, interesting observations. Uh, uh, here, I will more focus on metalloid transport through the aquaporins. As I mentioned that aquaporins are membrane proteins. They form a small pore through which they allow transport of several different small molecules and metalloids are among those. Metalloids are elements which have a property like metal and non-metals. And there are several metalloid transporter proteins are already identified in plant. And these transporter proteins are belongs to aquaporin, like for boron, NIP2, uh, silicon, also NIP2 arsenic, antimony, and germanium. Uh, all these metalloids are, most of the metalloids are transported uh, through the NIP2 aquaporin in uh, uh, rice. And uh, when we subclassified again the NIP class, subclass of aquaporin, we found that NIPs are further grouped into three uh, major groups. And uh, among these, the NIP3 
group is uh, mainly responsible for the transport of uh, um, silicon as well as uh, arsenic. Silicon is a beneficial element for uh, rice growth, but arsenic is a very uh, uh, carcinogenic for human health also and uh, also for the plant growth. So, and we published this characterization in functional ecology. Uh, to study the aquaporin, silicon transport through aquaporin, we uh, developed one system that is Xenopus oocyte based assay. This system was initially developed in, uh, before uh, uh, 2000 by Peter Agre's group. They used this system to characterize aquaporin and Peter Agre got Nobel Prize for the identification of aquaporin as a water transporting protein. And uh, we also developed uh, one uh, vector uh, that is the reach vector, which is deposited in ARGIN. This vector is useful to uh, characterize any transporter protein uh, in the oocyte assay. And we are, our group also uses yeast assay uh, to uh, characterize the transport of different solutes through aquaporins. Mainly we are working on silicon, boron, selenium, and uh, H2O2. Uh, in rice, there are two proteins are known which, uh, are, which regulate silicon uptake in rice. One is LSI1 and another is LSI2. The LSI1 is aquaporin, that is NIP2 aquaporin, and that perform influx silicon activity, which is responsible for uptake of silicon at the root level. And to understand this uh, protein, this aquaporin, silicon transporter aquaporin, we performed evolutionary analysis in diverse plant species. In this study, we have used uh, more than 1,000 diverse plants and characterized this gene in uh, diverse uh, and this plant is from diverse plant orders. And here you can see that the Poel's uh, gramini family is the highest accumulator of the silicon. And from this study, we also identified that how the different conserved motifs and domains evolved with time. And uh, we ob uh, observed here that moss are the first plants, uh, lower plant, which started accumulating silicon. And over the time, and just from developed some, um, evolved with some motif and conserve domains which specifically have solute specific for the metalloids and uh, in uh, rice silicon provide benefit against contrasting stress like uh, drought as well as the flooding stress uh, this is very interesting and we our group is working to understand how a single element is providing a beneficial effect in different uh, stresses uh, we identified some black spot also uh, like in the root, uh, the transported Ivan involved in uh, xylem loading is not uh, yet known. Similarly, uh, transporter feeding silicon in silica cell is not yet known. Uh, rice has a characteristic silica cells that is bulliform cell that provide mechanical support. And uh, we are using different uh, elemental localization technique to study the silica, silica cells and co-deposition of silicon with uh, different elements. Uh, this is one hypothesis where we are presently working. That is the silicon transporter aquaporin also transport arsenic. And if we knock out that transporter, we can get rid of arsenic, but uh, yield 60% yield loss will be there. So to avoid the yield loss, we can modify this aquaporin in a way that that will allow silicon transport, but that will stop transport of arsenic. And for this, we are using uh, two different approach. One is site directed mutagenesis. And another one we are using is random mutagenesis and computational modeling. And after pinpointing the uh, amino acid, which is responsible for silicon's uh, uh, specificity, we will proceed for the genome editing. Uh, I'm thankful to my PhD supervisor, Dr. N.K. Singh, sir. And then our previous director, Dr. T.R. Sharma, my MSc supervisor, Satish Barukar, and other different collaborators and my students. Uh, and also thankful, I'm thankful to the ARRW for providing me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rupes. I think excellent work you have done and uh, worth getting the ARRW Fellow Award. So again, profusely on behalf of the association, I thank you. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Guru, we can proceed for yes, next one. So our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Kalyan K. Mundal, is a principal scientist from recent Division of Plant Pathology, ICR, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. Uh, Sir, Dr. Kalyan Ken Mundal, please share your slides and go through your presentation. Yes. Okay.
so is it visible ram yes sir your slides are visible please go through so a uh, good afternoon to all especially honorable chair dr himanshu pathak president arw and director nism madam dr padmini director nri katak secretary arw and other dignitaries i am really uh, feel honored and thank you for considering my nominations for this arw fellow and we have been working on rice bacterial blight pathogen zoo systems uh for uh for decades and i think uh, we have found some insights into this interactions of these two important uh, uh two important i mean two uh, important component of that is uh type 3 sequences defectors of exo zoo versus rice and this can lead to a better bacterial blight management so with this uh you all you know i am not uh that is anthemona sorigi pathology causing bacterial blight is a global threat and antibiotic like streptocyclines and the all only options but challenges like residues residence resistance are of major concerns and ju virulence are ever ever in a changing pyramided resistance uh, though they are effective but they are short lived because of continuous evolutions of the ju races so this actually uh compelled us to do some basic understanding to understand some basic understanding so that we can develop some novel strategies and we have uh intersect these ju rice interactions by effectors and host targets so first of all uh we have uh have a, a clear view of the ju races and uh, here we find that res 4 uh from the north west and northeastern part of the india res 4 is the major uh important exo uh, isolates and uh, this is the res 4 characterized and uh, if you see that this res 4 is able to knock down a uh, important uh, uh, exe genes uh, which are uh, that is exe 8 exe 13 exe 4 exe 5 you can see this is the uh, reactions with different irbb lines and uh, with reference to the job effectors like xanthomonas autoprotein effectors these are the type 3 effectors secreted by the bacteria into the host cells and then these effectors actually uh, uh, interfere with the map kinase mediated defense reactions in plant so we identified 21 job effectors in indian juice strains particularly in res 4 and these are the details and uh, we have documented this uh, important informations in the in a, a physiological molecular plant journals and uh, now now uh, our question is that all these 21 job effector whether it is required for the disease development or not so to address this we uh, develop uh, mutagenesis and targeted mutagenesis and it is a uh, uh, you can say double uh, double homologous recombination based strategy and we replace this uh, the effector genes with canamycin gene and then we could find that this is a uh, this is a you can say mutant for the for the type 3 effectors and this is wild ju so we have also use this mutant we have a defective mutant and we have also used a specific mutant of the job or effectors and we have developed a complementary strains also because those genes we have mutated in bacteria that has been again reintroduced into the bacterial mutant cells so with this component we could find that this job or effector uh, is not required for bacterial growth in vitro because both wild and mutant are behaving same but they are required for implant growth you see can that that uh, this job or mutant and these are the wild so there is a growth uh, difference and here it is that the when type 3 sequence system apparatus is totally blocked then this is the you can say level of uh, colonizations and this is the mutant when complemented cells so based on our understanding I means uh, functional study we could find that these two effectors job f and job r are very very important for the bacteria to cause bacterial blight so uh, and both of and when when you delete both of these effectors it it cause reduce blight intensity and uh, and we could we could find the, this plant in plant assay that this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, leaf inoculated with a bacteria which does not have any type 3 sequence apparatus that that does not 
secrete any kind of uh, effectors. And here it is too wild, and it is the mutant, specific mutant of the effector, and it is the complementary strains. So both we could find that these uh, effectors cause threefold reductions. That when threefold reductions in the symptoms and uh, almost five, sixfold reductions uh, in this uh, in this case. So here we could find that these uh, these effectors also uh, also suppress the immune systems through uh, blocking the callous depositions because callous we know a biological marker for plant defense. So this we could study and that that is a uh, suppress with this dual and when this effector is not there, suppression is not uh, to that, that much extent. So these both the effector play a role in suppressions and they are also playing role in other uh, ROS mediated defense response is 2 2 and O2 and also uh, oxygen um, means uh, reactive oxygen species mediated defense response when they are uh, we rice leaf infiltrated with JOPA so higher depositions compared to wild as a control. So here we could find that uh, this job F also regulate the important genes, uh, like rice genes, which are required for uh, plant uh, um, uh, defense. And job are also required. So these are some of the our functional analysis. And it is also important to understand that this electrolyte leakage we measure and job are also regulate these things. And uh, we also localize, we also study the localizations of these two effectors when they are secreted into the rice cells and they are known to localize uh, on, on the uh, cytoplasms. And uh, particularly, uh, this, uh, 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 particularly uh, the, in the, in the uh, periplasmic um, say cytoplasmic wall. So I see the plasma membrane. So this plasma membrane is the localizations. So based on our understanding, it's moved past. We could, find, we could find that this, both these effectors are important for these things. Now, these, these publications we have made for, the, for all this. So now we have also understood the, what are the effectors, what are the rise interactors for these effectors. So we identified uh, through each two systems, these two, two uh, 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 interactors, protosystem one and cyclotin two. And these interactors have been, uh, these protein sequences of these interactors and protein models have been uh, decoded. And we have, as uh, we have also studied the interactions of these things through uh, through virtual interactions model. And uh, we could see the interactor two, this is the model, this is the interactions. And this is this, we can find that these two interactor in the rice interact with these two effectors and thereby they are the uh, downstream activity taken on. So this is in brief and in brief in last that rice cyclophilin uh, job F regulate rhizocyclin and protosystem two, and thereby it helps to compromise these plant defense responses, and thereby it makes the healthy plant a disease plant. So this understanding actually led us, uh, um, uh, and we have recently currently recently uh, sequenced the complete genome of this S4, and which has been published in MPMI, and this is my group working on last uh, 10 to 12, 15 years uh, because in different programs. And we are really thankful to the continuous grant received from uh, DBT, DST. And I'm really thankful to the ARW for recognition. Me recognize um, our team for this fellow 2021. Thank you very much, madam. Thank Sir. you very much, Dr. Mandal. Excellent work you have done. Uh, you have got uh, also many um, fellowships uh, through DST, DBT, and ACRB. So you have done excellent work. You are worth getting this. Uh, uh, ARW Fellow Award. I congratulate you again and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Guru, again. Thank if anybody you. else is left? Yes, ma'am. Uh, today we are having uh, Dr. Lipitas. He's a principal uh -huh. scientist from ICR Central Institute for Women in Agriculture. Okay. And I'm requesting ma'am to share her slides and start her presentation. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, is it coming? Yes, yes. Slide so. Uh, ah, it is slide so only. Uh, Ma'am, there may be a problem with also. your stuff. You have to do Please. manually, I think. Okay. One, one second.
I think it has come now, Dr. Guru. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, it is visible. You can able come. to move okay. the slides, ma'am. It's moving. Slides are moving. Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. ma'am. You can. Move yes. Them. Okay. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, of the Honorable President ARW and uh, Dr. Himanshu Patil sir, and uh, Secretary and uh, the Director of uh, National Rice Research Institute, Padmini Madam, esteemed members of ARW. and uh, the esteemed participants of uh, this uh, seminar across the country so first of all uh, thank you very much for the experts and juries uh, for selecting me as the rw fellow in social science yeah uh, so actually uh, because i have just prepared very brief so let me say actually how this uh, journey has been started uh, with uh, three four minutes i'll present So, as an extension scientist, my professional journey started with working on rice since my PhD level, that is tribal women in rice farming, and the works are still continuing. It is uh, rather intense and uh, much with full of enthusiasm, and lot of works uh, we are doing on women in rice, and the real science, the research work. I have started my career at NRI Katak Mali, and this has been continuing in at Siva Central Institute for Women in Agriculture also. This is something problem is there. It is not, not moving. moving. Yeah, yeah. This is moving. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, my move. So this is uh, my areas of specialization. Uh, that is what actually exactly I am doing. Gender, particularly you can uh, see that women in agriculture has always been a passion for me. Rather, women in rice farming for me. It's it's it has been a passion for me to work uh, particularly in this field. And uh, this uh, this area specialization are gender issues in agriculture and rice research, and participated extensive research in women entrepreneurship development and rice value chain. These are the broad areas I am showing, you. and uh, and I am working on this aspect. So what is uh, the particularly the research areas? I have worked uh, in a not since the forty six of research projects, maybe in zero ten external research projects. and what exactly i have kept importance uh, that is on the and focused on particularly on gender issues in rice based production system and i have developed appropriate gender sensitive approaches in rice farming and uh, gender equity in rice emphasis in value addition and market linkage and uh, development and evaluation of and upscale of uh, rice value chain so these are particular area we i did a lot of work while i i was at nrra katak and uh, we have developed lot of models and particularly the rice and women linking to the gender and the rice and we have developed a rice value chain also now also we are working on gender sensitive agility as you know that uh, see, uh, that the covid pandemic is everyone is uh, this is a panic for everyone so we are developing uh, such a nutri based uh, farming system model focusing on rice i have taken also the nutrition this that a high protein rice from crr nra cotton and i am also continuing that uh, in my research work this is gsan model and also some of the nsf model nsf project i am leading in from this is that also we are highlighting and entrepreneurship development rice based farming system then also we have we did some uh, that is appropriateness what is the actually the different varieties so we have assessed i have assessed the appropriateness of improved rice cultivation technologies particularly in varieties case we have already assessed and uh, similarly the adoption and consensus of rice production technologies also we have taken the assessment of training needs and it's it's a good that we developed some of the model relays uh, that is in the linking the convergence mode with the line departments and the, that is also uh, the district administration it's a actually huge program we did to while i was in nra katak particular rice based uh, farming system model and uh, this is a uh, prediction of requirement quality seed seed village concept also i have developed and i have uh, that is identify the gender gap and uh, the development of, we have developed some gender sensitization model for bridging gender gap and rice is uh, being the major component of this model also and this is uh, the sheet model i have developed in a social health environment economic technological model for identification of assessment of gender gap and uh, these are actually uh, let me say uh, this is the uh, extension activities 
uh, that uh, I did the uh, Italy in rice, particularly in rice uh, research, and that is participatory uh, or participatory technology refinement development programs with regarding to the varietal performance. I have also a co-developer with uh, in four uh, rice varieties along with uh, rice leader Dr. Pradhan and gradually reducing also mechanization part also we did. And farmers mainly farm implements in women managed rice production system. That is also and popularization of rice production technologies through demonstrations, trainers training program, and publications. And in case of value chain, we have uh, with I did uh, that particularly the variety to Gitanjali in three different locations. And uh, this is actually uh, somehow we have been upscaled that technology that the model. And uh, now also it's uh, going on at NRA Katak. And evaluate some of this time saving economic gradually reducing farm input and particularly for the women uh, in uh, agriculture. And uh, also, you have popularized high yielding varieties and nutri rich rice varieties. This also I am doing because popularization of uh, this nutri rich uh, protein, high protein rice variety. And develop uh, gender sensitive rice based cropping system model. So, these are some of this extension activities, uh, demonstration we have also conducted. And uh, regarding uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, this is capacity building uh, and uh, activities organized more than 100 in state and national level sponsored capacity building program as the coach director also. And uh, particularly focused in rice production technology, rice farming system. Ma'am, kindly wind up, ma'am. Yes, women in agriculture. So these are uh, actually one of my, that is, uh, that is capacity building program. And uh, yes, this is some of the awards, uh, just the ISCC, I have received the ISCC Fellow Award, DK Mishra Award, Young Scientist Award. So these are some of these, uh, uh, that is awards and honors. And uh, yeah, this, uh, some of these uh, publications, uh, particularly rice, and I've linked to them to the women. And uh, this is uh, also, we have developed all, because the rice-based activities, so I have developed a lot of, uh, that is groups also we have developed in, in while I was NRA also. This is uh, this is the last slide uh, because we are used to develop a lot of technology, but when our clients, suppose they will receive their award, so that is our real success. So in this case, actually our women farmers who is involved in the rice farming, they have been awarded the best farm women in the national as well as the state level. So this you can see uh, that uh, my uh, that adopted farm women in also Odisha that is she has uh, get uh, recognized by uh, that is uh, her, by best giving uh, getting the best women uh, farmers award. So these are the some of the success story that is uh, ICR has recognized and in this context we are going to uh, that is already we have developing our that is nutri best uh, concept or food products. That is the Minister of Agriculture we are doing. So this is uh, all about uh, my achievement. So the, this last actually, this represent all, all are, this is, I'm doing at Siva Bhuvaneshwar and also taken this rice varieties from the another day. And the last slide shows for Atman even Bharat, it's important to take women along who can play instrumental in transferring the face of agriculture and evolving the economy and making India self -made. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, madam. Excellent talk. And uh, in the uh, line of social science, you have done a lot of work in extension as well as uh, for uh, more specifically for women, women empowerment, drudgery reduction, and so many activities, value chain, rice. Uh, so many activities you have done here in NRRI as well as in Siva, you are still continuing your uh, tempo to do that and you are thinking of women in every sphere particularly in the rice system so thank you very much for you are worth getting this uh, fellow award of ARRW well, I congratulate again and uh, thank you very much Dr. Guru yes ma'am thank you I'm, uh, still we have two presentation by oh. uh, students uh, okay. this is the first presentation by the PhD student for ARW award for outstanding PhD thesis for the year 2020. Uh, Dr. Ravindra Tatonde from ICR NRRI, kindly share your slides and start your presentation. Uh, please, please stick to the time. time. Six minute time, no?
Yes, it is six minutes time. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My slide is visible. Yeah, our slide is visible. Yes. Keep it in uh, slides or full, yes, full screen mode. Yeah, so you can go through. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Ravindra Dunja. I would like to thanks to ARW team, organizing committee, chairpersons, and president, Dr. Hima Chubata, and uh, organizing uh, space evaluation committee. Today, I'm going to present ARW of study thesis award 2020. My peri topic was introduction of doubt tolerance into the popularized variety using wild ancestor derived from the segment substitution line through marker selection. I completed my PhD under guidance of Dr. Sushant Kumar Das and Kirat Kumar Sao. Research challenges. We all know a word of it, global warming, climate change, uncertainty of rainfall and drought and flood, and several biting about its stresses, which significantly reduce the pain in production throughout the world. The existing the research gap. So we all know that the rice, the wild acid species is the reserve of all genes and alleles. But after the green revolution, we focus on the developing the ill, color, Ill high grain yielding rice variety. During that, what happened? We lost those alleles and so, uh, cutials during the period of domestication. Here we chart to say that the wild species having all kind of allele and gene. While the selection during the process, we lost those alleles. Our improved result as a result, improved rice variety is a loss of those alleles. They are more sensitive to the abiding and biting space tolerance. So present study is about the CSL derived from wild rice species. So present study I use Oreza Ophicogon and Oreza Medonacin. These are the promising uh, wild species having tolerance to abiding and biting. But problem is that it's difficult to transfer those alleles into the, our cultivated species. So they are tightly linked. Therefore, the scientists have developed CSL. So what is CSL? It's the chromosome segment substitution line. How you develop that CSL? Let's imagine here is the red red line represented as a wild ancestor, and here the green red represents as a recurrent parent. We cross those uh, both the parent with the marker step approach. Uh, this is for a fourth generation. The, what happens? The meliodonosis wild segment is going to break it down into small segment. So as a result, we get the different number of population. We use that population spreading with the respective traits. Present study, I use two CSL libraries. First, 32 CSL libraries derived from Horizon Redonesis. And second one, we are 48 CSL libraries derived from Horizon Fibogon. Total panel of 98 genotypes, we are used to spray in the field level. These are part of the interaction collaborative project with the Cornell University and Susan Michaels and York University, Yuan Brown. So, present study, I use several techniques and uh, approaches to use. Uh, this uh, techniques standardize this technique at this DRI level. I use high throughput SMP genotyping, barcoding, and the marker system backcrossing approach, Illumina Genome Studio, SMP Pearl Calling Pipeline. These are the brief methodologies I have used. Objective one is screening of uh, total panel, both control and drought state condition. Objective two is identify relative yield reductions and base 15 genotype. Objective three was mass breeding program. And then evolution those introduced segment lines into the field level, both control and drought state. These are the, by workflow, we are using standard uh, breeding, uh, micro step breeding approach. Then we, we use the transfer the wild segment into our popularized variety. First, evolution on the field, for field level at the four season. We are this for, uh, four season, best 15 genotype as the best performing genotype under stress condition. We study the infrared thermal imaging, uh, imaging uh, experiment. We identify these are the best the best uh, lines having the minimum temperature can be temperature under space condition. We also completed the root structure, root artificial study, and these are the best performing lines under stress. We also did gene expression and study to characterize those CSL lines under stress situation. These are the best 15 genotypes uh, we use to screen with eight about stress response genes, and they are used for characterization. These are all of the comparison of base 15 genotype under stress condition, a Renault shelter and control irrigated under relative illumination under stress condition. We identify that May 20, group 44, and group 16 are the base for moving CL CSL lines. After that, by comparing the all morphological and phenotypic data screening, we come to final conclusion that May 20, group 44, and group 16, these are the base performing CSL line. So, so my present study, I use May 20 as the best CSL line used to transfer the wild segment into the popularized variety. That is, one of the one, and six was the one. So presently, my 20 has a four wild segment integration, located at chromosome number three, four, and eight. These are the location of the chromosome number. Uh, here is a chromosome eight having the large segment integration from my 20. So we are first time used in CRNRI. These are the 
barcode stickers, flat ID barcode, sample ID barcode, seed ID barcode. These are the help in tracking those advanced population in the population in respective segments. We have designed SSR markers with a link with that wild segment. So it helps our foreground selection. Uh, foreground selection. We also use sub submergence selection as a foreground marker. These are the basic workflow. They are used for two cross population. Cross one is a sonar subone with mel 20. Cross two is a sativa subone with mel 20. And both foreground and back foreground selection was done in F1 and BC or F1 generation. Rest of the uh, generation, BC2 F1, BC3 F1, and BC3 F2 generation, they have deep uh, foreground and background selection simultaneously by using Cornell 6K and 7K SMPI platform. These are the, uh, the density plot which represent the polymorphic SMP using 6K and 7K SMPI platform. A summary of BC3 F2 generation using 6, 7K SMPI genotyping. Here we see so on a subone, we got 89% genome recovery and the uh, actual subone background we get the 88% genome recovery with having the wild segment interrogation. In downside, the GGT plot represent the green one it shows the background of so on a subone, and the blue one represents the background of RGB sub one. The red one is the interrogation from mere, mere, mere 20 CSL line. These are the field trials we have done uh, both drawdown shelter, drought stress, and as well as some urgent stress condition. These are overall summary of my backwards population uh, when I develop total number of population, how much positive plant we get throughout the generation in the border. Indra, Indra, kindly wind up your yes, time sir. limit. Over. These are the best CSL lines we identified both Sona Savon and IFC Savon. These are the summary. I identified the May 20, the 44 to 16. I have successfully introduced a drought on the wild segment in Sona Savon and IFC Savon. The best three best performing uh, performing best cross line we are access above. We have in the higher green yield 45, 44, and 26 percent over the check. And presently, best four promising back cross line, these are the under the IVT EDS premium yield trials. These are the my achievements and awards. These are my publication from PD work. These are the publication from other work. I acknowledge all of them and thanks to Aro honoring me our sunny award 2020. Thank you. Thank you, no, Dr. Rabinder. Thank you. Excellent you. work. Uh, of course, I know you worked there in that project. I was also there. Yes, and uh, very good work you have done. And uh, your lines have been nominated to a group. That is a good, uh, yes, very good thing. And uh, I congratulate you. Uh, you are worth getting this uh, best PhD thesis award. Uh, again, congratulations to you on behalf Thank of you. ARRW. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Today we are having our last presenter, uh, ARRW award for outstanding MSc thesis. It will be presented by um, Ms. M. Bargavi from SV Agriculture College, Tirupati. Ms. Bargavi, kindly share your slides and kindly go through the presentation and please stick to the time. Sir, is it visible, sir? Yeah, your slides visible. Kindly go through. Good afternoon, one and all. I am M. Bargvi. I am very much thankful for the ARRW Outstanding MSc Thesis Award. The title of my research work in my MSc is Identification of Rice Varieties Using Dust Descriptors and Gene Specific Markers. Rice varietal identification is a crucial aspect in breeding, seed production, and tree trade. And as the number of varieties released is increasing every year, the need to identify them unambiguously also increases. And the rapid identification and characterization of varieties would be very much important for the proper utilization in breeding and trade. Nowadays, be, uh, the wide accessibility and cost effectiveness of the DNA based markers make them an appealing alternatives to investigate their utilization to complement the existing morphological based identification. Hence, in the present study, we have used 62 genotypes for identification using 22 dust descriptors and 25 gene specific markers. The objectives of my study include study of morphological dust descriptors in rice genotypes and development of varietal specific DNA fingerprints using gene specific markers. This experiment was carried out at Wetland Farm SV Agricultural College, Tirupati during the Kharif 2019. And this experiment was laid out in RBD with 62 genotypes replicated thrice. This is the field view of my experimental plot. And these are all the 62 genotypes which were included in my study. And these are the list of the 22 characters for which we have recorded the data at appropriate growth stages as per the guidelines given by PPVFRA. 
and these are all the 25 primers which were included in my study and coming to the methodology of dna fingerprinting it includes collection of leaf samples and dna isolation by ctab method dna purification and quantification pcr amplification with molecular markers agarose gel electrophoresis and gel documentation and scoring of bands coming to results we have done morphological characterization of all the 62 genotypes using all the 22 dust descriptors and among these 22 dust descriptors four were monomorphic nine were dimorphic and nine were polymorphic and this is the frequency distribution for all the 62 rice genotypes for various dust characters which were included in my study and these are some of the representative pictures for depicting some dust characters related to leaf and panicle and these are related to grain and decorticated grain uh, identification of rice varieties using dust descriptors among those nine uh, dimorphic and nine polymorphic traits 10 were only essential risk, uh, dust traits so these dust traits were just converted into 2d barcode by giving uh, those dust descriptor nodes in different colors like you can see in the below so using this 2D barcode, we were able to distinguish 62 rice genotypes, uh, only 31 genotypes out of these 62 genotypes. Uh, those genotypes which are not highlighted in any color are the 31 genotypes which we were able to distinguish using this set of 10 essential traits. And those genotypes which were not identified using this set of descriptors, they are highlighted in sev several colors. And the genotypes which were highlighted with the same color, they are having the similar descriptor nodes. And DNA fingerprinting was also done using 25 gene specific markers. But out of these 25 gene specific markers, 19 were only polymorphic. So these polymorphic markers were used to develop the varietal specific DNA fingerprints. The alleles of these polymorphic markers, they were given some codes like A, B, and C based on their allele sizes in their ascending order. And the pattern of all these allele codes of these poly polymorphic markers, they were used to depict the DNA fingerprints. So these, these are the DNA fingerprints, which we have developed for all the 62 rice genotypes using 19 polymorphic markers. Using this DNA fingerprints, we were able to distinguish 60 genotypes and two genotypes were not distinguished. These are highlighted here in one color. This is probably due to a limited number of polymorphic markers. And these are some of the uh, representative pictures of the gel, <laughs> gel pictures of several uh, primers used and coming to ident uh, identification of rice varieties using both dust descriptors and molecular markers using morphological rates we were able to distinguish 31 genotypes and using molecular markers we were able to distinguish 60 genotypes but we here we tried to combine both the dust descriptors and molecular markers and we have developed them into qr codes and the data which we used as input uh, to generate these qr codes is name of the genotype and the combined dust and allele code these were fed as an input uh, through an uh, online available tool that is available at www.barcodegenerator.org and using this we have uh, developed qr codes for all the 62 rice genotypes and coming to conclusion using morphological dust traits we were able to distinguish 31 genotypes and using the dna fingerprints which we have developed using 19 polymorphic markers it was possible to distinguish 60 genotypes. When we compiled both the dust descriptors and molecular markers, we were able to distinguish all the 62 rice genotypes. And this combined dust code uh, and allele code, they were uh, developed, they were converted into QR codes for rapid identification of the varieties. Coming to the future line of work, these QR codes developed in the present study can not only be used in the identification of rice varieties, but they can also be used for breeding material management, germplasm management, and for tagging in seed industries. And these QR codes, coupled with some mobile-based phenotype applications like Fieldbook, they can be used in regular breeding programs for rap, uh, quick data entry and breeding material management. And the molecular-based DNA fingerprints, along with some capillary electrophoresis, they can be applied for the detection and quantification of adulteration in premium quality rice samples. And this is the model which we have developed for the development of QR codes and its applications in rice breeding and trade. Using dust descriptors and molecular markers, we were able to we can able to create some barcodes and which can be used for breeding material management, detection and quantification of adulteration, germplasm management, and seed industries for the tagging. These are some of the list of publications from my research work and 
I'm very much grateful to Angro for providing financial assistance and providing the facilities to conduct the experiments and for ARRW Outstanding MSc Thesis Award for the year 2020 and all my advisory committee who have supported me in conducting my research work. Thank you one and all. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bhargavi. Excellent work you have done for your uh, MSc thesis work. Does okay. characterization of 62 selected varieties and uh, DNA fingerprinting, molecular analysis, and the combination of molecular marker for with uh, DOS uh, descriptors to develop the 2D barcode. So you have done excellent work for which you are awarded this uh, best MSc thesis award from this uh, Association of Rice Research Workers. So again, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you I think, madam, all the awardees should join the other link also. Yes, sir. They have to be there, to be there for the award ceremony. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we can quit this link, sir, first. No, ma'am. Uh, so shall I make the announcement? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, so all the all the ARW members uh, who can join their uh, separate link has been sent to their mail to the annual general body meeting. All other members can remain here. The well-directed function will be start very soon here. Guru, Guru, what about the awardees? Whether they have been given the link? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the awardees also, the mail has been sent to the awardees mail, sir. Okay, very good. Okay. Separate mail has been sent. Uh, sir, for the customary function, I would like to thank uh, the chair, uh, Dr. Kumar Shupatak and uh, co-chair, Dr. Patmini Shwain, ma'am, for uh, nicely conducting this uh, session for the ARW fellow presentation and also I thank all the presenters for the wonderful presentation and stick on the time. Sir, it's over. Then I have to give some remarks, sir. Dr. Guru.
So friends, welcome all of you once again. Uh, we are sorry that we are 10 minutes late because as you know, we were busy in completing another uh, duty to perform, which was our annual general body meeting. So in a very short time, maybe within one or two minutes, we are going to start our program. Uh, Dr. Beg, uh, can you check whether uh, Dr. Agrawal has joined? Yes, sir, joined. And oh. Dr. Muthu Kumar? No, and sir. What, right? Yeah, I am here, Dr. Sab. Good afternoon. Ah, Dr. Sab, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Dr. Sab, we were searching you there. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, you were required there. But anyway, thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for joining. But before formally we start this event, uh, our valedictory function, Please let me congratulate you for elected or selected or nominated, whatever you may call it, as the next president of Association of Rice Research Workers. My Thank congratulations you, and thanks also for taking over this responsibility. And I'm sure with your leadership, the association is going to reach a much greater height, much greater height. So congratulations to you and all the team members, the newly elected team members of ARRW. Now, Dr. Beg, please uh, proceed. Thank you. Congratulations, sir, uh, for uh, the president and all. Thank the you. Thank you, sir. It, it is your achievement. It's not my achievement. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to serve only. <laughs> okay, start of the proceeding. Uh, I request Dr. Ekenaik for a uh, welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Beg. So, very good uh, evening, everybody. Uh, Honorable President of ARRW, Dr. Himan Supathak, Chief Guest of the Validatory Session, Dr. P.K. Agarwal, um, Guest of Honor, Dr. M. Muthu Kumar, IS Director of Agriculture and Food Production, Government of Odisha. Because of some uh, um, urgent pending work, he, uh, he could not attend uh, the two days function. Um, Director NRA, Dr. Padmin Swain. Dr. D. Maiti, the immediate past director of another uh, and all the delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Every successful event comes to an end. So was the ARW Godel, Godel National Seminar on next generation technology for enhancing productivity, profitability, resilience of a rice farming. Sir, uh, this seminar was very successful and this seminar included a plenary session, panel discussion, technical sessions, evening lectures, and lightning talks. 
So a um, good number of uh, uh, recommendations have come out of this and we will be subsequently publishing and sharing with the uh, government agency for carrying it over. Uh, the plenary lecture was delivered by uh, Director General uh, ICR and uh, Secretary Dayar, Dr. Tilvachan Mahapatra. And uh, the evening lecture yesterday, two evening lectures, uh, the, the scintillating lectures were del delivered uh, by eminent uh, scientists, you know, biotechnologists and uh, uh, the scientists those who are working in the genomics and uh, genetic engineering. And uh, the technical sessions, they covered uh, next generation technology and rice improvement, precision rice, uh, technology and rice production, next generation uh, pest management and livelihood security, equity and profitability. The, all uh, the four sessions, parallel sessions were conducted and uh, lightning talks, the highlight of the seminars were the lightning talks. See, uh, earlier the uh, seminars were having poster sessions. Now the poster sessions were com uh, converted to lightning sessions uh, where uh, these uh, participants were given opportunity for three, to three and three and a half minutes opportunity to make a presentation and do um, uh, uh, interactions with the scientists and the fellow participants. That was the most uh, highlight of these sessions. And the total number of participants, uh, they participated uh, in this seminar was 250. Total abstracts, we received 200. And the theme wise also, a well distribution, uh, there was well distribution number of uh, uh, papers in all the sessions. Um, uh, one of the highlight is uh, close to 50% of the students participated in the sem uh, seminar and 50% uh, of the scientific uh, and the ARRW member, they constitute only 34% and non ARRW members 66%. Sir, um, um, uh, this uh, seminar was uh, very successful and uh, the, this particular validator function will cover uh, presentation by our rapporteurs, the, the recommendations and the recommendations will be compiled and subsequently uh, published and submitted to the competent authority. Sir, uh, with this, um, uh, I once again uh, welcome all of you to the validatory function and uh, over to Dr. Kaushik Chakravarti to carry it over further. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. As uh, uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Ekenai, convener of uh, this uh, uh, ARRW Diamond Jubilee uh, National Symposium. So uh, in this, uh, we had a very uh, uh, scintillating deliberations in last uh, two days, and uh, we had uh, our major scientific discussions on four major scientific themes. And now it's uh, time to uh, listen the proceedings for uh, uh, proceedings of those discussions. To begin with, I would request uh, Dr. Jyoti Budri from uh, IIRR Hyderabad to present the. Uh, the reports or the proceedings of uh, theme one, which was on uh, Gen Next technologies in rice breeding. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Badri, please. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Uh, namaste, one and all. Uh, the session on Gen, Gen Next technologies in rice breeding was held on 16 December under the chairmanship of uh, Dr. Oyan Singh, Vice Chancellor BAU Ranchi, and Dr. PK Agawa, Vice Chancellor OUAT. And the session was moderated by Dr. Sangamitra Samantra and myself and Dr. Kaushik, we, we both were the rapporteurs. Uh, Dr. P.K. Agarwal emphasized the importance of plant breeding to global food situation and briefed the evolution of breeding strategies in crop improvement and how biological sciences took advantage of significant developments in other elite fields. And uh, Dr. Oyan Singh appreciated the topics chosen by the speakers. Uh, in this particular session, we had four eminent scientists from diverse parts of the globe uh, who shared the vast experience and broader aspects of genome editing technologies and their application in plant breeding. The first speaker was Professor Kabin national, from, Kabin, uh, from National Key Laboratory of Crop Genetic Improvement uh, from Wuhan, China. Uh, he gave an overview of the work on CRISPR technologies in rice. He explained about the development of CRISPR uh, gene editing tools in their lab and also mentioned that both the pooled and array formats of CRISPR library for genetic screening in animals are difficult to implement in plants. And he gave a schematic illustration of pooled CRISPR library in plants. And uh, he also mentioned that instead of a genome-wide library, researchers prefer a CRISPR library covering uh, very few genes, like 100 to 1,000 genes uh, for functional characterization. Secondly, we had uh, the speaker from uh, IRI, 
Dr. Nessie Srinivasudu, who spoke on next generation plant breeding technologies for food security and climate change. Uh, and at IRI, Wismar technology is under deployment for nitrogen remobilization, starch structure alterations, and high iron and zinc price. Uh, and uh, the most interesting part of the discussion was uh, he proposed the 5D circular research model, uh, which is comprising of uh, 5Ds like demand, discovery, development, dissemination, and distinction. Uh, later, we had uh, Dr. Kejian Wang, a professor from China National Rice Research Institute, and he shared their work on synthetic apomixis in hybrid rice. By genome editing, they generated MIMI. It is like meiosis turned into mitosis, uh, generated MIMI hybrids. And the two major parts of uh, synthetic apomixis are clonal diploid production and induction of parthenogenesis. The present work involves looking for the germplasm or genes that increase the seed setting traits and haploid frequency. Uh, cloning more genes involved in parthenogenesis and also testing the strategy in other crops. And lastly, we had Professor Sergi Shabala, Head Stress Physiology Laboratory, University of Tasmania, Australia, who spoke about uh, quite an interesting topic that is cell-based phenotyping for improving abiotic tolerance in plants. And he enlisted the major limitations in breeding for abiotic stress tolerance, uh, taking salinity as an example. He detailed about MIFE, mice technique for non-invasive iron in iron flux measurements. Uh, Professor Sergi also emphasized that cell-based phenotyping offers a unique advantage of narrowing proteals to the level sufficient to avoid pleiotrophic effects uh, with um, interesting principle, that is one protein, one cuteal principle. And uh, Dr. Oyen Singh congratulated all the speakers for the topics chosen by them. And the meeting was ended by vote of thanks from Dr. Uh, Samantha Rai, moderator. Thank you one and all. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Badri. So uh, now uh, moving to the next theme, which is uh, which was uh, theme number two, uh, the precision rice production technology. I request uh, Dr. Pratap Bhattacharya, who was the convener of this session, to uh, briefly present the proceeding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koshi. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. I am sharing the slide. Actually, I make slides for presentation of the easy for easy understanding. In our second session is, is a precision rice productions, which was chaired by Dr. A. R. Sarma, Director uh, Research of Rani Dexmi by Central Agriculture University, Jhansi. In that session, there are four eminent speakers, Dr. Pramod Gumar Agarwal, and he delivered the talk on the topic managing increasing climate risks in agriculture opportunities and constraints. Dr. H.D. Gorantiwar, he talked about the next generation technologies for water management in agriculture, use of sensor-based technologies and artificial intelligence. Then Dr. Sudhan Sushin, uh, he, he uh, discussed the topic of next generation precision rice farming. And last, Dr. Dharmendra Saraswat, and he was uh, very well discussed the matter of unmanned aerial system based sensor for natural resource management. In our session, there are two rapporteurs, Dr. Mohammed Sahid from NRRI and Dr. Mangal Dittuti from IIR. So I have not, I have made 10 uh, recommendation come discussions, not by individually, so that it will be easy for understanding. So first was, uh, it is merging of the all speaker, what we got found. That first one is global data set revealed that the large impacts of the climate change on the regions with small holders and the risk is increasing. And second, the options to adopt climate risks are stress tolerance varieties, precision agronomy, crop insurance, weather link advisory, early warning system, and pace disease monitoring and control. Now, number three, scaling up the adaptation is necessary through climate smart village approach. However, we should be careful about the adaptations and maladaptations. Dr. Agarwal emphasized this talk term in the perspective of current and future climatic scenarios. Then another one important term he has given that crop insurance is necessary and it should be based on the site-specific robust methodology and real-time database systems. Then we found that, that the main bottleneck for adaptation and advance of next gen next technologies is the quote unquote, it is given by him only, I quote because it is so important, assumption that the knowledge is the main limiting factor. It is the main bottleneck of us 
So we should also address the genetic vulnerability issues simultaneously like poverty, literacy, policy, governance, which actually limits the utilization of knowledge even today and will do so in the future as well. Then in the next, gen next water nutrient management technologies, mobile and OF-based irrigation scheduler, fertigation scheduler, soil test-based fertilizer calculator, sensor-based smart irrigation system were discussed and they saw a very high good potential for use in the future. Then next gen precision farming digital tools apps like seed cost, automon rice crop manager, rice doctor, early harvest developed by the ERI were performing well. And in that direction, the required is transformation of rice system in rainfed areas using next generation technologies are very much necessary. And, and number eight is a deep learning along, Dr. Sarasar emphasized this matter, Deep learning along with the image processing is required for weed and disease identification and management. And, and um, after this, all this statement and the uh, chairman Nimas and Dr. Patak sir was also there. Another two recommendations come that advanced sensor-based methods for weed identification and subsequent management is required for DSR. It is the need of dire. And last but not the least, application of next-gen technologies in conservation agriculture is the need of the hour for sustaining food security, security in climate change scenario. Thank you from my side. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. So uh, now moving to the uh, next theme, theme number three was on uh, next gen technologies for uh, pest management. For this theme, I would request uh, Dr. Navin Patil, who was uh, one of the rapporteur of this session to present the proceeding. Dr. Navin, please. Okay, sir. Good evening, one and all, respected dignitaries and uh, delegates. Uh, session three uh, was on theme uh, GenX technologies in pest management, uh, which three, seven abstracts received. And uh, out of 37, 37 participants have presented their work and uh, 30. Uh, uh, about 30 participants presented uh, out of that 14 were from entomology and uh, 14 from pathology and uh, two presentations were from agricultural chemicals. This session was co-chaired by Dr. G.S. Laha and uh, Dr. P. C. Ratz and the convener was uh, Dr. Basan Gowda uh, wherein uh, presentations that covered different technologies uh, for uh, pest management uh, in uh, integrating all these uh, for uh, uh, new generation technologies to manage uh, different pest management. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Navin. So uh, moving to the last theme of our <coughs> uh, of our symposium, which was uh, theme number four on uh, livelihood, security, equity, and profitability. I would request uh, Dr. Bishwajit Mandal, convener of this session, uh, to present the, the proceeding of this session, as well as uh, we were also having one uh, panel discussion yesterday on uh, preparing future ready rice with next gen technologies. So uh, I, I request uh, Dr. Mandal to present uh, uh, proceedings for both the sessions. Dr. Mandal, please. Uh, thank you, Kosik. Uh, honorable Chief Guest, uh, members of Organizing Committee and Delegates. Uh, first, I will uh, uh, read the proceedings of uh, lead lectures, uh, which was uh, scheduled today uh, morning. Uh, the session was chaired by uh, Dr. A.K. Singh, DDG Extension, uh, ICI New Delhi, and co-chaired by Dr. Srinath Dixit, uh, Principal Scientist and Cluster Leader, ICRISET. Uh, First lecture was delivered by uh, Dr. Uh, Devi Prasad Dogra from IIT Bhuvaneswar uh, on the topic AI tools and machine learning to transform agriculture industry. Uh, he explained uh, how uh, three components, uh, three main components of computer-based vision system uh, comprising computer, camera, and scene uh, can be used in general and agriculture in particular. Uh, he explained the benefits of AI uh, in uh, crop yield estimation, then identification of affected areas, uh, minimizing uh, wastes of resources and to reduce the health hazards, etc. 
Uh, second lecture was delivered by uh, Dr. Reshan Mira, uh, senior technical expert, IFAD, uh, on the topic shaping next generation extension advisory services. Is it time to uh, think digitally or differently? He explained the way I had towards extension advisory services. Uh, he also mentioned about the back to basics, which is reinventing technology delivery. And second component, he talked about uh, making the best uh, better, which is incremental, uh, ongoing extension services innovations by thinking differently. Uh, then uh, he talked about digital transformation of untapped potential uh, for the gener next generation farms and farmers, uh, then game changing solutions by next generation extension services. And sixth uh, component, he uh, spoke about extension advisory services by transformational strategy. The third lecture was delivered by Dr. Basan Gandhi, uh, is a NABAT chair professor and uh, chairman uh, Center for Management in Agriculture, IIMM Ahmedabad. Uh, he spoke on the uh, topic transforming institutions and governance for livelihood security, equity and profitability in rice. He explained uh, the institutions in economics uh, and management, and he explained the features of successful institutions with clear objectives and uh, features of uh, good governance. The fourth lecture was delivered by Dr. Madhu Varma, uh, Chief Economist, World Resource Institute, uh, on how green accounting and ecosystem evaluation ensures human well-being. She explained the model of uh, reimagine, recreate, and restore. Uh, she elaborated uh, the flagship study on approaches to developing farmers' income uh, through agroecological-based <laughs> consideration. Uh, um this these were the four uh, lecture uh, before going to panel discussion uh, i will give uh, just a brief about a lightning talk uh, on this theme uh, this session was chaired by dr alka singh professor and head division of agriculture economics iri and uh, co chaired by dr uh, sk misra uh, principal scientist uh, i share nri uh, there were 21 abstracts in this session uh, but 19 people uh, they could turn up uh, for presentation uh, under various themes of social, economic, and social, economic, and entrepreneurial and policy aspects related to rice farming. Uh, now uh, I will come to uh, proceedings of panel discussion. Uh, the panel discussion on the topic preparing future ready rice with next generation technologies was held on uh, 16 December. Uh, the panel discussion was convened by Dr. Padmini Swai, Director uh, NRI, and Dr. RM Sundaram, uh, Director IIRR. Uh, and uh, the session was chaired by Dr. Uh, T.R. Sharma, DDG Crop Science. Uh, there were five panelists, uh, Dr. A.K. Singh, uh, Director IRI, uh, Dr. Ranjita Puskar, uh, Country Representative for India uh, and Research Leader, Gender and Livelihoods, IRI, Dr. Himang Supathak, uh, Director I uh, NISM, Dr. Prasun Mukherjee, uh, head Environmental Biotechnology uh, Section and Group Leader Agriculture Microbiology, uh, Bark Mumbai, uh, and Dr. Uh, Abhishek Barman. Uh, he was CEO, General Aeronautics Private Limited, Bangalore. Uh, the panelists deliberated on various aspects of uh, rice from genetic development to societal issues. Uh, Dr. A.K. Singh uh, deliberated on new breeding tools and its efficacy for doing breeding with higher precision. Uh, he said about low adoption of uh, varieties and indicated there is a skid distribution as among 1436 release varieties of rice, only 30, uh, 323 are being in seed chain. And among that, uh, 20 varieties only contributed 40% share. Uh, so uh, he uh, um, that reiterated that extensive assessment and evaluation is required for further development and releasing varieties. With regard to genome editing, uh, though clear uh, guidelines are there, but still uh, requires extensive human resources, fund, guidance, uh, awareness, as well as uh, clear policies. Dr. Ranjita Puskar uh, stated that impact is not how many technologies develop, but what impact they make. Uh, we produce food enough, but still millions remain underfed. So technology should be more resilient to uh, climate change, as well as socioeconomic issues. Technology is not scale neutral, according to policy and uh, institutional changes are necessary uh, to impact the technologies to happen. Uh, simultaneously, safety of vulnerable groups in changing scenarios, especially poor and women, must be ensured 
with entrepreneurial engagement considering their aspiration and capacity. Uh, Dr. H. Pathak, uh, he discussed about uh, whether agriculture can play a major role in achieving the target of net zero emission by uh, 2070. He stated that though emission level per unit area is increasing, but emission per unit product is decreasing. Uh, so he asserted that net zero emission can even be achieved by 2040 uh, by adoption of few technologies like use of uh, neem coated area, uh, urea, uh, use of uh, lip color chart, then uh, direct seeded rice, conservation agriculture, use of renewable energy, etc. Uh, fourth panel is Dr. Prasun Mukherjee, he assessed, uh, where do we stand now in terms of our ability to modulate plant immunity uh, for broad spectrum disease resistance? He mentioned many of the technologies are available, though uh, there is some difficulties to adopt due to restrictions through regulation. Uh, he was telling uh, pesticide can be avoided through crop rotation and uh, microbiome is coming a big way in uh, plant protection. And uh, last panelist, Dr. Obhishek Barman, uh, he deliberated on smart farming. Uh, he described uh, what are the uh, potential and challenges uh, of sensor-based technologies and how this can be effective for all categories of farmers. He mentioned that uh, these technologies can be resource saving, water saving, uh, as well as they are less harming to the nature also. So that's all uh, from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandal. <clears throat> now, uh, as we are, uh, uh, as we all know that uh, along with these uh, main sessions, we were having uh, parallelly the lightning talk session, which was uh, mentioned by our uh, rapporteurs and conveners. So now it's uh, uh, we have uh, we have also decided to encourage uh, the the presenters, which was mainly by, by our younger colleagues. So uh, with uh, the best presentation award from each of those uh, sessions. So first for the uh, theme one, the uh, award goes to, uh, the first award goes to uh, Ms. Archana R. Uh, her topic was mapping uh, quantitative uh, trade loci for uh, stray guinness under varying level of nitrogen in rice. And uh, second, uh, the prize uh, jointly goes to Dr. Sweta Singh and Dr. Umakant Bangle. And uh, for the third prize, there is again also uh, goes to uh, Mr. Suman Sarkar and Ms. Uh, Mona Lisa. So moving to theme number two, which was on precision rice production technology. The, the first prize uh, on the, this theme goes to Dr. Sangeeta Mohanty. And then uh, the, the second prize goes to uh, Dr. Sushmita Dash. And uh, the third prize goes to Dr. Mangaldeep Toti. And uh, moving to the third theme, which was uh, on uh, Gen Next uh, technologies for pest management, the first uh, prize for the best presenter, the award go, uh, Dr. Basana Gaura Ji. Uh, the second prize is uh, jointly won by uh, Dr. Amrita Banerjee and uh, Dr. Totan Adak. And the third prize uh, uh, went to uh, Sommo Bharati Babu and uh, Arundhuti Shashmal. In the theme four, which was on uh, our livelihood security, equity, and profitability, the first prize goes to Dr. Uh, Subalakshmi, the second to Ms. Uh, Swati Pragya, and uh, the goes to Dr. Vishwajit Mandal. <clears throat> so congratulations to all the winners. So <clears throat> now uh, it's uh, uh, time to have the remark from our uh, beloved director of uh, ICR National Rice Research Institute. So I invite uh, Dr. Padmini Swai to give her remark. Thank you, Dr. Kosik. Uh, in this two days uh, national symposium, we have come to an end and uh, uh, you have requested me to give my remark. Actually, this is, I can say, a very grand success of this uh, ARRW Diamond Jubilee um, National Symposium. Uh, in these two days, we had uh, uh, our uh, 
inaugural session where we had uh, Dr. Sopan Kedatta, Chief Guest, and Dr. A.K. Parida um, from Life Science Institute Director as a guest of honor. And uh, uh, then it was followed by a plenary lecture, but somehow DG could not uh, uh, attend uh, because of the Prime Minister's program. So uh, today he could find time and uh, he delivered the um, plenary lecture today. And uh, we had, as previously, Dr. Pandal and you told that we had four technical sessions and uh, uh, four lightning session also and uh, poster sessions, as well as uh, evening lecture, very brilliant, excellent evening lecture by two scientists, eminent scientists, um, Dr. Raji Vasne from Ikrisat and Dr. Holger Pukta from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany. So those, uh, they have all uh, delivered lectures uh, on covering all modern technologies, including genome editing and CRISPR-Cas, etc. Mm. So uh, this uh, Association of Rice Research, um, Association of Rice Research Workers, this association is established in 1961 in our institute. It was the then Central Rice Research Institute and it has crossed its 60 years of journey. And uh, today we are celebrating the uh, Diamond Jubilee year of this association. And on, in memory of this, uh, the executive committee as well as the members of this society, they have uh, organized this uh, Diamond Jubilee uh, National Symposium on next generation technology for enhancing productivity, profitability, and the resilience of rice farming. In this, uh, what others have told, and we had a very good panel discussion with very eminent scientists, where Dr. T. R. Sarma, DDG Crop Science uh, chaired and uh, other panelists like Dr. A. K. Ching, Director, Dr. Raji, uh, Ranjita Puskar from IRI, Dr. Himan Supatak from Niyajam Baramati, Dr. Prasun Mukherjee from Bark, Mumbai, and Dr. Abhishek Burman from CEO General Aeronautics Private Limited. They participated and they had a very good uh, discussion as well as uh, very good uh, lines and guidances they have given for future uh, research by our youngsters. Many, many um, recommendations they have made uh, by the way of deliberations. Uh, and finally, uh, our uh, Honorable DG uh, and their ICR secretary there, he has uh, delivered a very excellent lecture today that is on sustainable, uh, sorry. <laughs> I can see <confused> many things. <laughs> Yeah. You got it. <laughs> title I wrote here and there. <laughs> anyway, how to sustain the uh, Rice Research Institute, whatever we are achieving till now. So uh, many, many, many uh, challenges he has given to us. And uh, I think uh, our youngsters, will, they will carry out uh, this in a very good spirit. And... Uh, as the befitting um, title of the conference, symposium that is next generation um, uh, technology for enhancing productivity, profitability, and uh, resilience. I think our next generation scientist will definitely take up in very good spirit and uh, they will try their best to fulfill the uh, demand of the current situation in agriculture as well as more particularly in rice research. I, in the beginning, I confused. I did not even welcome anybody. Sorry, sir. 
our most honorable president of annual uh, association of rice research workers dr himansh patak sir uh, he has done uh, excellent work and uh, he, during his uh, three years tenure he has done lot of work for this association introduced many awards also which encouraged people to work for rice and uh, the journal what we have uh, public we are publishing from this uh, association uh, he and his team and uh, of course previous members they have uh, uh, tried their best to um, improve the standard of the journal and make to a, make it to a very good uh, narrated journal and they are also trying for the thomson reuters scaling so thank you dr patak and your team and the newly elected team very soon they will take up and i hope they will also uh, run the society in this uh, good spirit uh, and uh, um, we, this oraija uh, journal as well as the association of rice research workers will be definitely is make a stand like other associations and other um, uh, reputed uh, professional societies in the country in the country i thank uh, all the executive members uh, dr ak naik dr beg dr totanadak all other members all the members of the association and uh, 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 the um, would be president dr pk agrawal vice chancellor oet he has joined uh, without welcoming you i initiated my <laughs> remark so i am sorry i welcome and thank you also participating in this um, valedictory function uh, our uh, colleagues they have deliberated uh, the things uh, whatever happened in two days i think uh, your initial remark we had in the first technical session um, and now also i think you will give us good uh, concluding remarks so that our scientists will be encouraged and they will uh, go forward with a new vision uh, i think i should uh, thank the organizers and whatever possible logistics uh, um, were provided to the to organize this uh, symposium in this uh, institute so if any any problem or anything any mistake has happened i think uh, this is the host institute as well as the institute where the association is officiating so it is our own institute so we should not feel bad uh, but with the in the in pandemic covid 19 situation dr patak could manage from baramati and uh, he uh, means uh, tireless uh, effort uh, always contacting the executive members i could see the people talking to him arranging many times many corrections many things and uh, of course it also happened in very short period and he could manage so all 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 best wishes dr patak and all congratulations i should say i i do not have words so you you are really you are so efficient to, to organize this one and uh, you organized of course last year the first indian rice congress in our the same institute uh, it was also a grand success and uh, the next board will definitely organize another uh, second indian rice congress i hope and other Uh, many national and international uh, symposium uh, with the able leadership of dr agrawal so i thank one and all those who have participated many participant uh, today i could see more than 300 participant were on the board many dignitaries many directors many people so uh, even if it is virtual mode many people showed their interest and they participated i do not have any comments and no words i am feeling very happy though i have come to this seat for a very short period but i tried my best to help uh, the society um, in any aspect thank you very much thank you sir thank you
uh, <clears throat> thank you madam so uh, it is indeed uh, we are uh, privileged to have amongst us our uh, today's chief guest professor uh, pavan kumar agrawal the vice chancellor of uh, orissa university of agriculture and technology bhubaneswar so <clears throat> sir i would uh, on behalf of the arrw uh, and the the organizing committee of this uh, diamond jubilee symposium i request you to uh, give your uh, uh, chief guest speech thank you so much uh, i i hope i'm audible yes sir yes sir yeah. you are audible uh, thank you so much uh, esteemed uh, chair president dr patak president of arrw director nri dr padmini swain dr ak nai convener dr beg all the organizing committee members secretaries speakers participants i am thankful to you for giving occasion to share some of my thought on this occasion when i was reading the word next generation gen next then i was thinking what made us thinking gen next any given time you stand and you see the history coming next development will be always uh, gen next only or next generation only but today putting this topic for a crop of rice with the workers of rice is very very timely very very important why it is important before coming to the technologies i'll remind some of my colleagues working in rice why you should be proud proud to be in rice and what rice means to the world probably then i come to technology probably uh, you will have a satisfaction that why rice workers should think it more than any other workers or any other commodity or any other group of uh, researchers rice the most important crop on this earth to feed the human kind it is grown almost 111 countries it is almost covering 144 million hectares it gives 70% area and 63% of the total food grains it gives it is source of livelihood for 140 million rice farming household and millions of poor working on rice farms as hard laborers laborers and uh, that means whether you talk of calorie whether you talk of nutrition if when you talk livelihood you talk of economy the world cannot think of india cannot think of the state of odisha cannot think of without rice so if you make a difference to the rice crop it make a difference to the human life on this earth in all the component that is why this group has a big role to play as far uh, available technologies and what it can makes change to the human face it may be in terms of calorie or nutrition or economy or livelihood or everything even cultural things and when you see uh, i was think, thinking one more point probably i will make you uh, thinking again on that aspect last century suppose you see developments in crops i was remembering 1901 when the gene was rediscovered or genetics were rediscovered what it was wrote by mendel in 1901 by batson the director of john ennis center he was the first director of john ennis center and that probably one of the critical point why last century saw green revolution first 50 years of research that is 1901 to 1950 many branches and particular branch of genetics brought a change in, in, in agriculture 
and then we had an industrial revolution and we had a knowledge that we can have synthetic fertilizer like urea and other inputs given the crop can be given a higher yield and then all and that is true in almost every branch of science in the last 200 years if you see we sometimes say working in a particular branch particular subject makes it changes i am very sure you won't you will agree with me that is not totally true many of the development of uh, different branches of science makes other branch growing for example development in physics and chemistry in last century brought a change in biological research it may be medical science it may be biological plant science or any other science similarly if you see the last half of the last century lot of developments happened in different components it may be chemistry it may be mechanics it may be electronics it may be ai it may be ict like that like that and a blanket way of producing that means we considered one hectare of land we put nitrogen like this or you put pesticide like that and you have a more production per unit of area so we are planning in a macro level but recent development of science we have a huge development in electronics we have a computing technology developed and we could bring macro to macro a very big computing facility could be a small computer doing more work we could develop a sensor which was needing a big space to a handhold a small uh, sensor so lot of development in every branch of science it may be physics it may be electronics it may be iot ict every branch made a revolution in different spheres and that gave a strength to us for example uh, i'm giving one example 19, 1980s was the part when we understood lot of things about transformation fundamentals like how the dna comes how to transfer how you can manipulate a gene like the like that but another almost 20 years or 15 years we had product available which went to the market or users similarly i believe this half of the century 21st century half will be a century for using development for all the branches of physics chemistry mechanics all other branch to have a, to have a totally total revolution in totality to change the way agriculture is seen that is why this half will be half of everybody and this uh, subject it may be breeders it may be genomic transgenics it may be production production technology people it may be post production it may be extension and it it may be delivery chain so my point is coming 50 years there means another 25 years let me say up to 25 indian agriculture or global agriculture or odisha agriculture will have a different way of seeing the development and the development will come through precision that means we can see at micro level we can plan at micro level we can apply things at micro level but we can broadly plan for macro level we go for 100 acres of land but even one square inch of land can also be seen and planned so whether you apply for you manipulate your plants at micro level or at one base pair level also of manipulating gene that means uh, what is crispr basically this subject was not new last 20 years you see with the talen or crispr or lot of things but crispr make a difference to other developments in science was we can precisely take a base pair or n number of base pair we can delete we can add we can manipulate that is true for other things we can see a field for one hectare we can divide it into hundreds or thousands every small part we can without destruction we can see how much water it there how much nitrogen there or what kind of crop can be there what what kind of disease there and how we can manipulate that means our seeing capacity 
our planning capacity has increased like anything. Still, we can do very precisely everything. That means how much quantity of fertilizer required in the crop, how much pesticide is required, what is required or not required, how we can deliver. I'm giving you an example of nano. Nano, many people talk uh, very casually or very seriously. That depends on the persons. When you use nano material, it is not only a matter of size, it is a matter of properties also. And nano you can use as a delivery system, nano you can use as active ingredient, nano can be a carrier. So my point is nano per se, it can work as a fertilizer. If we use nano as a pesticide, it will have a different kind of way of seeing. So my point is understanding every component very precisely will be the key for another 20, 25 years in Indian agriculture. Western world has seen a little more than what we are going to see, but ultimately it will be a convergence. Second part of the uh, component, probably uh, I'm, I'm interested to one more point. We in Indian agriculture, we took our social science partners as a passive players. They'll go a post-mortem and do something that 5%, 10%. But this gener next generation technology will have an impact for how you do extension and how you do an impact analysis. Honestly speaking, when I joined as an ADC NSF, I won't mind to share with you because a lot of things we discussed that time and we visited. I made a brainstorming session with a lot of people in the, from Indian agriculture, how the social science should be seen. Because this is one branch we thought that Evolution of new technology is limited, but that is not correct. We always talk left to land, but left to land in a different ecosystem, different uh, uh, population, different mindset will be of different approach. So unless you understand your clientele, you understand your technology, and you understand how it goes, probably we may not make a revolution, and that is why. Somewhere you can go for a best extension, somewhere you can go for more modern and more uh, possible way of giving extension technology. One of the best way I understand is you must understand your clientele to do extension work. And we never gave so much emphasis how to understand them. We thought we have a technology, technology is good, scientists is talking, so that should go. That was one-sided more. And if you make a holistic approach, present generation technology, it may be IoT, it may be uh, radio transmission, it may be a base extension, or it may be n, n number of things that is going to make an impact. Now, next another 20 years, one of the area where we'll be emphasized will be, it is not only production, it will be post-production to consumption. That part was not well highlighted in Indian agriculture system, though we talked in limited level. And today we are being 1 lakh crore plus agriculture produce, particularly horticulture and uh, vegetable wasted. Still, we have not emphasized enough for pre-processing, primary processing, secondary processing, below addition, nutrition, and how to make livelihood better. So, and why I started with rice importance, all the developments, if you want to prove somewhere, and you want to make the people both conceptually proven, technically proven, socio-economically proven, and impact to the life of the people, rice is the best candidate for doing that. It makes sense when you go for a CRISPR example, you have a transform system available, the crop is very important, Number of researchers in the world are very high compared to any of the crops. Whether you go for precision agriculture or in production point of view, you use sensors or you use IoT or you use uh, uh, sensing water or fertilizer or anything. So your, your technological base is available and people are available and a lot of supportive technology and materials are available. So my proposal and my submission will be 
this group is the best group to prove to the country that we are the first and we are the best to take the best technology available or evolving technology to uh, to take or technology that will be evolving i can give some example but i do not want to prolong my uh, talk by that way so rice workers must take a pride we must be the first to have a proof of concept and its application in all branch of next generation it may manipulating a gene it may be having multiple breeding cycle or it may be phenotyping at cell level or uh, tissue culture level or plant level or uh, the mega field level or when you take the technology in a bigger production level maybe agronomy maybe pathology maybe entomology maybe other related technology or post production harvesting to processing and storage and from storage to marketing motivating farmers we are the best and we are the best is not enough to be satisfied we have owners to deliver that is the best because if rice worker in this country cannot deliver no other crop people can deliver that is a, this sentence i am not telling to make you happy but that is a responsibility we have and indian agriculture is soon always rice examples translates to other crops it may be commodity why you can see is it technology why you can see or policy and finance aspect also whether it is only science based or the uh, administrative finance all the aspect so i am very uh, i congratulate all of you to deliver to, to deliver it last two years about all the developments probably i know less than you people for every aspect because uh, there are a lot of discussions and you uh, you know better but i believe if the, when this team will be committed and decided and say we are going to deliver another 20 years indian agriculture will have a transformation and that will be a true revolution is a green revolution or is a agriculture revolution or whatever because next revolution has to be in totality everybody has to play a role from gene to production to consumption and that must involve economy gdp livelihood and all other related aspect i am very sure our and our uh, sincere commitment will go in a long way to make the society and the country what it need to be there so being proud it is your, it is your, it is our job to see that we deliver at least we commit once we commit it delivery is automatic some people will succeed more some will less, succeed less but system will succeed and delivery will be there with this i again thank the chair the all the organizing uh, committee members host institute uh, speakers participant thank you very much thank you thank you uh, uh, very much sir for your uh, wonderful talk and also your uh, thought provoking ideas and visions for betterment of uh, rice science using uh, next gen technologies so uh, <clears throat> now i would uh, uh, like to request uh, dr himanshu patak the director of uh, ni asm and also president of uh, arrw to uh, give his uh, presidential remark thank you very much kaushik of course i think for last two days we have been listening all the talks so i shall not prolong it further but uh, let me just uh, put only a few points number one that all of us all of us are actually fortunate enough that we are working with rice a crop which is so close to us a crop which is so important not only for india but for the whole world and in every of my presentation i probably have noticed i start with that particular slide what is the importance of rice so all of us are really really fortunate but you know as the production of rice has grown sometimes success becomes a victim of its own so with the success of rice many of the problems have come and now probably very frequently evolution why you are again increasing productivity and production and so on and they are also right in that way so i also feel that probably rice research has 
has been a victim in some extent. But let me tell you, rice is going to be here. Rice production has to increase. And so the problems of rice. Problems of rice is, are, are also going to increase. And therefore, rice research needs to reorient itself time and again, time and again. And that was the whole thought we had when we were formulating about this particular national symposium. Friends, let me tell you, there are a few lessons which we have learned in, from this particular symposium. One is, of course, we used to talk about next-gen technologies, and I'm saying from my side, but I was not knowing that so many developments have already taken place and people are really working on several of these areas, several of these areas, be it breeding, be it natural resource management, even social science, what Dr. Agrawal was mentioning. I was really amazed to know that lots of work in every areas of these are already happening. May not be everything is happening in our country, but somewhere in the world, people have, have already taken note of it. And what now our role should be to encase all these developments. One thing is for sure, that now rice research should not be a production-centric rice research. It should be profit-centric, it should be sustainability centric. It should be resilient centric. You know, a few years back, I was in Japan and uh, the uh, DG of their organization of agriculture research, he said that if in Japan, somebody proposes that they are going to submit a project to increase productivity of rice, immediately that proposal will be rejected because they do not need any more rice. So it has to be something in terms of improvement in quality, in terms of resistance, in terms of whatever it is, but certainly not in product. Our country has not come up to that level, but certainly we also need to think in a different way. Number two, what I could observe in this particular symposium, that there is a need of integration and integration is happening actually. In many presentations I was observing, it is not only, only breeders are working, Breeders are working with physiologists, breeders are working with agronomists, soil scientists, and so on. For example, the moment we say enhancing nitrogen use efficiency, earlier people used to think enhancing nitrogen use efficiency means it is a job of either soil scientist or agronomist. It is no more so. Now breeders are working, plant physiologists are working, and almost everybody, everybody related to rice or agriculture are working on this, and that is the need of the hour. Third important thing which I could really learn is the importance of basic understanding, what our DGSR was also talking about. Physiology, biochemistry, and basic aspects of microbiology, even nutrient dynamics, agronomy, probably, we, of course, we know, we have understood something, but still our understanding of the basic aspects are incomplete. And probably all of you know that the next year, the United Nations has declared that the next year, 2022 is going to be the year for basic sciences. And that is rightly so. As the complexities are increasing, without understanding the basic aspect of it, probably you cannot make it sustainable. You cannot make it resilient. You cannot make it lasting for a long time. So many of these disciplines are going to merge. Many of the new ideas need to come. And that was the lesson probably which we could learn from this two days deliberation. And you, you have already seen that not only the experts from India, experts from all over the world, probably many of the best brands involved in rice research participated. And I shall request all of you to please go through their presentations again and again, whenever you get, get time and opportunity so that we will be able to learn a little more. Friends, one immediate task which you need to have is to come out with the recommendation. As Dr. Mahapatra said, that he and the whole Aisha will be looking forward from our, for our recommendation. Because this generation next is not only relevant for rice, this is relevant for all crops, all disciplines, including NRM, including social science, including pest management, everything. So if we can really come out with a good action plan, good recommendation and good action plan, probably that recommendation will be a torch-bearing recommendation for everybody to follow. So my request to all our, all our office bearers and also, of course, the next committee also, Dr. Agrawal, to you and your team, let us work on this. 
completing a symposium successfully is of course something which is very laudable but coming out with a good recommendation good action plan in a very short time maybe next one or two weeks or so it will be really really good third point of course uh, all of you know that uh, in our country there are several societies and arrw is one of the older societies all of you know that we are celebrating 60th year diamond jubilee have you thought any time why these societies were formed what was the need of this society when the whole institute is there and not one institute two institutes are were are there and in, the, in every university there are rice scientists in this country there are more than 1000 rice scientists so what is the need of one arrw or what is the need of any nas or any other, any other kind of thing actually within a government system probably many times you will not be able to say or do many things because of restrictions and rules which are very good but then the association the academies or the society will allow you to do some of these things which you cannot do being a part of the whole of course we have to work with all these rules and norms but these kinds of societies give us lot of advantage lot of advantage and in terms of expressing in terms of analyzing in terms of coming up with good action plan policy recommendations so on so let us try to also encase those kinds of activities which were thought of while formulating or establishing society like arrw and of course finally my congratulations to all the fellows all the award winners all the office bearers and of course the new office bearers which are going to take their term from the next uh, january january 1st 2022 and uh, dr agrawal as i was telling the, uh, uh, the other session it has been a fabulous time a really really satisfying and productive time for me to be associated with arrw and i will be even more happy when i will be getting opportunity to work with your team also so we are there we are there wherever we are and now you this this new technology you are sitting in in bhubaneswar i am sitting in baramati and i do not know who is sitting where but it is so easy to communicate it is so easy to organize otherwise who can think that within 15 days we will be able to organize such an event where so many people from all over the world and as madam uh, swai was talking that more than 330 350 people participated deliberated discussed so this is generation next this is also a generation next and similar generation next technologies has to come for rice research rice development rice delivery the whole gamut suddenly will be changing either you change yourself otherwise things will change you but change is must what the, that's what they all the time say that only one thing is permanent in this world and that permanent thing is change only change is permanent it is going to be different you either it is your choice you change yourself or people will change you that's what that's what the whole thing is and again as you know one once einstein said that if you have to solve a problem you know problem is a part of life if somebody thinks that there will be no problem then probably he or she is living in a fool's paradise it it it, it will not happen but what he said that if you have to solve a problem then your thinking level should be different then when the problem was created if you think of doing the same thing and trying to solve the earlier problem no you are not going to going to solve that you are repeating the same thing and expecting the different result no repeating same thing means same result will come so do something different then only a different result will come and that is also another lesson probably which we have learned in these two days of deliberations on rice research and development so thank you very much all of you it was a fabulous time the whole three year period and also this last two days we have initiated several new things as you all know including including first indian rice congress it has to continue not only second or third rice congress will come many more rice congresses should come because rice is the commodity which is going to be here for next million of years i do not know how many years neither you will be there neither me will be there but suddenly rice research will continue and that's is what our new year is not far behind i mean just only few few weeks left rather so i wish all of you a very very successful new year a very very successful career a very very successful year for rice research let us in this new year come out with very new directions new development new research 
in rice development. So thank you very much, all of you. And finally, what they say in Sanskrit, Dr. Agrawal and all my friends, that Sarve Shukina Bhavantu, Sarve Santi Nagamaya, Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu, Ma Krasit Dukkha Bhaga Bhava. All of us should be happy. The whole community should be happy. Rice researchers should be happy. Rice farmers should be happy. And then only the whole India, the whole Bosudhaiva Kutumbakam, the whole Bosudha can be happy. Without rice being happy, you cannot make India or the whole world happy. And that's why I also said that sustainable development goal is more or less equivalent to rice development goals. You make your goal rice centric not only to increase productivity, but also profit, sustainability, resilience, and so on. And that's what the lesson which we all can take from these two days deliberation. Thank you once and all. Wish you all very best, all very best in times to come. Thank you very much. Over to Kosik. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thanks for uh, sharing your keen observations on uh, uh, this uh, uh, regarding this uh, symposium and also suggesting some of the, the possible future avenues uh, for the association. So uh, now, before we finally close our uh, uh, today's session, as well as the ARW uh, Diamond Jubilee Symposium, I would like to request uh, Dr. MJ Beg, the co-convener, and also the organizing secretary of this symposium to propose a formal vote of thanks. Uh, over to you, Bek, sir. Thank you, Kosek. I'm audible? Yes, sir. Good evening to everybody. Honorable two days chief guest, Dr. Pawan Kumar Agarwal, Vice, uh, Vice Chancellor, Orissa University of Agriculture and Technology, Dr. Himansu Patak, President, ARW and Director, ICR, Niazam, Baramati, Dr. Padmini Swain, Director, NRRI, Dr. RM Sundaram, Director, ICR, IARR, and Vice President, ARW, Dr. A.K. Naik, Head Crop Products and Division, ICR, NRRI, and Convener of the Symposium, both my Associate Organizing Secretary, Dr. Kutubuddin Ali Mula, and Dr. Totan Adak, dignitaries on the board, all the participants who have joined this symposium across the country, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed my great pleasure to propose a vote of thanks in this occasion, because we came to an end uh, after two days of deliberation. On behalf of the association, NRRI, and my personal behalf, I extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Pound Kumar Agrawal, Vice Chancellor of the University of Agriculture and Technology for accepting our invitation and grace the valedictory function as chief guest. Thank you, sir. I am thankfully acknowledge the involvement of renowned speakers and panelists across the globe in different sessions of the symposium that made it a lively and informative session. I am highly thankful to Dr. P. Mahapatra, Secretary Dayar and DG ICR for accepting our invitation and delivered the plenary lecture. I am thankfully acknowledged the contribution of the chairs, co-chairs, conveners, and reporters of different sessions for their actively involvement in conducting the proceedings of different sessions. I am highly thankful to Dr. S.K. Datta, former DDG Crop Science, ICR, and Dr. A.K. Parida, Director of Institute of Life Science, who graced the inaugural session of the symposium. I am thankful to all the participants who have participated in the symposium and presented the lightning talks on their research interest. My sincere thanks for Dr. Rahiman Supata, President ARW, Director of Yazam, for his overall supervision and guidance in the success of this symposium. Thank you, sir. I am highly thankful to Dr. Padmini Swain, Director of NRI, and Dr. Dipankar Maiti, the lead and director of ICR and RRI, for their wholeheartedly support in organizing this symposium. I am thankful to Dr. RM Sundaram, director IIRR and vice president of the society for his wholeheartedly support in organizing this symposium. Thanks goes to Dr. Ekenai, convener and chairman, organizing committee, and all the members of the organizing committee for their active involvement in organizing this function. Thanks goes to both of my fellow organizing secretaries, uh, Dr. Totan Adak and Dr. Kali, uh, uh, Kutubuddin Ali Mola for sharing the responsibility in organizing the symposium. Special thanks for Sri Santos and Sri Sunil for their active involvement in designing the links for different sessions and providing the inputs for organizing the symposium to virtual board. I express my sincere thanks to all the dignitaries who have accepted our invitation and joined this symposium to virtual board. 
Thanks so much to all the participants who have joined this symposium to virtual mode. Thanks to all those who are directly or indirectly involved in success of this symposium. Due to COVID pandemic, we could conduct our first Indian Rice Congress and the present Golden Jubilee AIW National Symposium 2021 through virtual mode. Hope we will meet physically in the second Indian Rice Congress to be organized by the association by next year or uh, next to next year. I wish a happy new year ahead. Thank you. One and all. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. So see you soon sometimes. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Thank all you. the best wishes from my side. Oh, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please be in touch.